So. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, Wednesday morning session, the early morning session. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Johann Heidenbauer from Jülich. Uh, and I just want to check, uh, Johann, are you online? Yes, you are. Online, yes, and I'm prepared as well. Okay, and I can think hear? we can just get started right away on hyperon nucleon interactions from chiral EFT. Johan, 20 plus five. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for, for the introduction. And also, uh, thank you very much for the organizing committee to give me the chance to uh, report our results at, the, at this conference here. As already suggested by the title, I will talk about the status of the hyperon nucleon interaction within chiral effective field theory and its work done here in Uli mostly by, together with Weile, uh, Ulf Meisner and uh, Andreas Noga. The outline of my talk is given here. I will have a very brief introduction and then I want to report or, or, or attempts to extend now this uh, chiral EFT interaction to the next order to NN low. Uh, then I will make some comments about charge uh, symmetry breaking in the A4 hypernuclei, and then uh, finally uh, uh, talk a bit uh, about strangeness uh, S minus two systems, and followed by uh, a summary. I'll start here with my <coughs> standard slide, which uh, uh, sort of summarizes the merits or the advantages of using chiral EFT for studying baryon baryon interactions. And that's on one hand side the power counting. That means we know how we can go to higher orders and thereby systematically improve our interactions. And we also have the possibility to derive here two, but also three and maybe more baryon forces within uh, the same framework in a consistent way. Since we are uh, considering here issue three, chiral EFT, the increase of freedom are all the octet baryons, that means not a nucleon, but also lambda, sigma, and the cascade, and the pseudoscalar mesons. And the interactions will be basically uh, uh, pseudo generated by pseudoscalar meson exchanges, and on the other hand, by contact terms, which represent here the unresolved short distance dynamics, which is really unresolved at the low energies we are considering. And those contact terms involve so-called low energy uh, constants or lex that do not follow from the theory, but need to be uh, uh, fixed uh, uh, fitted by fit to the data. Uh, Pseudoscalar meson exchanges, of course, completely fixed from the underlying chiral symmetry. Uh, most of our work so far is done on the lambda n and sigma n interaction, where you see we made leading order and then two versions of next to leading order here published over the years. But I should add that we also consider the baryon baryon systems basically down to strangeness minus six. Uh, I think the more recent attempts by us was also by a large extent extricated by the new data here from the E40 collaborations. And we have seen them in the talk by uh, Miva. And I'll just show you as an example here, the sigma plus proton differential cross sections. And you see here the data and vari a variety of model predictions and among uh, the predictions is also the, uh, here the two from the chiral from the chiral potentials and you see they are not doing uh, a good job here specifically data seem to suggest that the cross sections drop when you go to backward angles whereas here you see here actually a, a rise in backward angles but when you look at the momenta here, of course, they are typically here in the range of 500 MeV or an average even 600 MeV. One can certainly ask, uh, are we here already beyond the validity of, of the NLO interaction? And specifically, are the higher partial waves, which certainly play a role here, well uh, 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 presented here in, in the published version that we have done so far. Another issue is, of course, that you have to keep in mind that the first three three particle threshold is around 600 MeV. So at this energy, that means at the higher one, I think we will anyway break, uh, expect that the approach we follow 
should eventually uh, break down. To give you an overview, I show here a slide from a famous slide by Evgeny Applebaum, which summarizes the contributions uh, in this case to the nuclear nucleon case. And you see at leading order, we have these uh, four baryon contact terms to, with no derivatives, single meson exchange, and at NLO, then contact them with two derivatives and two meson exchanges. Uh, and then at the next and two LO, we see here contributions uh, with subleading meson baryon vertices here. And of course, also in this order, three baryon forces uh, uh, come uh, uh, up first. Uh, and then at the next order, we see that we next have then another contact terms. So when we go to n 2 it is clear that we do not yet uh, really get new additional low energy uh, constants that we need to fix here uh, from the data. So that's why it is interesting to go there. To see <clears throat> what maybe uh, happens when we go to the next order, it's again interesting to look here at the nuclear nucleon case. And I look here specifically at the latest uh, potential from the Bochum group which actually goes up as you see to n 4 low, but we want to look what happens here really when we go from leading order to NLO, which is orange here on the on the plot, and then to N, from NLO to n 2 low, which is uh, which are green uh, green lines here. And you see, uh, at least with regard to the S wave, there's a drastic change going from leading order to NLO, but then things seem to be already basically settled. So I think the S waves are already fairly well under control at uh, NLO, but of course that is not the case for the higher partial waves. And you see here that uh, partly dramatic changes when you go from NLO to N2LO. And also, of course, even N2LO in some cases, you can see that maybe valid only really up to 100 MeV, but it still deviates from what we know exactly what should come out in the nuclear nuclear case at higher momenta here, uh, also here. But some other higher partial waves are already perfectly reproduced then at N2 alone. <clears throat> uh, we actually, in the extension now of the hyperonuclear potential up to N2 alone, we follow uh, this uh, framework uh, uh, of this uh, new potential by uh, Reinhardt, Krebs, and Applebaum, which, as you see, is called semi local momentum space regularized SMS or SMS chiral and N potentials. Uh, uh, I don't want to go here too much in the detail of the formalism, but uh, I think where the name comes from and one of the essential features is really that now a different regulator is employed and it is meant to minimize really the artifacts coming from the from this regulator. And you, you see here on, on the formula what happens. So this is what we use so far with the non-like uh, uh, cutoff here, which basically is uh, an exponential uh, regulator here with the fourth power of the in and outgoing momenta. And here is the cutoff parameter. And you see when you expand it at low uh, uh, momentum transfer here, you see it, it starts to already distort the long range part at fairly small momenta. However, when you lose the local cutoff here, which is then given here, you see it really does not affect here the uh, uh, long range part of the physics. Um, because the corrections here are, are quite different uh, kind. Uh, also, this uh, local cutoff here is easily extendable to in the calculations here of the two meson exchanges. And I just show you here the spectral representation of the two meson exchange and how here the regulator uh, enters. So what comes out when we implement it now is SMS uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, framework here to the hyperon nuclear interaction, and the results are shown here. So, uh, shown here is the, dosh, the, the uh, black dash dotted line is what we get at NLO, and the red line here is what we get at N2LO. And we use here a regulator of uh, 550 MeV, and we compare it to our old results here, this NLO 19, with the standard regularization. And that is given here as a band because it shows here the results for a variety of uh, a cutoff from 500 to 650 MeV. And you see here at first sight, there's really not much of a difference 
maybe a slightly different here in the energy dependence, but overall the results are very similar, which you can also see here in the fit quality from these 36 data points, which we usually uh, consider. And you see here the high square was around 16 before, and now it may be slightly lower, but really on a comparable level. And I think the different, uh, that there's no difference, of course, is not, does not come unexpected because at the low energies, of course, the cross sections here are really dominated by the S waves. And that means the S waves, as I just showed you before, they are already fairly well described by NLO. And that does not change now when we go to the new uh, regulator prescription here. And of course, it does not change anymore when we go to the next order. Uh, here are now results at higher energies, uh, cross sections again. Um, and um, show you here again for, for different reactions and maybe concentrate here on the sigma plus proton uh, case. Uh, and you see here that's actually where different potentials really give uh, different results here at the high energies. And what you also see here, the, uh, our chiral EFT potentials, they give here quite unusual behavior. That means the cross section really goes up here at the higher energies again. And uh, once we go now to the new uh, 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 the regulator prescription here, you see we get the results shown here, the, again, the, the, the red and the dash, dot, uh, dash dotted line. And you see now things look more smooth. So it really seems that there is some problem here that affects here from the, from the regulator that affects the results here at the higher energies. Included here are also the new data from, uh, from the E40 collaboration, uh, which are shown here with blue symbols. And you see we are basically everywhere in line, roughly with these experiments. I should say, however, that first we did not include these cross sections in the fitting procedure, so they're really predictions. And moreover, keep in mind that these are not truly integrated cross sections, but they are calculated here by averaging and scaling basically in the uh, angular range from minus uh, cosine, cosine minus 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5. One reason for that is of course that in forward direction here, we have the Coulomb singularity. Uh, and the other reason for that is also that the experimental measurements as we will see in a minute uh, or uh, so that provided here by E14 does not cover really the, the forward angle. So I think it's better to compare it on, on this level uh, results. So finally, here are now the sigma plus proton uh, differential cross sections. Uh, uh, and you see here uh, data here in the range from about 400 to 550 MeV. Uh, and 550 to 650 MeV. And we do the calculation basically in the mean value of, of the um, uh, momentum here. And uh, there are again various uh, uh, curves here from different potentials, but the, our results are those here. And you see that uh, actually we can really uh, reproduce here uh, uh, the angular uh, dependence. Uh, uh, as compared to what happens, and as I showed you before here, with the older NLO potential, which shows this, uh, so to say, this backward rise here. I uh, should uh, uh, mention here some more details. First of all, when we look at these cross sections here, we keep all the low energy uh, constants here in the 1 is 0, in the, in the 3 is 1, 3 is 1, fixed as de determined from the integrated cross section at low energies. and it turns out that in the case of NLO, we can take over the legs directly from the NFIT uh, by Reinhardt, Krebs, and Applebaum. This is done because when we look at the SU3 flavor symmetry, we see that in strict SU3 flavor symmetry, the potentials for the isospin 3 half in sigma n and in nn have to be identical in the 1s0 but also in the triplet P waves here. So that's why we took it over. And we see when we take over this, we get here the dash dotted line and that increased fairly well here with the angular distribution uh, 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 by uh, coming out from the experiment. In the N and 2LO case, we fitted those and we show you actually two possible ways. One is again, where you see this flat behavior here in the backward region 
but we can also get results like this, where you see maybe the angular dependence here is, is much better uh, 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 represented. One of the things we'll notice is, of course, once we reproduce the data here at 500 MeV, we are off here. And the main reason is, of course, really that you see that the, the cross section here drops off really noticeable when we go in, in the experiment. But the theory, not our, not only the, the new uh, EFT interactions, but also the others, they do not show this drop off here. And that's why uh, they are sort of say overestimating here the results. Uh, what the, the reason of this drop off, I think, remains a, a bit unclear. But of course, as already mentioned, one should keep in mind that there is maybe some influence here that this uh, uh, the threshold of the three body channel here opens. Now, here are the results for the other uh, reaction channels measured by the E40 uh, collaboration. So this is the, the transition cross section here from sigma n to lambda n, and then the sigma minus proton case. And here you see that the old uh, NLO19 does already fairly good job. So it really uh, uh, describes here the data. And of course, also the new uh, 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 SMS NLO and, and 2LO potentials they can be brought uh, in good agreement uh, with <clears throat> the data. There is, I think, an open issue here, what really happens at forward angles. So we see here uh, different trends. So that, I think, hopefully will be, uh, uh, let's say, <clears throat> cleared up experimentally in the future. Uh, <clears throat> the other data at higher energies are, in this case, uh, reproduced with comparable quality. In summary, I think one has to say here that we cannot determine uniquely all the P waves legs by doing those fits. So we would, we would need here really additional data and which I understand are already on the way or plan to measure that means specifically here for the lambda proton uh, channel, but also for other transitions here. And of course, maybe even more important would be to have some additional differential observables notably polarizations, but also uh, depolarizations. So whatever is uh, experimentally uh, uh, feasible. So let me now come to the next issue. I want to discuss this, this charge symmetry breaking. And you see here the famous uh, uh, plot here uh, from a contribution that comes from lambda sigma zero mi mixing, uh, already uh, proposed by Talitz and von Hippel in 1964. Uh, and you see that because it introduces here a long range contribution to this charge symmetry breaking the action from, from pion exchange. There's also another one here coming actually from pi zero and eta mixing. The strengths of these interactions can be uh, estimated from these electromagnetic mass matrix elements. And if one uh, puts it in, one sees that one gets an isospin symmetry breaking coupling constants here of the pion to the lambda, which involves these matrix elements. And one can simply take here the values from the PDG, and then one just gets here the numbers for the coupling constants here. Uh, <clears throat> in a recent work by Gatzda and Gahl, where they looked at the charge symmetry breaking at this uh, lambda helium-4 and lambda hydrogen-4, they took not only the long range part, but they applied this prescription of uh, Talitz and von Hippel actually to the whole transition potential. And then they generate here the charge symmetry breaking potential based on the leading order hyperonucleon interaction and perform calculations of the systems when, within the no coercion model. And the results are summarized here. So here are the, the, the ground state, the separation energy of the ground state and of the excited state for lambda hydrogen four and for lambda helium four. And you see, this is at the bands. And you see here, uh, their results. And what is obvious, of course, there is some cutoff dependence here in this uh, uh, splitting of the coming from the charge symmetry, where here it is the lowest, there's basically not, no splitting. Whereas at the higher cutoffs, the splitting is quite really in line with the experiment. On the other hand, for the excited state, you see here there's a drastic cutoff dependence all over. 
and maybe the splitting here is constant, but it seems a bit large as compared to the experiments tell us. If we have, I think, such a strong cutoff dependence in the results in EFT, it is clear what to do because it really signals you that something is missing here in your calculation. And what is missing, I think one can see going back to the literature because charge symmetry breaking has been already studied for the nucleon nucleon case in chiral EFT. And uh, the basic works here are again by Applebaum and Meissner, uh, and, but also by, by, by Freyer here. And we can see what they have been doing here with this uh, charge symmetry breaking and following here the notation of Applebaum, the leading order contribution here to the charge symmetry breaking potential comes in the nuclear nuclear case from the Coulomb interaction, which however is absent for lambda n. And then it comes from the mass splitting between the pi uh, zero and the pi plus pi minus. This also is missing in the lambda nucleon case. However, we have here mass splitting in the chaos. But the, since the mass of the chaos is very large, the splitting is comparably small. And that does not contribute so much, actually, what we see in our calculation. When we go down to the next leading order, uh, CSP uh, uh, contribution, we see one comes from the isospin breaking of the NN pi coupling constants. And of course, this is what we get from, uh, let's say, from the Hipper, uh, from Hipper and Dalitz uh, 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 suggestion. It gives us here lambda lambda pi coupling constants. And most importantly, there we have the leading order contact term. So there should be also contact terms included here for the lambda proton and the lambda in the interaction. These are really essential because I think uh, this basically show the guts and gar results that one should include them in order to get here cut of independent uh, results. And they are anyway in line with the power counting. Uh, also, if one looks here at phenomenological uh, uh, calculations done for the charge symmetry breaking in the nuclear nuclear case, which is in the order of 1.5 Fermi here in the in the proton proton and neutron neutron scattering mix, I think this phenomenological uh, investigations really suggest that this comes really mostly from short range physics, namely rho zero omega mixing or A01 and F1 mixing. <clears throat> now we take this uh, CBF, CSP forces, including of course the contact terms and performed here calculations of the four body systems with our old NLO13 and the NLO19 interactions. Uh, the results are shown here, <clears throat> but here first let just show you I want to show you here this, again, the diagrams with the masses of the separation energy for the lambda helium-4 and the lambda hydrogen-4 and the splittings in the states and give you also, again, here the numbers because these are the numbers we are using in order to adjust now these charge symmetry breaking contact terms. And the results are summarized here for the NLO19 potential. And you see here, the, the, the charge symmetry splitting here in the zero plus and the one plus, they are all now basically independent of the cutoff. Uh, moreover, we can also calculate the, the, the scatter length here. And you see in the singlet case, there is a large splitting, but also the splitting here is independent of, of the cutoff. Please keep in mind that without this charge symmetry breaking, the scattering lengths are in our calculation are almost identical and they are just sort of halfway in between here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there is a smaller splitting here in the triplet. And when you look at the numbers, the splitting here in the triplet, it also goes in the opposite direction. So here you see that the lambda proton is, is more slightly weaker attractive than the lambda neutron, whereas in the other case, in the triplet, it is the opposite. We have in the meantime also performed calculations of charge symmetry breaking for A7 and 8 lambda hypernuclei, and the results here will be reported by Hawaii in the next talk. The red line is flashing, uh, Johan. Okay. Yeah, so I will maybe just briefly show you here the results now for the strangeness minus two sector. And also here, I think basically uh, we adjust to the, uh, our, the low energy constants really to experimental constraints here. And I show you here 
upper limits and estimates of the cross section for some of the channels in the sigma minus proton system and uh, summarize here the scattering lengths and what you see here, except for this case here, for the isospin zero, one is zero. This is the one which couples to the lambda lambda system. All of the scattering lengths are basically the order of one Fermi or smaller. That means the interaction here is really uh, uh, fairly weak. Uh, and uh, when we compare our interaction here with the results from the health QCD uh, uh, co collaboration lattice simulations, uh, actually we, as you can see here, they are at least for the isospin zero uh, case, they, they agree quite well. There are some discrepancies here in the other cases, but again, you see that uh, overall also the lattice QCD results suggest that the, the sigma n in the, uh, the cascade and interaction is only moderately uh, uh, attractive. Should say that the Hercusity collaboration, the results are really almost at the physical point, but there are still some variations if you look at different results here reported uh, in the literature. Um, Let me finally close now. Yeah. Let me finally show you the predictions for this. Uh, um, single particle potential where you, where we already see that we get with look, looking at these potentials here we get really much much smaller values here than what is so to say propagated in the in the literature uh, but uh, I think that the data what we have really suggests here that uh, we cannot really get a more attractive uh, interaction or we don't need let me come to the summary uh, then uh, uh, we Use now the semi-local uh, momentum space regular chiral EFT for the for the interaction here in the lambda and sigma system. I think we confirm our previous results here, and we can also extend it successfully to to the next order. Uh, of course, no 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 description here or no unique determination of P waves is possible yet. Uh, finally, let me maybe just uh, go here to the cascade energy interaction and uh, really it uh, reiterated it should be fairly weak because this is really suggested by the existing constraints. It also suggested by measured correlation functions here of xi and of course also by lattice QCD simulations. Um, if you want to see some other results here for nuclear again, you can look at the talk of Huayle. Yeah, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much. We are a bit over time now, but uh, I think there is time for one question. Yes. Where's the microphone? Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Koji Miwa. Uh, why the uh, comment? So in the uh, sigma minus proton case, so at the forward angle, so the point is a little bit deviated. At that point, uh, the detector acceptance is just an edge region. So in the fitting, so please include the systematic error also. That point, uh, at the forward angle, the systematic error becomes uh, large, so uh, please uh, include that point. The second one is a uh, question. So the sigma plus proton uh, differential cross-section, so you showed the theoretical calculation at the 600 MeV over 3, and, yeah. uh, and the cross-section, experimental cross-section, a little bit uh, uh, smaller. So uh, did you calculate uh, the theoretical calculation at, um, uh, one, uh, at the higher momentum around the 700 MeV over C or something. So is this the, uh, uh, is there any uh, difference between the uh, experimental data and the theoretical calculation at that uh, one higher momentum region? I, I have not <coughs> calculated that, uh, but I, I think it will be basically like here, because as you see here, uh, we now, 
there's almost no momentum dependence anymore. So I think we will again overestimate <laughs> your value because it is sort of uh, below here. I think we we uh, like some other uh, I think other potentials. I think the, we 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 cannot uh, reproduce this strong energy dependence that's a drop that seems to happen in the experiments between 500 and 600 MeV. So all of the results I think show fairly smooth behavior, but uh, but cannot really reproduce that. That is uh, that's why I think we will see similar picture here also at the higher moment. Uh, I, I see. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. We are very uh, encouraged. Thank you very much. So I think we have to move on. Thank you very much, Johan, and greetings to Julich. And uh, yeah. our next speaker is uh, Huai Li. Where is he? I'm here. Ah, you are here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> About um, single and double. Uh, strangeness hypernuclei up to A equal to 7, please. Can you please go to the first page? Okay, thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Today I will talk about single and double strangeness hypernuclei up to eight baryons within the chiral effective field theory. My collaborators are Johann Heidenbauer, Uf Meissner, and Andreas Noga. So Johann already talked about the chiral EFT, so I will only quickly mention here that it's important that within the chiral EFT, one can derive the, th the higher three and four body force consistently with the two body interactions. And they will appear later in the expansion order because they require higher momentum in order to be significant. And overall, the number of low energy constant needed to describe the hypernuclear interactions are much larger than those for the non strangeness sector. But on the other hand, in the non strangeness sector, due to the wealth of the experimental data, the two body and three body interaction have been derived up to very high expansion order, namely up to fifth and third expansion orders. And Professor Evgeny Eberbau will talk about the current state of the three body interactions after the coffee break. So in the strangeness sector, the experimental data are very scarce. Therefore, the hypernuclear interaction have been derived only up to next to leading order. And as reported by Johan, that recently we extended to next to next to leading order. So in my, this work, I will use the combination of these chiral interactions to study light hypernuclei. So our numerical method is a Jacobi Nocoshell model. Our main task here is to diagonalize the translationally invariant hypernuclear Hamiltonian is in the finite a particle harmonic oscillator basis. And here, the delta m is a mass difference arising because of particle conversion from lambda n to sigma n. And in this work, I will only include the so-called SRG-induced hypernuclear nuclear interactions that I will come back to later. So in order to construct the basis states for the S-1 system, we combine the single particle states that describe the relative motion of the lambda or sigma hyperon to the totally anti-symmetrized state of A-1 nucleus. And also, in order to evaluate this Hamiltonian, we need also to employ the intermediate basis in which the particles that involve in the interactions are explicitly singled out. And the total energy quantum number n is truncated by n mass. Therefore, we need to perform the extrapolation in the omega and n space in order to obtain the converged result. So generally, the baryon-baryon interaction contains short range and tensional correlations that couple higher and lower momentum states. This makes the calculation, the convergence of the binding energy, for example, with respect to the model space very slowly as compared to the softened, to the result of the softened interactions. Therefore, in order to speed up the convergence, we pre-diagonalize the Hamiltonian using the so-called similarity renormalization group, which can be written in terms of the flow equation. And here, the delta M is again the mass difference 
and we separate the flow equations for the two-body nucleon, nucleon, hypernucleon, and three-body force. And one can see that here, the two-body nucleon, nucleon, and hypernucleon interactions are completely determined by solving the corresponding equation in the two-body space. And from the flow equation for three-body force, one can also see that here, even if the original or the bare three-body force are set to zero, then the evolution will eventually generate the SRG-induced three-body force. And we will solve this system of differential equation in the momentum space. So as here, the, an example I show here, the evolution of the two-body nucleon, nucleon, and hypernucleon potentials. Here the first column are the bare interaction on the are the, the non-SRG volt potentials. And one can see that in both cases, as we <coughs> evolve to the lower resolutions, the higher and the lower momentum states are decoupled. And in general, we observe that the hypernucleon interactions are driven to what a diagonal form much faster than the nucleon nucleon interactions. And also similarly for the three nucleon forces, here one can also see that here the the non-diagonal matrix elements are, suppre are suppressed as we evolve to the lower flow parameters. And we notice that here, the similar scales for the matrix elements of, in the all partial wave states with the total angular momentum up to seven half. So as I said that, when we solve the flow equation in the two-body hypernucleon nucleon nucleon space, then automatically the SRG induced Lambda NN and also the coupling from lambda NN to sigma NN potentials are generated. And here, in contrast to the case of three nucleon forces, here we see that the matrix elements are only significant in those partial wave states with the total angular momentum up to three half and the isospin zero or one. So generally, the SRG evolution is only approximately unitary when the SRG-induced higher body force are omitted. As we can see here from the large dependence of the binding energy on the flow parameters in three-body, four-body, and five-body systems. So, but with the inclusion of the SRG-induced three-body force, here we practically recover the exact solution by solving the Fadia equation and using the bare interactions. But I note here that the, the large error bars here, because the small binding energy of the hypertriton that make the convergence of the Nokosha model very poorly. But therefore, in order to check for the correctness of the evolutions, we amplify the interactions, the hypernuclear interaction, by a factor of 1.5. And then we perform the evolutions. As one can see now that the Nokosha model and the, the FADF results are practically identical. So now we can be confident that our the evolutions works. And also here we observe also, sorry, for four body and five body system, now with the inclusion of the SRG induced three body force, the separation energy in the four body and helium five lambda system are practically independent of the flow parameters. So this indicates that the, the contribution of the SRG induced four body force to the separation energy of this system are negligible. And similar conclusion also obtained by Roland Witt and collaborator using the leading order potentials. So next to, at next to leading order, there are two realization of the hypernucleon potentials, namely the NL13 and 19 as shown by Johan. And here the two potentials give almost an equivalent description of all the available hypernucleon data, but it turns out that the next to leading order 13 potential, however, is characterized by a stronger lambda n to sigma n transition potentials, and especially in the 3S1 partial wave state. This is not an, a two-body observable, but we expect this effect to be manifest in higher body observables. And in that, we have found that the NL13 potential predicts much larger separation energy in the one plus state in four body system and in the ground state of helium phi lambda. 
This is a clear indication of the possible contribution of the, hybr of the chiral hydronucleon nucleon interactions and overall the large difference in the separation energy predicted by two potentials can also be quantitatively understood in terms of an effective lambda n potentials. Now we can have a close look at the separation energy when the SRG induced three body force is included. And overall, we see that the two potentials underbind the crowd state in four body system by roughly 600 keV. And also, the next to leading order 13 potential slightly underbinds the one plus state in four body system, but strongly underbinds the one. Plus the zero plus, the one half plus state in five body system. On the other hand, the next to leading order 13, 19, sorry, potential only slightly overbinds the one plus state in four body system in the ground state of helium five lambda by roughly 200 keV. So we see that here that in order to properly describe this SL hypernuclei, we need to include chiral three body force. And if one is the decoupled saturation approximations, then the three body interactions can be parameterized by the two low energy constants. And these two low energy constants can be fitted either to the ground state and the excited state separation energy in the four body system or to the ground state energies of the four body and five body system. So we are working in this direction. So now I move to the charge symmetry breaking in the A equal to seven as our triplet. Here we distinguish the contribution from the kinetic, from the two nucleon nucleon interactions and the hyperon nucleon interactions. And overall the contributions from the nucleon nucleon, nucleon interactions are small and largely because of the Coulomb interactions. And in the next two leading order 13 and 19 potential, we do not include the charge symmetry breaking explicitly. So here the small charge symmetry breaking in the hypernuclear interactions is because we use a phys physical mass for the sigma hypron and also the Coulomb interaction between the sigma minus and proton when solving the lipmann schwinger equation for the interaction amplitude. And we also consider the CSB one and two here where we explicitly include the charge symmetry breaking due to the contact interactions and the one pion exchange terms. And therefore the additional two low energy constants are fitted either to the charge symmetry breaking in the four body system, the most presently extracted values. And as shown in your hand talk that the CSB1 result for four body system are in good agreement with the experimental values and it is independent of the chiral cutoffs. We also consider here the another scenario in which we fit the two low energy constants to the charge symmetry breaking up to 2014, which suggests much larger charge symmetry breaking for the one plus state. And so the CSB2 potential predicts large charge symmetry breaking in the I, I equal to seven as a triplet. But uh, the results for the CSP fit one are much smaller and in a, crude, in a good agreement with the experimental value. We also consider the charge symmetry breaking in the A equal to eight as a doublet. Here we again see that the CSP two potentials predict large charge symmetry breaking in it as a doublet. Also the result from the CSP fit one which predicts the charge symmetry breaking around 160 plus minus 50 keV, which is somewhat larger than the currently extracted values of 40 plus or minus 60 keV. So the open question is that whether the current, the experimental charge symmetry breaking for the A equal to it as a doublet could be larger than the currently extracted value of 40 plus minus 50 keV. Okay. It could also be that the the charge symmetry breaking for the A equal to four as a doublet could be still too large, or it should have different spin dependence. Yeah, so let me also mention some of our results for the, xi, for the A from four to seven psi hypernuclei. 
Here for all the calculations, we employ the hyperon hyperon interaction at next to leading order with the cardo of 500. We include explicitly all the coupling except the, the conversion to the lambda lambda in order to guarantee the good convergence of the Lanchos iteration to the lowest lying size state. And therefore, the effect from the cyan to lambda lambda coupling is effectively incorporated into the, into the strength of the cyan potential. And overall, we estimated that the Coulomb interaction between the psi minus and the proton contributes only moderately to the binding of this system. And in this table, we provided the estimated just the psi separation energy and together with the decay with to the lambda lambda state. Overall, for the four body system, we observed four bound states, which, no, uh, sorry, three bound state with quite similar separation energy, but substantially different decay weights. And in the one, for the one plus state, we obtain the separation energy of 0.5 MeV, which is very close to the estimation of 0.4 MeV obtained by Emiko Hiyama and collaborator using the variational method and the hard QCD potential. But this Hard QCD potential, however, does not support the binding of the two other states. And our results for the four body system are much smaller than the separation energy obtained by the same authors when using the Nijmegen potentials. But one should keep in mind that this version of the Nijmegen potential predicts very large attraction of the cyan potential in the isospin 13S1 channel which even predicts the two-body cyan bound state that is not exper experimentally observed yet. So in five-body system, we attain the separation energy of 2.2 MeV, which is surprisingly close to the estimation obtained by Mind and Akashi, who solved the couple Schrodinger equation for the three-body system and using an effective cyan potential and also to the recently estimation of Friedman and Gar, who employed the simple shell model and an optical potential. But given the difference in the numerical approach and especially the underlying science potentials, we think that this agreement is more or less an accident. And for hydrogen seven casket, we obtain the separation energy of 3.5 which is again only slightly larger than the estimated by, by, of 3 by 15 MeV by Fujioko and collaborators using the couple cluster method and the high QCD potential. Our estimation, however, slightly larger, much larger than their estimation when the, this version of the Nijmegen potential is employed. So, in order to understand the relation between the chiral interactions and the binding of the system that we considered here, we also calculated the contributions of different partial waves to the expectation values of the S minus two potentials. Here in all the states except the one, the zero plus state in Fobolis system, one can clearly see that the attraction of cyan potential in the isospin 13S1 channel plays a more important role in binding this system, and it contributes more than 50 percentage to the expectation values. And also, the attraction in the isospin 0, 1S0 channels is also important for binding of the 1 plus state, but it becomes less important for the other system. And in the zero plus state here, one can clearly see that the repulsion of the cyan potential in the other spin one, one that's not state, contributes most predominantly to the binding of this system and that makes the system unbound. Also, finally, the binding of this psi hypernuclei up to five baryon system can be also quantitatively understood in terms of uneffective cyan potentials. And from this, 
formulas, one can also clearly see that here the attraction of the cyan potential in the either spin one and three as one classical states plays the most important role in binding these systems. Okay, so with that, I will come to the summary. So in this work, we started the SL lambda hypernuclei using the chiral, the two body and three body nuclear interactions, and it's the first time we included the so-called SRG-induced three-body force hypernucleonuclear interactions. And I have demonstrated that clearly that the, op the contribution of the SRG-induced four-body force to this SCL hypernuclei are negligible. And it's, in, it's, it's important that one needs to include the chiral three-body force in order to properly describe this system and be working in these di directions. We also started the charge symmetry breaking in the iso, in the I equal to seven iso triplet and I equal to eight iso duplet. We saw that the charge symmetry breaking potential that properly described the experimental results for I equal to four and seven system. However, predicts somewhat larger charge symmetry breaking for I equal to eight iso duplet as compared to the experimental values. And we also investigate uh, from four to seven hypernuclei using the Caro interactions at next to leading order. And we found three loosely bounded in four body system. And we saw that the five and seven body system are more tightly bound. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, and especially for keeping the time so very well. Thank you. <laughs> um, Questions? Yes, please. Uh, so I, my first question is, uh, can you um, somehow comment on theoretical uncertainties in your yeah, calculation? Yeah, so for all of my results, I have the theoretical uncertainty, except for the, um, the decay weights. But for all the binding energy, we have theoretical uncertainty that we, as I said at the beginning, we need to perform the extrapolation in the omega and the N model space. And that the, um, the theoretical uncertainty come from the extrapolations. And we obtain very well converged results for the C C to five. I mean I mean more on the level of interaction, not really let's say uh, on the level the, of like your uh, uh, the mic okay so there are two yeah. So from the theoretical but based on the interaction then we have to perform the calculations with different chiral kind of cutouts. Like here we have the range of from 500 to 650, and we are going to do that. And because the calculation are very expensive, yes. so it takes time. Uh, and my second comment is that you basically said that, let's say this discrepancy in your four uh, body hypernuclear predictions somehow can be healed by inclusion of free body forces. Uh, yep. But then yet again, I mean, you have quite good, let's say prediction of five body system, and I think that hypertriton comes out well as well. So if you would include free body forces, I would naively expect that somehow these two systems come out, let's say, uh, affected, so. That is a good point, but there are two things that one should keep in mind. That first of all, the hypertriton separation energies are very small, and it comes with the uncertainty of plus minus 50 keV. And yes. that is the, the, the limit of our theoretical from the chiral interaction here yeah, to predict the, so at this point we see that the three body force contributes very, very small to the binding energy of the hypertriton. But on the other hand, now we see that for far, four and five body system with their finitely need three body force in order to describe the three states simula, simu, simultaneously. So we, yeah. Okay. And because one can see here that the three body force also strongly spin dependent. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Hello. Well, you have the, the model of the wire interaction, the diagrams that you have there. Sorry. In the diagram, the diagrams that you have there, I mean, for the wire interaction at the beginning. At the very beginning. <clears throat> right. I mean, in the very beginning, yeah. And you see that, yeah, yeah. The exactly, first page. right. So you see you have pions there, I mean, you have to go to many others. Uh, what about vector meson exchange? I mean, uh, vector meson exchange, do you take that into account? Can you please? Vector meson exchange. Vector 
Victor Mason exchange. Victor, Rho Mason, Omega Mason. Yeah, yeah. I we, mean, we don't have that degree of freedom. We don't, don't have that degree of freedom within, within the Cairo EFT. Uh, you, I mean, yeah, you we have, have the, the, in the exchange contact, by in Ion. The con in by the contact terms, I presume, right? In the contact terms, yeah. And they must be very, very, yeah. imp okay. Very important, Nicole, because I mean, we know chiral Lagrangians originated from the exchange of Hector Mesons. And you know, the chiral Lagrangians from Meson Meson and Meson Baryon, I mean, uh, they are great. So, I mean, uh, I presume, I mean, that vector exchange, even if you put that as a contact term, should be very important. Yeah, maybe the, the effect and now, is. And since we are there, I mean, and I finish with this, the last row that you have there, you see, you have there pions interacting. Eh? You see, I mean, the last eh, line that you have there of diagrams. Go there to the second diagram to the left, and then you see you have the exchange of two pions, right? Yep. And the two pions are interacting. This is fine. But you see, if you continue interacting with these two pions, as Wolfram Bison knows very well, I mean, uh, you will get the sigma meson. And you know, I recall, I mean, that the sigma meson was one ingredient that was very important in the Dimegan model. Um. So you see, if you stop at that order, I mean, and you are doing that, that's the limitations of your approach that you are doing this power counting, but by doing power counting, you will prevent that you can generate the sigma exchange. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe you um, should I, relax the power counting and continue with that. I mean, like it was done with the paper of Toki and Mizove and put there the sigma exchange by iterating at this power. I'm pile. not expert in this one. Maybe Evgeny or Johan can comment on this? No, I will tell you later. Don't worry. Thank you. I think that's worth a longer discussion, right? So you can do that during coffee break. More questions? Yes, Abraham, you had a question? Or? Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't talk after the, in the coffee break. So I think I see no more hands raised. So uh, thank you very much again. And uh, we come to the next speaker. Yuki Kamiya on hadron-hadron uh, correlation functions from femtos copy. Hello, I'm Yuki Kamiya, working in, uh, currently in Bonn University, and I'm now enjoying this uh, nice conference, a nice on-site conference, so I will, uh, first of all, I thank the, all of the organizers for, this, for the effort to open this uh, uh, conference and for giving me a chance to talk this uh, in this conference. And today I want to discuss the uh, our study on the uh, femtoscopy uh, technique. And and first I want to introduce what is the uh, correlation function study. And this is the schematic fixture of the in the nuclear uh, high en high energy nuclear collision systems and. Every uh, yeah, every scattering uh, we can get the uh, hot matter, and they can uh, finally become to the uh, uh, hadron uh, hadron pairs, and they uh, they should be uh, hadronization, and finally they scatter to the outside, and among them, uh, if we correct the pair that which uh, goes to the similar direction. Uh, and they should uh, uh, interact with each other in the final state interaction. And experimentally, this correlation function can be defined with this equation. And here, Ni of Ki is the number of the particle pairs, uh, number of the particles, and number of the particle pairs with the momentum Ki. And if we have no interaction or the correlation between the major two pairs, the correlation function should be always unity. However, as usual, we, we, uh, we have the interaction or the correlation between the, uh, the pairs, so it should be deviated from the unity. Theoretically, we can calculate the hadron correlation function using the so-called kunin platt formula, and this uh, kunin platt formula has uh, two important uh, ingredients. One is the so-called source function that has the information on the how the hadrons are emitted from the uh, hadronization processes. And especially the most important point or the feature is the size of the hadron source. 
The other ingredient is the uh, relative wave function that has the information of the final state interaction. And if we measure the same uh, identical uh, particle pair, we also have the uh, quantum statistics. And this hadron collision function is originally used to discuss the hadron source, but if we get the, uh, the information on the hadron source, we can use this, this as an input and we can uh, focusing on the study of the interaction side. And now, up to now, we have already got uh, the, uh, uh, many data for the several hadron-hadron uh, systems. This, these are the example, and we have already uh, got some uh, uh, data, and for the, especially for some, for example, the lambda-lambda system, we, can uh, we already have the data from the different uh, collision systems. Here we have the data from the gold-gold, and here we have the data from the uh, proton-protons. And also in this conference, there are many contributions related to the uh, femtoscopy uh, from the uh, ALICE side and from the stack collaborations. And uh, as we can see, the, uh, so many hadron-hadron uh, channels, uh, including three-body systems, ah, this will be discussed and also uh, has been discussed yesterday. And before going to the uh, detailed uh, study or detailed hadron pairs, uh, I want to discuss what is important to study the hadron, hadron interaction from the uh, correlation function data. And the key points are the source size dependence and the couple channel effect. And to discuss the source size dependence, it is very useful to use the so-called lesnitsky lubost model, uh, uh, namely LL model. And here we can use the simple Gaussian source function for the source, uh, source function. And we can also use the uh, 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 scattering amplitude, uh, roughly uh, written with the, only with the one parameter scattering length. And we can cal uh, calculate the wave function with the asymptotic uh, wave function written with the, uh, with the scattering amplitude. Then we can uh, write down this correlation function with only with momentum and the source uh, size of the Gaussian source R and the scattering length A0. And this left side picture is the result of the correlation function depending on the momentum times R and the, the ratio of the R over A0. Here we can see that the correlation function shows the strong uh, source size dependence, and in the case of the lower side, we have the strong enhancement, and in the upper side, we have the some uh, suppressions. And if we extract the four cases from this fig figure, we can see the uh, result for the, in the light figure. And if we consider the case with the bound state, where the scattering length is positive, uh, we can see the uh, enhanced uh, which is larger than unity uh, so, uh, correlation function for the small uh, source cases. On the other hand, if we use the large hadron source, we can see the suppressed uh, correlation function, which is lower than unity. On the other hand, if we uh, measure the system with uh, uh, attractive, but there is no bound state case, uh, we always find the enhancement for every hadron source. And if we use the smaller one, uh, we have the uh, more, uh, we have stronger enhancement, but if we uh, change it, it to the uh, larger uh, source one, the enhancement will be uh, decreased. So it means that this uh, correlation function is very sensitive to the, uh, the value of the scattering length or uh, uh, more incorrect, uh, the ratio of the uh, scattering length and the source size is very, very important. And again, uh, this correlation function is very really, uh, sensitive to the, this ratio, especially in the, uh, the case where the R over A0 is around unity or less than unity. So this means that uh, uh, in the case of the large scattering length system, like the system close to the uh, unitarity limits, 
it's, uh, it's very good to study with this correlation function. So it means that it is good to distinguish existence or non-existence of the bound state. And this was the very simplest uh, case uh, where the, uh, only the uh, strong interaction can be well described with the scattering length, but uh, this, such kind of the source side dependence can be kept in the uh, various system. For example, if we have the Coulomb attractive interaction, we always have the uh, strong enhancement as the low momentum point, uh, low momentum region. However, uh, such kind of source size dependence can be kept and the uh, uh, typical uh, suppression by the bound state can be uh, uh, can emerge as a deep structure uh, around the low momentum region because we already have the uh, Coulomb uh, enhancement as the low momentum, but uh, we can see the deep around the mid momentum region. So, to by measuring such kind of source size dependence. Uh, by gathering the uh, data from the different uh, source size, uh, different collision systems, we can see uh, the hadron uh, interaction details. And another important point is the uh, Hopper uh, channel effect. And here, to introduce the Hopper, uh, to discuss the Hopper channel systems, we need to use the, the Kunin Pratt Lesnitsky Lubosity Lubosity formula. Here, uh, we have the original contribution in the first term, but we have the additional contribution in the second term. And namely, uh, there are two kinds of the couple channel effect. One is the normal one, uh, uh, which is introduced via the couple channel wave function. This, uh, as in the uh, scattering problem uh, for the, uh, the couple channel system, we need to solve the couple channel uh, equation. For example, in the shredding, if we use the shredding equation, we need to solve the couple channel shredding equation. And if we have the decay channels, uh, the uh, unitarity of the uh, system cannot hold only with the uh, this uh, reference channel, but and and uh, uh, scattering matrix uh, is absolute value of the scattering uh, uh, matrix is reduced. And this always uh, decreases the wave function, and the, finally the correlation function is partly reduced by the couple channel effect. However, we have uh, other contribution for the uh, correlation function study, and this is actually very important, which we will see later. And for example, uh, if we uh, consider the case of the K minus P pair, we measure the K minus P pair in the final state. However, uh, this K minus P can, uh, can uh, sorry, the other, uh, the other uh, couple channel source can be, con can contribute to this K minus P correlation function because they can change the Hadron pairs in the final state of interaction and can be a, a caught as a K minus P pair. And this, such kind of uh, couple channel Hadron source always uh, contribute to enhance the, the correlation function because it's uh, imagined as in the quadratic form. And it also Im uh, enhances the cusp structure if we have the uh, uh, open threshold in the discussed uh, momentum region. And we also need to care the uh, production rate because if we, uh, if we have the lower threshold pairs, uh, these pairs should be uh, produced more. And these are the examples of the couple channel effect in the two systems, in one is the K minus P and the other is in the prototype minus. And in the K minus P case, it's very interesting because uh, we have a strong coupling between the K bar zero n and the pi sigma. And in this left figure, uh, the bottom line, the lowest line, is the result only calculated with the K minus P wave function, only calculated with this uh, first term. And if we include the K bar zero n and pi sigma source, the correlation function is largely enhanced. And we can also see that this cusp structure at the K bar zero n threshold is uh, largely uh, enhanced and uh, it, it becomes uh, uh, much more prominent. So uh, to discuss the data, uh, 
in the analysis, we need to uh, carefully take into account these couple of channel source effect. On the other hand, if we have the weak coupling between the, uh, the other couple of channels, in the case of the, for example, in the case of the proton xi minus, uh, we, we have only weak coupling to the uh, N xi zero and lambda lambda, and so in this case, the couple of channel source effect is uh, very uh, weak, and yeah, uh, does not enhance the, uh, the correlation function so much. And uh, when we discuss the couple of channel effect, Again, the source size dependence is, also, uh, is again very important. Here I plotted the uh, k minus p correlation function in the, the left figure. And uh, as we can see, uh, the k minus p correlation function shows a strong source size dependence. This is originally uh, due to the uh, uh, large scattering length of the k minus p pair. It is due to the, uh, partly due to the uh, near threshold lambda 14 or 5 pole. However, uh, uh, we can also see another source size dependence. In, and to see that, I, pro, uh, I uh, extract two cases from this uh, for the, uh, the large uh, source case and the small source case. And as we discussed, in the small, uh, for the small source case, we have the large couple channel contribution. And uh, yeah the cusp is very enhanced. On the other hand, if we use the large source case in the upper figure, uh, we, uh, the, we can see that uh, couple channel source effect uh, that is shown by the difference of the, these uh, red and black lines are very uh, moderate. And, and due to this, the cusp structure at the k bar zero and threshold is also very moderate. This is because if we use the small source cases, the, um, many hadron pairs are produced at the small uh, points, and uh, we can see the effect of the uh, potentials directly, and the, uh, the potential gives the coupling between the hadron pairs, and we can take into account the, uh, we can see the, the effect of the uh, wave function of the couple of channels. On the other hand, if we use the large hadron, uh, large hadron source, uh, we can mainly focus it on the uh, asymptotic wave of the discussed channel, in this case, the K minus P channel. So by measuring the both of them, we can, uh, uh, yeah, we can discuss the interaction in detail, and for example, to see the couple channel effect to use the small source is very important. We can uh, get the uh, effect of the uh, couple channel system. We can see the clear cusp. And on the other hand, if we want to uh, concentrate on the uh, reference channel, uh, it is also useful to use the large source case. So, Again, for the, especially for the couple channel system, this such kind of uh, source size dependence is very important. And now I want to move on the uh, uh, study of the uh, uh, several hadron systems. First, I want to discuss the K bar N system using the K minus P correlation function. And uh, what is important for this system is the, uh, nothing but the lambda 1405. And we have the couple channel system with pi sigma, K minus P, and K bar zero N. And with the previous uh, uh, nice data of the, uh, by the Sid Delta uh, experiment, the scattering length of the K minus P is well constrained just at the K minus P threshold. And uh, if we use the chiral dynamics, we can find the two pole structure for the lambda 1405. And uh, among them, one of the uh, higher one, higher, high mass pole one, is considered as the uh, result of the K by N. Uh, uh, molecular dynamics. Yes. And in our study, we can use the chiral CO3 based K bar and pi sigma pi, pi lambda potential, uh, con which is constructed from the Ikeda Hyodo Waize uh, chiral CO3 amplitude. And this, this potential is produced, uh, constructed so that this, uh, the amplitude is well reproduced. And and using this uh, couple channel energy dependent uh, uh, potential, we can calculate the correlation function like this. And 
and with the uh, fitting of the some uh, non-femtoscopic uh, parameters, we can reproduce the uh, uh, Alice data of the uh, from the PT collision in this uh, in this uh, in this left side figure. And the red line shows our result, and we can see that uh, our result uh, well explains the uh, Alice data. And also, we can see that cusp structure at the Kedel bar N uh, at threshold is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is well uh, expressed with the experimental data. This, this is very nice data. And, also, and to discuss the effect of the, especially for the Phi Sigma uh, source, we brought this uh, uh, effect, effect of the Phi Sigma source by the difference of the red and blue line. And Phi Sigma source enhances uh, so much also in the extra data. So we can again say that such kind of couple channel effect should be introduced in this uh, analysis. And it is interesting that uh, to use the large source case with one, and this is the uh, uh, recent uh, Alice red red collision data, which has the larger source, like 5 Fermi. And in this case, we can see that uh, we only see that the deep structure, but the, at the cave there and the threshold, uh, we cannot find any uh, cusp structures. And this is what we expected in, the, uh, in our analysis, like uh, with the la uh, somehow large source cases. And so uh, we can say that this, uh, the large source uh, data is also consistent with the uh, K minus P, ah, sorry, with the Kyler SU3 dynamics model. And uh, in the uh, Alice paper, it is also, uh, uh, they performed the interesting analysis and because it, they used the largest source uh, using the red, -red collisions, uh, we have the less uh, important couple channel effect and they can directly approach to the K minus P pair. So, uh, they, uh, they tried to extract the K minus P scattering length from the correlation function data, and the result is shown in the, the left figure, and uh, Alice, Alice results are shown in uh, lead points and area, and we can find that this uh, result is consistent with the Siddhartha data. Uh, it is also the precise data. This means that such kind of the correlation analysis can uh, give such kind of uh, uh, quantitative result very nicely. And for the KYN interaction, um, uh, what we can now, uh, what can we discuss from, uh, from now? And here I uh, quoted this nice figure from this uh, literature, and we can see that at the threshold, KYN threshold, the, uh, the some model uh, amplitudes uh, uh, gives us some consistent uh, result, but if, uh, if we see the imaginary part, there are some uh, scattered uh, results. And if, you, uh, and if we also see the K minus N pair, which uh, where the isospin one part, uh, only isospin one part emerges, uh, we, we can find that the, all the models scattered and there is no consensus. So we need to uh, further, we, we have the room to uh, further constrain this, uh, this K by N interaction. And I want to discuss what can be, what can be done with the femtoscopic study. One way is to measure the correlation function uh, in, in detail. And recently, Alice Group measures the K minus P correlation function with uh, very different uh, uh, various uh, hadron uh, collision systems. And um, I put the two results from, uh, from them. Uh, one is the smaller one and one is the largest one. And, and uh, here we can see that uh, in, for the largest, uh, largest case, uh, or, uh, the, our, our, our sorry? Ah, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Our uh, SU3 dynamics model can well uh, can uh, well produce the uh, correlation function data. On the other hand, there is a uh, small discrepancy in the, uh, the small source cases. And uh, so there is uh, some room to uh, 
update the our model. And in the analysis, they tried to uh, reproduce the data by introducing the scaling factor alpha j by uh, which uh, enhance uh, or decrease the couple channel source effect. And they found that if we give the alpha k bar zero n is around two, uh, they can reproduce the data well. Yes. And it means that it may imply that the coupling between the k minus p and the k bar zero n can be uh, uh, more stronger. So, uh, and, and I think that this will be discussed also in the, uh, Lam uh, the talk in the Lamuna League in the, on, the, on Thursday. And another way is to measure, another way to uh, further constrain the K-bar-N interaction is to use the K-zero source proton correlation function. Here we have the K-bar-zero P pair in the, uh, in this case, uh, the protons, and we only had isospin one part for the K-bar-N. While we have the K-N interaction in this case, but K-N interaction is well determined with the uh, previous scattering experiment for the low energy region, so we can, uh, we can use the, uh, uh, this Kn interaction as the input, and we can determine the isospin one uh, part of the, uh, from the correlation function data. And we prepared the uh, correlation function based on the chiral dynamics for the K-bar zero P and the K-0P, and we calculated the k short proton correlation function, and we found that the k short proton correlation function shows uh, enough uh, structure, lines, uh, enough enhancement and uh, typical structure. So the, if my, by measuring this data, we can uh, and further constraints the K by N interaction. And, and next we want to, ah, okay. Ah, yeah, 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 sorry, I will skip the lambda, lambda and Z and, uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. And I want to shortly discuss the D minus P correlation function measured in the Alice, the Alice group and uh, in this uh, uh, analysis they found that the, uh, if we believe this, these points, the, the uh, Coulomb only in case where the, there is no interaction is consistent with the uh, uh, data, but uh, if we use the attractive model, uh, attractive interaction model, uh, the result is uh, the, of the standard deviation becomes much better. So uh, this may imply the at, uh, very attractive uh, DVN interaction. And uh, we also, I want to also discuss the charm sector of the uh, charm charm uh, meson uh, pairs. And recently we found that we it is, uh, reported the TCC uh, state is found just below the TLD star plus uh, pair. And it is also well known that X3872 uh, appears just below the TLD star bar zero uh, threshold. So, uh, we, we assume that uh, the, they are molecular state and we uh, constructed the simple uh, potential model and we calculated their correlation function pairs for the DD and the DD bar. And we found that it's a nice result uh, so that is a great source size dependence. And it should be measured in the future with uh, uh, great uh, effort with the IS group with the uh, IS3 upgrade. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I will skip, skip this here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we have perhaps time for one quick question. No quick questions? Well, no, quick question. <laughs> Very quick. Okay. I, I, I just want you, if you can comment <clears throat> on the coefficients that you have to use in the couple channel mm -hmm. um, uh, analysis. You, you mean this, this quote? This, okay, okay, okay. okay. Could you comment uh, if your ah, results depend comment? on that? Ah, or well, how do you I know mean, them? Ah, ah, so, yes. Uh, so, yes. Current in the current analysis, we need to determine this omega with some technique. And in one analysis, we just use the uh, 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 statistical model for the, uh, for the hadron hadron uh, high energy collisions, and just we estimate this, these values. 
And the, we cannot uh, directly determine this factor from the data. It is difficult, but we need the model in the input for this part. Okay, thank you. Then we can move to the next speaker, Nirbanea, on baryonic EFT for light hypernuclei. I believe this is the title. I do so. <laughs> Good. So we are coordinated. So good morning, everybody, and I would like to thank the organizer for the opportunity to present uh, some of our work uh, in this uh, nice occasion. Um, as you can see, I'm going to discuss baryonic EFT for light happen look like, as our chairman was kind enough to remind me. Um, this is a walk. I must stand here, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't like to stand in one place. Um, this work done uh, with this wonderful group of people. Some of them you know, some of them are in the audience. One of them was giving a talk uh, yesterday. Two or more will be presenting uh, their works today. Um, but uh, what I'm going to discuss uh, in this talk is, in essence, a light system composed of either uh, these two uh, rather famous particles or with the lambda. Um, specifically, I will be discussing a single lambda hypernuclei and double lambda hypernuclei, but uh, for the very light uh, systems. Okay? Um, introduction to the problem associated with why this interest of the general audience um, we should not uh, introduce uh, in this uh, audience. Okay, so what is bionic EFT? Bionic EFT, like uh, any effective field theory, is a theory that we devise in order to describe uh, a system of uh, uh, many particles. In the case that uh, we are considering here, our basic theory is, of course, uh, QCD, which is formulated in terms of quarks and gluons. Unfortunately, and as some of you uh, experienced firsthand, to solve this equation is highly unpleasant. Therefore, we try to replace these degrees of freedom with other degrees of freedom which are more appropriate for low energy physics. The first uh, step would be to eliminate quarks and gluons in favor of uh, bions and mesons. And this leads to higher effective field theory, which was the subject of the first two talks in this session. What we do, we take another step and we eliminate also the mesons and we write a theory which is a theory of bions alone. So we have very simple degrees of freedom, which are the bions, and we need to consider the interaction between the bions. So at the end of the day, what we get is a Lagrangian, uh, which contains the non relativistic kinetic energy and all possible uh, interactions between two bions, three bions, etc. And of course, what we need some principle, uh, organizing principle in order uh, to decide which terms are important, which are less important. Um, and this can be done by trying to, to count uh, or uh, uh, identify. Uh, <coughs> Uh, what is the okay, power counting or the uh, expected contribution of each of these terms to Lagrangian and then uh, uh, to different uh, processes and then include them in our calculations. Um, in the case of uh, pure nuclear systems, our small parameter is not that small. It's about 0.5. Uh, in the case of uh, lambda upper nuclear situation is slightly better because two reasons, one, um, the binding energy of the lambda in the light uh, nuclei is smaller than the nuclear binding energy. And second, of course, uh, instead of one bion, uh, one pion exchange, uh, the leading uh, term uh, associated pions is two pion exchange. Therefore, we have a smaller expansion parameter and we expect to get better accuracy uh, describing uh, light, hyper, uh, <coughs> light lambda hyperons. Um, as a simple example for the application of uh, 
uh, this theory, uh, considered two body scattering. This was already discussed by uh, Bezalel. Yesterday, at leading order, you will just get uh, one contact term, at 10 LO, we will have also momentum dependence, and 2 LO, we get further momentum dependence. So this is the terms that we put into the Lagrangian. Then, of course, um, we need to regularize these expressions and, of course, to renormalize them, which amounts to fitting the coefficient to experimental data. Once this is done, we can go and make predictions. So this is the simple layout of the theory. Unfortunately, and as already was pointed out by Bezzaleri yesterday, uh, this simple theory, uh, have, uh, uh, you immediately uh, hit a wall when you realize that if you try to write your Lagrangian extractor potential and solve your Schrodinger equation, you realize immediately that you have a problem. And the first problem is that the effective range uh, turns out uh, to be negative if you try to uh, take your cut of your regulator uh, coefficient to infinity. A way to avoid that is to split the calculation into uh, two steps. At leading order, you iterate and solve the Schrodinger equation uh, in full. Next to leading order and higher terms, you just use perturbation theory. So this is the first problem. Then, okay, so okay, I, I am done with the two-body problem. Let's move to the three-body problem. Now I know how to deal with it. You start to do the calculation, and you realize that your system is going to collapse. This is what's called the Thomas collapse, leading to the Efimov uh, effect. So you must introduce a three-body force that you would expect it to arrive somewhere uh, next year. It is here and, uh, and now and super important. So this was the second thing that uh, you have to realize. And then when you go and do further calculation at NLO, four-body system, you suddenly realize that you have another unpleasant surprise that you need to include also four-body force. So although this theory is in principle very simple, it is deceiving. Um, and in practice, um, the application is not that trivial. Nonetheless, we will go with it and see where it brings us. Um, so this is the, the scheme. Um, what do we have? So we have a pineless theory or baryonic theory. We are going to discuss it at linear order, at end to next to leading order. We are not going to include Coulomb potential in our calculation, but that's not the principal problem. Um, we are going to solve the sharing equation, leading order uh, on its to God way, next to leading order in perturbation. Um, what do you want to know? In short, everything. Bound state, scattering, resonances, whatever we can do. And then, how are we going to address uh, these uh, observables? So we are going to use a basis of Gaussians, what, called, uh, what is known as the Stochastic variational uh, method is very powerful. Um, we are going to use uh, the Bush formula, which is the uh, a way we put the system into harmonic oscillator trap, and then from the phase shifts, we can uh, from the energy you can extract the phase shift of the system. So this is a way to uh, extract uh, two body scattering parameters from bound state calculations. And for resonances, we are going to use either complex rotation or an early continuation, which is adding another extra force and then slowly removing it to recover the results. So before we move on to results, a word of wisdom. This one you sent send me. Um, and uh, this is apparently some series that goes on in TV. Um, anyway, we apply this theory uh, to study uh, different systems, uh, nuclear scattering up to a five-body system, single lambda hypernuclei, double lambda hypernuclei. Um, we also address the charge symmetry breaking. Martin is going to discuss it later today. And, uh, of course, uh, to study uh, lattice QCD calculations, as Bezzaro was pointing out yesterday. Um, before I move to the hypernuclear sector, let me show you a few results from the nuclear sector. So in this case, we have three parameters at leading order, which we fit to the scattering length and the three-body binding energy. We have another three parameters at next to leading order, which we fit to effective ranges and 
to the full body binding energy, and then we can go and do predictions. Um, so I will show you uh, four slides or three slides uh, about uh, three, four, and five body scattering. Um, first of all, this is neutron-neutron scattering. Um, here, near threshold, we have a pole, therefore the regular effective range expansion doesn't work very well, and we need to modify it to include this pole in the expansion. Um, as you can see from this graph, when you apply this theory, which is a rather simple theory, um, this ND scattering is reduced very well um, in all this energy range, and of course, uh, uh, the cutoff dependence uh, at this uh, NLO is very good. Then we can go move, move to, sorry, to the four-body system. Here um, we have neutron triton scattering or neutron helium-3 scattering. Um, all you see in these bands are different experimental results. And of course, they are not uh, confining the, the scattering lens very well. On top of that, we have this red cross. This is our leading order calculation. Then you have the blue cross here. This is the next to leading order calculation. You can see um, that uh, it sits in the middle of other points. And all these points are really state-of-the-art calculation with the uh, most sophisticated uh, uh, higher EFT and argon uh, plus Urbana potentials. So you see that the prediction, the digging power of this theory is quite remarkable given its simplicity. Uh, similar situation goes for the uh, neutron uh, helium-3 scattering. Um, last slide in the nuclear uh, sector, and this is fine body scattering. Here again, this is neutron helium-4 scattering. In this case, uh, x-axis is the scattering length, y-axis is the effective range. Um, Blue cross is our result. Uh, this point, these are the experimental data. Um, and all these other courses are different uh, higher EFT calculations, which as you can see, they are almost as good as uh, our baryonic EFT predictions. Um, so this was uh, the case of the nuclear, normal nuclear physics. Now we move to light up the nuclei. Here, unfortunately, the calculations are only at leading order. We don't have enough constraint uh, uh, to fit uh, the, the NLO parameters. Um, and of course, uh, working with icons, there is the usual problems. Um, there is only scarce scattering data. In essence, there is almost no low energy uh, uh, data. Uh, we have only few, actually five, uh, lambda upper nuclear bound states, and uh, uh, at this point, we still don't have any resonance data. So the amount of data that we have to fit our theory is very limited. So what we do, um, we have to use a combination of uh, data extractions built on uh, higher EFT and other model extraction of low energy parameters, and use that to make predictions. So just to count, uh, how many parameters do we need at this order? So in the nuclear sector, uh, at linear order, we need only three parameters. Going to the uh, hypernuclear sector, uh, we need seven more parameters in order to deal with single lambda and double lambda hypernuclei. Um, of these, we have <coughs> three uh, two-body parameters and four three-body parameters. This is a bit complicated, but you can count along. Um, okay, the static point, of course, is the scattering length. Here uh, we have the <coughs> Alexander and uh, Zakizon uh, very old experiments, um, and we have many extraction, possible extraction of the scattering length from this experiment, and we use either the direct extraction um, of uh, the original papers or, uh, sorry, uh, theoretical extractions coming on top of them. Um, for the lambda-lambda, uh, there is uh, one K minus K plus experiment, and now we have the, the new uh, femtoscopy uh, experiment trying to extract the lambda-lambda scattering length. Of course, it's not super precise, but this is the already uh, a huge improvement. 
Um, and with that, we can start and fit our theory. So this uh, lambda n and lambda lambda parameterization give us the two body parameters. Now, when we go to the three body parameters, we realize, okay, that for the n and sector, we have the triton, no problem. Um, when you go to the lambda n n, single lambda, two nuclei, uh, two nucleons, um, we need uh, three uh, parameters. So if we had a three bound state, no problem. Unfortunately, there is only the single uh, hypertriton, and uh, in order to fit the other two parameters, we need to go to the four body system where we fit the parameter. When we go to the uh, lambda lambda sector, um, the only uh, three body uh, de datum that uh, we can use is actually uh, the Nagara event, which is Dharma lambda ilmu 6, where we fit this parameter. So this is uh, our roadmap where we fit the parameters, and then we can go and uh, uh, make some predictions. So the first thing that uh, we can predict is the uh, lambda ilmu 5 binding energy. And uh, we were very pleased, well, we did all these uh, complicated calculations and then predicted, uh, okay, post-dicted uh, lambda ilmu 5. And as you can see, this comes very much on top of the experimental value within experimental error and our uh, calculational error. So this is, was very gratifying. Um, once uh, we realized that, we moved to discuss this double lambda hypernuclei. And uh, of course, here, uh, part of the motivation is this famous uh, uh, Yaffe, uh, I would call it uh, uh, prediction or uh, hypothesis that uh, uh, double lambda should be this uh, famous uh, HD baryon. Um, I have no time to discuss it, so I'll skip it. Just comment again that, that three, uh, three body parameters was fitted to the uh, ILU-6 double lambda Nagara event, and with that we can go and see, okay, what other uh, double lambda hypernuclei we can predict at least in the light sector. And uh, the first thing that uh, we did was to calculate a double lambda ilium 5. And uh, this is what we get. This is lambda, small lambda is our cutoff. And this is our prediction uh, to this uh, system. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, we predict that uh, it will be bound by something like 1.1 MeV. And when we take into account all possible uh, uh, sources of error, experimental, theoretical, computational. Uh, our uh, conclusion is that uh, this is a rather solid prediction. Um, then we can move uh, one nucleon down and ask, OK, what about uh, the four body system, double lambda neutron proton or double lambda uh, hydrogen four? In this case, the situation is very marginal. Uh, we cannot uh, say anything uh, definitely. Um, this uh, uh, system is just on the threshold. Um, going to the neutral system, trying to, to play the game, let's see what happens if uh, uh, neutron double lambda is bound by uh, 100 kV, two neutrons double lambda counts of 100 kV, what are the implications? Um, doing that and trying to see what will happen to other known system, our conclusion that um, all these uh, neutral systems should be unbound. Otherwise, this is incompatible with what we know about uh, the spectrum of the light hypernuclei. So with that, we are done with bound state. Now we have one minute and 40 seconds, right? Actually, less now. Um, and we can uh, discuss continuum states. So um, since we don't have many bound states. Uh, the next thing, of course, is to go to discuss continuum state. And the question is, OK, let's discuss this uh, uh, <coughs> um, lambda NN. OK, it is not bound. Can it be a resonance? Can we see a significant uh, signature in the continuum for the existence of uh, such a creature? What about this Ibertriton? OK, uh, with S equal 1 half, it is bound. What happened? about S equal 3 half. So to address these issues, we used uh, the complex rotation and this uh, analytical continuation method and tried to predict the properties of these systems. So um, 
This is a typical result that we get for the lambda NN system. This is what you get in the complex rotation calculations. Uh, if you don't know these uh, kind of plots, what we do with uh, just rotate the coordinates, uh, it uh, I'll get uh, in uh, uh, phase e to the i theta. So you just, uh, if you want, uh, rotate the energy or the momentum. I will not get in too much details. What's important is this point, this is the rotation. At some point, it stops, and you get the pole in the S matrix. If this pole is in this region, I will call it a real resonance. If it crosses this line to this uh, third quad quadrant, this is not a real resonance, but still have, uh, can have an uh, impact on the cross section. Um, yeah, I have a flashing red light. Yes. So this is on the verge, either being a resonant or uh, almost a resonance. Um, and this is true also uh, if you use different parameterization. When we go to the uh, uh, excited abetriton, here the situation is very interesting. It is not a resonance, but actually a virtual state. Uh, this is very stable in our calculations. Um, and again, this is something that, in principle, you can see if you were able to do uh, lambda Newton scattering. And let me summarize. This is our results. Uh, we managed to describe all single lambda hypernuclei together within one theoretical framework, no uh, five body uh, overbinding. Um, then we were able to apply this theory to the double lambda hypernuclei. Uh, we get solid prediction for the bound state of uh, a double lambda helium five or double lambda hydrogen, uh, hydrogen five. Um, we see that uh, excited hypertriton is a virtual state. Lambda NN may be a physical resonance, maybe not. Uh, uh, the parameters and our theory is not good enough to fix this question. Um, other double lambda hypernuclei are not bound. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Everybody is looking at this nice picture. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I can tell you this is an uh, old archaeological site in Israel. Uh -huh. uh, this all that you see is uh, uh, for growing pigeons. This is for pigeons. Yeah. And the green uh, light that you see, the green color, is I, I will let you imagine what is the source of this green color. So that's a great answer to a question that has not been asked, but which was anyway very interesting <coughs> to encounter. <coughs> no more questions? No, no, there is one uh, important uh, lady. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you for the nice talk. So I have one question. You saw that you have a perfect description of the SL hypernuclei, and, but your method cannot extend to higher systems. Is that correct? At the moment, uh, we are struggling with extending our uh, calculation to p nuclei. But I still have yeah, one question that, assuming that if you can extend to the higher system, what would you, your expectations for the description of, for example, lithium-7 lambda? Again, I didn't get it. Assume that, assuming that you can extend your method to mm -hmm. 7 lithium lambda. So what would be your expectations of, the, of your prediction for 7 lithium lambda. Can you, could you get a so perfect description for that system? I think that we need to do the calculations and then we can answer this question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Nia. And we come to the last presentation of this morning after a lot of theory. Uh, we're going to experiment now. Uh, it's about the commissioning of the hypertriton binding energy measurement at MAMI. Please, Philipp Eckert. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and welcome to my presentation. Um, maybe let's at first have a look at the data situation on the hypertriton binding energy itself. Um, 
I mean, uh, this property offers a test bench for many modern nuclear theories as well as input to neut uh, neutron star matter to the understanding. But however, the lambda binding energy is um, yeah, still hardly understood. There are still uh, large experimental uncertainties. For example, the recent two measurements by Starr and Alice are uh, lying apart by around two sigma, or more dramatically <coughs> spoken, uh, they differ by a factor of eight. And uh, what one also can draw from this uh, ideogram is that uh, this value is still dominated by emulsion data around 77%, and as you all know, this data is 50 years or more old. So new independent measurements are needed. And one of these is planned at MAMI, which is done via decay pion spectroscopy. By that, we are scattering electrons with an energy of 1.5 GeV of uh, target nuclei. And by that, we are looking for the uh, strangeness electroproduction reaction where a, lambda react, uh, where a proton reacts to a lambda and a K plus. And when this lambda stays bound to the nucleus, a highly excited hypernucleus is formed. The K plus is important to us as well, since it will be detected and act as a strangeness tag. So from there, due to the high excitation of this hypernucleus, a fragmentation process will take place where several nucleons are emitted. Uh, so that a new hypernuclear isotope is uh, generated. And also, this nucleus will lose its recoil momentum from the initial reaction uh, due to the energy loss in the target material. This is all possible due to the comparably long lifetime of the lambda of 263 picoseconds, so that uh, in the final uh, step, we can observe two body decays of this uh, hypernuclei at rest. And by that, we are especially looking for the uh, pi minus channel, where um, yeah, hypertriton will decay into uh, hydrogen, uh, helium-3, sorry, and a pi minus. And uh, having a look at this uh, simple formula, we can see that we only need to measure this uh, pion momentum as precisely as possible uh, to get the total mass of the hypernucleus, since it uh, otherwise only depends on the pion mass as well as the helium-3 mass. Now let's have a look at how this experiment will look like in the A1 hall. Uh, we have the uh, electron beam incoming from here. Uh, hitting our target, and then we utilize a special dedicated Kaon spectrometer called CHAOS, which is uh, only used for hypernuclear experiments at the A1 hall. This is a special spectrometer brought closer to the uh, interaction points, so a closer distance uh, to the target, and this is uh, to compensate for the uh, short Kaon lifetime. <clears throat> also, it is an in beamline spectrometer, which is special for A1, so that it can cover forward angles of the emitted kaons. By that, we are observing the events with the maximal probability where the lambda can be bound to the nucleus. Other than that, we have the magnetic spectrometers, A, B, and uh, C. And for our experiment, we are going to use A in red and C in green for the detection of the decay pions. These uh, spectrometers are suited for this um, quite well, since they offer a high momentum resolution of around 10 to the minus 5. However, due to a calibration, uh, the accuracy is right now limited to 10 to the minus 4, uh, which I'm going to explain in more detail later on. And in the final data taking, we are looking for coincidence events between the chaos spectrometer together with one of the spectrometers, A or C. And experiments like these have already before, uh, uh, performed um, in the past. Uh, the last experiment was in 2014. And in this experiment, uh, you can see this um, 
pi and momentum spectrum, which was uh, recorded back in the days. And what you can see at around uh, 133 MeV over C is uh, a monoenergetic peak coming from the decay pions of hydrogen for lambda. And from this observation, we were able to uh, reproduce the binding energy for hydrogen for lambda, which uh, came with a very nice and small uh, statistical error. Uh, but however, due to this calibration problem, the systematic error was clearly dominating this experiment. And also, I mean, the main problem is that in this experiment, hypertriton uh, was not observed. Its momentum should lie at around 113 uh, MeV, uh, but there was nothing inside this data. And uh, from the afterwards perspective, it's um, not a very big surprise since um, due to fragmentation uh, calculations, the yield is expected to be uh, one order of magnitude lower than the uh, hydrogen for lambda yield. This can be seen in these pictures. In the last experiment, we used a beryllium target. And uh, over here, you can see the different fragmentation possibilities for a beryllium-9 target. And you can see uh, the dark blue line, which is hydrogen for lambda. And the uh, light blue line is, hyper, uh, is um, yeah, it's hypertriton which is uh, around one order of magnitude lower. Um, the same holds for uh, lithium-7 as well. There, uh, these curves are quite similar. But um, we still want to change the target nucleus from beryllium to lithium, and this is due to two reasons. Uh, on the one hand, um, Lithium-7 offers less background than beryllium-9. For example, there are especially uh, two heavy uh, hyperhelium isotopes, which have a very similar decay pi and momentum to hypertriton. And to get uh, rid of these, we uh, simply use a smaller target nucleus so these can't be produced. Uh, other than that, lithium offers more possibilities for the target design due to its low density. So uh, for the Last experiment, we used uh, like a conventional fixed target, which was a plate where the uh, beam was traveling through. But uh, for the upcoming experiment, we want to use a new target setup. And this can be seen right here. Uh, we still have like a foil of material, but um, now we uh, want to use it uh, in its long side. So the electron beam uh, is to traverse the whole amount of this material, which brings us to a target which is uh, 45 millimeters long, giving an aerial density of 2.4 grams per centimeter squared, which is around 100 times thicker than the last target. So this is really due uh, uh, to maximize the rate of produced hypernuclei. Uh, on the other hand, this target, uh, which you can see in the bottom left figure, is very thin, perpendicular to the beam, only 0.7 millimeters, to, minima to minimize the amount of material for the decay pions. And uh, how the particles are traveling can be seen in the top right uh, figure. There I've uh, drawn, uh, drawn the electron beam as well as the forwardly exiting uh, kaons. And uh, the decay pions we want to observe at uh, 90 degrees uh, to the beam. I also mis misaligned the target and the electron beam here on purpose since uh, it's a challenge to align this target properly to the beam. And therefore, we came up with a target system which consists also of uh, two motors, uh, a linear motor and a rotary motor, which allow for the decrease of freedom indicated by these red arrows. Other than that, lithium is also a challenging material due to its uh, low melting point at 180 degrees Celsius. And to avoid this uh, from melting during the experiment, we uh, are keeping this target inside a cooled copper frame. But now the question is how do we monitor the, the temperature and also uh, how do we observe the alignment of this target? 
The answer to this is a thermal camera surveillance system. And this looks as follows. Uh, over there, we have a thermal camera together with uh, four infrared lenses, which are made of uh, gallium arsenide. And they are to focus uh, the camera uh, onto the target as good as possible so that we are able to take pictures of the target like uh, the bottom right one. And um, another special thing around here is that we have to use one of these infrared lenses as a, a vacuum window since, of course, the lithium target will be placed inside uh, the evacuated target chamber. And since other materials like glass or kapton are infrared absorbing, uh, we had to come up with this solution. Now there are many, two, uh, many new things uh, to our experimental setup and therefore we already did a test beam time uh, in this May. This uh, was already performed in the A1 hall with uh, three days of experiment and a beam current of uh, five microamperes which is, by the, by the way, the number we want to achieve in the uh, upcoming experiment as well. Um, and uh, there we tested all the new procedures. For example, uh, let's start with the uh, uh, target movement procedures. Uh, you can see the uh, linear position of the target in this upper left plot. And um, this uh, is a plot where the event rate in the spectrometers can be seen. And you can clearly see that there is uh, a certain maximum at one point which we were um, possible, um, to, which we were able to drive to with these motors. Um, another observation from, from this curve is that um, we could extract a beam width uh, with a sigma of 330 micrometers by folding uh, a box shape of the target together with a Gaussian shape uh, for the beam. And this tells us that we really need this uh, uh, 700 micrometer uh, thickness in the um, direction perpendicular to the beam. Otherwise, we would lose many beam electrons uh, to the sides of the target. Yeah, and uh, in a similar fashion, we also were able to uh, rotate the target and uh, observe a similar curve there as well. So, um, yeah, we are quite positive about this uh, moving procedure and finding the target. Uh, the other thing is that we finally did a high current test. And um, there we cranked up the beam current up to 14 uh, microamperes. And uh, we didn't observe any drop in the uh, luminosity, uh, so in the event rate of this target. So uh, we are very positive that uh, the target didn't melt away. <laughs> and other, other than that, I also want to show you a view of uh, the thermal camera. So there you can uh, see the target plate. And uh, right now we uh, switched the beam on for a while and you can already see that uh, the target is warming up. And then after that, uh, for this test, uh, we switch the beam off again, and you can see that the target is immediately cooling down. So this is a real-time video. So um, the conclusion from this um, test beam time was that the moving and cooling procedures work as intended. And also another nice observation is that the uh, involved electronics didn't suffer any permanent radiation damages. From there, let's now have a look at the problem with the systematic error in our spectrometers. As I said, um, the recent value was um, uh, evaluated with um, 77 keV systematic error. And this is due to the uncertainty in MAMI's beam energy measurement, which has a, a 160 keV uncertainty. This is not to be confused with the actual MAMI energy. Uh, this could be shown by Philip Hermann. Uh, he uh, used an, uh, a dedicated in-beamline energy spectrometer and with this he was able to take this data. This was over um, the time of two days where uh, repeatedly MAMI energy measurements were done in uh, blue as well as um, measurements by Philip Hermann in purple, and, that you, and, and you can see that uh, MAMI itself is much more stable than uh, the actual energy measurement by MAMI uh, would promise. 
Um, however, this procedure uh, still didn't give an absolute value on the beam energy. It still had its own systematics. Uh, so therefore, we came up with uh, another method, which is uh, under later light interference. And I try to explain you this uh, <laughs> in a few words. This is uh, the work of Pascal Clark. Um, he uses two undulators, which are basically uh, alternating uh, coil pairs. And um, in, in this picture, you can see uh, a beam line running through these uh, two undulators. And uh, when fast electrons pass uh, through this alternating magnetic field, synchrotron radiation will be emitted. And from this radiation, you can actually do an interference uh, experiment. So what we do is um, we can vary the distance between these two undulators. And um, when we then extract uh, this uh, synchrotron radiation um, and put it on a monochromator, uh, we can select a certain wavelength out of the spectrum. And by this, uh, we can do interference, which we observe with a UV camera. And then the final intensity um, spectrum, which comes out, will uh, look something like this, uh, where uh, on the x-axis we have again, this distance between the uh, undulators. So and from that, uh, one can use the uh, undulator equation, which links the oscillation wavelength um, of the synchrotron ra radiation to their uh, light wavelength. And uh, the factor between there is the relativistic gamma. Okay. Um, uh, and so uh, this uh, method depends only on these uh, th uh, these two um, yeah uh, properties. Uh, so the length me measurement can be done very easy as well as the uh, monochromator calibration, and also the optical al uh, alignment is uh, I mean challenging, but it can be done very nicely with uh, theodolites. And uh, let me quickly show you uh, a result from Pascal. So by taking such a measurement, uh, I mean, with this monochromator, he can um, observe uh, many different wavelengths on uh, different positions. So within one go, he can um, evaluate 100 spectra for different uh, wavelengths at once. And this is also done by uh, fitting the data with only five fit parameters. And by this, um, he can uh, get a final accuracy in the electron beam of 18 keV, which is almost one magnitude uh, better than the MAMI energy measurement. And from there, let's come to my conclusion, or the summary and outlook. So uh, a new lithium target for high luminosity was constructed and tested. Uh, and from there, we are uh, facing the first beam time, which is uh, starting in uh, two weeks, from the 11th of July to the 1st of August. Uh, there's also another beam time to be coming up in uh, September. Um, within this experiment, we want to use the same uh, momentum setting as in the previous experiments, so that we are also sensitive to hydrogen for lambda as well. And together with a new um, spectrometer calibration, we are looking forward to the goal of a total error of plus minus 20 keV in both of their lambda binding energies. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So we wish you big success in the near future. Thank you. Um, questions? Yes, Hiro. Yeah, thank you for your talk. It's, uh, I'm very impressed by a very precise setup. And uh, I have one comment or the question. So when you produce hypertriton, then it has some recoil momentum and it goes downstream and maybe it travels, I don't know, one millimeter or some amount mm -hmm. inside this target. So when you uh, tune the, uh, uh, align the target position, you should take into account this effect, right? No? Yeah, but 
even, yeah, no, no, I'm talking about the hypertriton, which stops in the lithium target, but yeah. it mainly goes downstream because of this recoil momentum. And yeah. I don't know how much, but it may travel one millimeter or several hundred millimeter downstream. So, um, and uh, because in your alignment, it's really precise, yeah. So that maybe you have to take into account this effect. When, when um, you, when yeah, you I mean, um, the, the downstream direction is fully covered by the lithium material. And, yeah, no, um, no, no, the position of the beam position. Yeah, actually, uh, the, yeah. the Z position um, uh, doesn't matter to us too much. Uh, so um, within our spectrometers, we have a Z acceptance of five centimeters. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it comes from... Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. I see, I see. Yeah. You're worrying about the beam itself, uh, not the Z position. Exactly. Yeah, okay, thank you. Exactly. Okay, okay, I misunderstood. Perhaps okay. this yeah. is a perfect topic for coffee time. <laughs> So, um, okay. there's yeah, another question. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very impressive presentation. So, it's really nice to see that your accuracy will be better than our emulsion um, challenge, which gives us sort of the 28 kV for the hypertriton binding energy, so we are somehow very compatible. So, so I'm really looking forward to this result. So, but my question is that how many counts are you expecting to observe for the hypertriton? Um, yeah, actually, uh, we have to see what's coming out. <laughs> because you have I never mean, observed the hypertriton, right, in the yeah. previous experiment. I mean, um, from these fragmentation uh, calculations, um, we are expecting uh, maybe 100 counts. So I think um, within the um, hydrogen four lambda experiment, uh, the last time we had uh, like around 100 counts. And uh, due to the fact that it's one um, magnitude uh, lower in the yield, I mean, these 10 events uh, above the background, we were not uh, able to see if they even were there. But um, by now um, having uh, luminosity, uh, it's, it will not be a, a factor of 100, more, but um, uh, since we want to use a lower beam current to suppress more background, uh, but I think we can go for a factor of uh, 50 or something. So uh, that I hope that we see around 100 events. I see. So do you also increase the statistics for the hydrogen for lambda with this reaction? Um, yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. I see. The yields are the same, but the luminosity is, is higher, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so thank you to all the speakers of this session, which is closed now. And, uh, we should meet again uh, officially at 11 sharp. Uh, can we still do that, Yeji? Yes. yes. Good. Okay, thank you.
So welcome back. Is everybody here? Okay, so let's start the topical session on lambda nuclear nuclear three-body force. So I'm Hiro Tamura, Tohoku University, and uh, I'll be the convener of this topical session. And I want to thank the organizers for allowing us to have such kind of special session here. So in the beginning, I want to show you some motivation of this topical session. Uh, yeah. So of course, uh, we have already discussed uh, uh, neutron stars and uh, uh, hyperon puzzle. But anyway, I just want to stress here that neutron star is really full of mysteries and our nuclear physicist and hadron physicist should understand what is inside microscopically. And, but, oh sorry. But you know, in the, uh, the most possible scenario in a normal, normal nuclear physics is the appearance of the hyperons in the center of the neutron stars. And by applying the experimental information on the binding energy of lambda, psi, and uh, sigma, to, I'm sorry, I can't, in the nuclear matter, it's, yeah, it's uh, minus 30 MeV for lambda, plus uh, 10, 20, 30 MeV for sigma, and minus 15 MeV for, for psi, if we assume this, or, uh, that is taken from the experimental data, then series uh, can give us such kind of baryon fractions as a function of the density. But of course, you know, this seriously contra contradict with the mass, maximum mass of the neutron stars. This is called, of course, hyperon puzzle. And of course, as you hear yesterday, uh, unknown repulsion in dense matter should exist, but we don't know what is this. So how to investigate the density dependence of the lambda n interaction in nuclear matter, or in other words, lambda n in force is uh, of course very important, but experimentally what to do is a big problem and we need theoretical help, support to investigate this problem. That's why we want to have this uh, special session, topical session. So here I want to show you a little bit about our project at JPAC for uh, Hadron Experimental Facility Extension. So as you may know, we have only one production target and only one charged particle uh, separated beam line and one primary uh, beam line here. But uh, in this project, we are going to extend the facility twice as large, and we install another production target and install several very unique uh, secondary beam lines. So uh, this project is, has been discussed for a long time in our community, and last year and this year, we have organized uh, several online meetings, uh, workshops, and many of you uh, participated in our workshop and also gave us various support and also you wrote supporting letter and so on and that was very helpful. And, and then uh, now uh, in order to make this uh, performance of the Hadron facility doubled, the situation is very good. And the details of this project will be presented by Sakuma-san and uh, on Friday, but here I just want to tell you that uh, the KEK has just decided to select this project as the priority one, the first priority project to, to come from next year. Of course, uh, we need some large amount of money and this depends on the financial situation of the government. But now we can say this project is much, much more realistic than before. Thank you very much for your help, support. So now, uh, in order to do such kind of big project, we need a very, uh, I mean, strong motivation of science. And 
we've put these two, uh, I'm sorry, for these two beam lines, HIHR, high intensity, high resolution beam line, and also low momentum charge separated line, K1.1, for these two beam lines, uh, we set the physics motivation saying that we will solve the hyperon puzzle by using these two beam lines. Then we proposed uh, flagship experiments using these two beam lines. So this is very important motivation for this uh, whole uh, project of the extension of the Hadron facility. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit more. Uh, in JPAC, we are going to uh, study oh, sorry, which one? The precisely the binding energies of lambda hypernuclei by Pike reaction. And this is, you know, the uh, previous uh, spectrum. And we have already determined in all, from all the experiment the binding energies of various uh, mass number lambda hypernuclei with the various lambda single particle orbits. And uh, if we calculate, for example, in this case, this is from by assuming the Nijmegen interaction and uh, through the G matrix method by Yamamoto-san, and uh, you can get such kind of uh, uh, curve. And in order to reproduce the data, they say they need uh, repulsive, three-body repulsive force like this. So in this way, uh, even if we look at the nuclear data, which is uh, the density should be up to rho zero, however, we can see such kind of density dependence of the lambda in interaction from precise hypernuclear data. But however, uh, in, the, in this old experiment, you see the peaks are so broad and overlapped, and also we know each, each broad peak contains several, several many peaks. So in order to determine precisely the single particle of its energy, then we need much better resolution of the experiment. So the, in the proposed experiment, uh, Nakamura-san will talk later details of this project. Uh, we are going to construct a new beam line, a very special one, high intensity, high resolution beam line, uh, which uh, is in which we can use the very high intensity pion beam, more than one order of magnitude intense beam with a very high resolution. Uh, by adopting the momentum dispersion matching technique. So this is a very special beam line, but it allows us to produce such kind of uh, spectrum. So uh, this is probably very unique, very important uh, experiment, uh, which should be done in the uh, proposed uh, extended Hadron facility. And, but in order to do such kind of study, we should, of course, uh, uh, know the why in two body interaction in free space very well. So in this case, it assumes the Nijmegen ESC 16, but if you assume different type of uh, Nijmegen potential, then the situation completely changes. You don't need three body repulsive force. So, so that in order to do such kind of business, we need a very uh, high quality scattering data of YN interaction. So in order to do that, we also do a scattering experiment uh, in JPAC uh, using one K1.1 1 .1 beam line. So this is uh, the spectrum shown yesterday by uh, Miwa-san, this upper one, for sigma proton scattering. So we are now uh, ready to do such kind of scattering experiment with high quality, and we are going to do that to, for lambda proton case uh, in K1.1 1 .1 beam line together. Then this is just a simulation, but you can see uh, very precise and high quality data will come soon in JPAC. So uh, together with these two experiments, one is the precise uh, binding energy measurement of various lambda hypernuclei, uh, and also high quality hypernuclear scattering data. And of course, uh, we will take uh, uh, lambda lambda xion, uh, data using hypernuclear, which, uh, uh, of which experiments are going now uh, in the present facility at JPARC, and also KN interaction information will be given from KNUC nucleus and KNUC atomic exper experiment, which is also going now. And, also, and of course, 
we can use the femtoscopy data, which is really beautiful and it's very helpful because uh, in such scattering experiment, we can't do the scattering experiment for uh, strangeness two or three sectors, of course, but this method can be available for lambda, lambda, xi n, or omega proton, and so on. So by combining all of this information, of course, this is uh, probably very important, but combining all of these, uh, we can, we hope to make the realistic baryon baryon interactions. And then uh, maybe the, one of the most promising methods is to establish the uh, chiral EFT uh, approach extended to the flavor SU3 and to obtain the baryon baryon interactions in this chiral uh, EFT framework and then at that time, the lattice QCD uh, development will be very useful. And of course, they should be, this result should be tested by such experimental data. But finally, this is also used for constructing the baryon baryon interaction model. And finally, we ask theorists to calculate as precisely as possible the hypernuclear structure based on this baryon baryon realistic interaction. Then we can do the comparison with the precise hypernuclear spectroscopic data. So uh, then we hope to determine or derive the uh, strength of the YN and silver repulsion here. And of course, this can be also fed back to uh, make the silver the uh, low energy constant in the uh, chiral EFT uh, framework. Okay, in this way, we hope we can make the realistic, very realistic equation of the state that can be finally tested by observational data of neutron stars from X-rays and gravitational waves. So if they agree very well, then we can say we understand the high density matter inside the neutron stars. But if they don't agree with each other, then we should say that neutron star cannot be described by hadron degree of freedom and we, it may be an evidence that we need a quark degree of freedom in neutron stars. So anyway, in order to do that, we need theoretical development as well as experiment. So uh, uh, that's why I arranged this um, uh, topical session here. So I just want to show you some frequently asked questions uh, from my colleagues. So uh, even in ordinary nuclear system, in order to get a three-body force or a density-dependent repulsive uh, uh, nuclear interaction is rather difficult, not straightforward. And uh, in the case of YN, uh, of course, in the case of nuclear nuclear, we have plenty of nuclear data and scattering data, but even though it's difficult. So many people ask me, why you can do that in hyper-nuclear in, in such a condition? But I can say, Lambda or hyperon is rather easier than nucleons because inside of the nucleus, lambda is distinguishable from other nucleons and it gets no power effect. So, and also we know the local density where the lambda is located now, if we can do the uh, proper calculation of the hypernuclear uh, structure, so that by using different mass number or different uh, orbits of lambda particle, then we can prove various different densities of inside the nuclear matter by using a lambda hyperon. So by using such features very well, then I hope, I personally hope we can solve this problem and we can get the information of the three body force, lambda and then force very well. But of course, uh, theoretical work is challenging. And uh, another problem is this uh, nuclear data gives us information on density dependence at density lower than separation density, of course. So we need extrapolation, and is a reliable extrapolation to a higher density really possible or not? I, this is the question which I want to ask to theorists now today. And uh, so uh, I hear that in the chiral EFT method allows the extrapolation maybe up to twice or more of rho zero, by using the uh, chiral EFT approach through the three body force the, uh, next to next leading order. But I want to know how well we can do that, how far 
we can do that. And also, what we want to know, how are key experiments to extract uh, such three-body force effect, or to determine the low energy constant in the uh, three-body force? And also, even after we establish the two-body realistic force and three-body force effect, then we need a precise calculation of the hypernuclear structure to compare with the precise data. So how precisely hypernuclear st structure can be calculated, this is also a very important point. So, so that today, uh, I want to ask you these questions. So uh, today, I decided to uh, invite three distinguished scientists. So Dr. Uh, Professor Eppelbaum will talk about the present status of the chiral EFT in terms of particularly focusing on the three body force. And then uh, Professor Gao will talk about how we can extract the three body force effect from hypernuclear structure. And finally, uh, Professor Weise will give us our future <laughs> prospect uh, and give us answers to such questions, I hope. So, and final question is this high quality experimental data can be really obtained uh, near future in JPAC and also by phentoscopy and so on. And I can say in JPAC, as I said, it's okay. Yeah, and Nakamura-san will talk about this tomorrow. And also Mia-san already talked about this yesterday. And from phentoscopy approach, uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Zeuk Naito, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce well. She will give us the uh, possibility of studying three body force from centroscopy. So I'm sorry, I, I don't want to talk anymore, but uh, let's start <laughs> this session. So I hope you have no questions. And no, okay, <laughs> let me proceed. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Okay, so the first speaker of this session, uh, Dr. I'm sorry, is Hi, so I'm Shirkshnita. I'm not a doctor as well. <laughs> I'm yeah, just Laura Shirkshnita. Okay, so I wanted today present you what we want to do with Femtoscope and Elise. Uh, to measure three body interactions. And my, my talk will be based on already two papers we wrote and on some completely new results. So the motivation, as already mentioned a few times, is that the already observed properties of nuclei and hypernuclei cannot be explained using only two body effects. So we need to include the three body forces. It was shown as well this week that if we increase the density of the system, the three body effects become more and more relevant suggesting that such study is very interesting as well for the neutron stars. However, currently the three body effects are usually constrained using the binding energies of nuclei and hypernuclei, which is very model dependent. So our goal in Elise is to really show a new method to access three body systems and hopefully to measure the, uh, the, the three body interaction. Such interactions would as well be interesting for already presented another topic, the exotic conic bound states, because it was already predicted 20 years ago that there should be the KNN uh, bound system because of the very strong attractive uh, NK in, uh, interaction. And there was the first evidence which was experimental as well. However, the models as presented uh, in previous days as well usually include mainly two body forces and does not account for the three body interaction. So we would like with our method as well to probe the system of KPP and I will show our, let's say, first gauge of what we can measure. I want to start by introducing the method with two-body femtoscopy, which is already very well established. And the idea is that we collide two particles and we produce a lot of new particles, as shown here. Now, if the produced particles are close enough in phase space, they might experience final state interaction, and then their momenta gets correlated. And this is what we can observe really in the detector. What we measure is called correlation function. We measure as a function of the relative momenta between two particles in the PRS frame. Uh, and to obtain it experimentally, we, we need to measure the distribution of particle pairs in same event and mixed event as a function of this relative momenta. In case when we measure the same events, we take two particles from same events where the particles really feel the interaction. For the mixed event, we use it as a reference and we take two particles from two different events so they for sure don't interact. 
Now, from theory side, you can describe correlation function using canon Pratt equation shown here, where you need to know the source, which tells how far away the particles were produced from each other. And you as well need the relative wave function, which includes the interaction information. Now, here is, uh, as example, a repulsive interaction shown. And if we look how correlation function would map for this uh, interaction, we see the correlation function going below one, which is what you expect, because if two particles repulse each other, they go away from each other and the relative momentum increases. In case of attractive interaction, we have correlation function which goes above one. Uh, there will be a lot of talks actually after me about two-body femtoscopy, so I really invite you to join them. However, today I want to talk about the three-body femtoscopy. So idea is the same, we look at the same and mixed event distributions. In this case, for three particles, as a function of Q3, where Q3 is the Lorentz invariant hypermoment of the triplet. And today I want to show you the results obtained with high multiplicity PP collisions in Elise uh, at certain TV collision energy. And I will show you the following four systems, so I will introduce them now. I want to start with PP lambda and PPP correlation functions, which you measure, so this is already our data. On the left side, the PP lambda system, on the right side, the PPP system. And there are several things which are very important for you to understand. One is that, first of all, the correlation function is not equal to one. So we really observe triplets, which are correlated in momentum, the particles. Second of all, we can go down to rather low Q3 with already current run two statistics. So we see the hypermomentum is around 100 MeV over C. And another thing which is interesting to know for the rest of the talk is that with two-body femtoscopy, it was shown that the particles are emitted at around one Fermi distances. So we can really access the very, very small distances with this measurement. However, the three-body case is much more complicated than the two-body case because we have in the measurement triplets where only two particles might interact and triplets where all three particles might interact. What we are interested in is the case of three particles. So what we need to do and we can, what we can do is to use Kubo cumulant method which tells us that if we measure the three particle correlation function showed in the previous slide, and you know the two body correlations, which here are lower order contributions, you can subtract them from your measurement. The question now is, do we know these lower order contributions? And the answer is yes and very well. We have even two methods. So one method to obtain the case when two particles are correlated, one not, is based on event mixing and it's data driven. And the idea is that you take two particles from same event, as you can see here, and another third particle you take from a different event, as shown here. So the third particle has no way to interact with the first two. And then we use the normal, let's say, <laughs> correlation function formula, and we obtain the correlation function as a function of Q3. Now, the second method I want to show was developed in our group by Raffaele Dengrande, and it's already published. And it's very beautiful because it's more semi-analytical approach than only data-driven approach. And the idea is that we can take two particle correlated or theoretical correlation function as a function of k star, where k star is the relative momentum between two interacting particles, and perform a kinematic transformation to see how this correlation would look in three particle system if the third particle is not interacting. For this, we of course need to know how k star relates to p3. And we showed in our paper that we can analytically estimate or actually calculate um, how the K star distribution for specific Q3 triplet looks. So it basically tells you that if you have specific Q3 value at this triplet, you have the specific probability, uh, possibility to find a particle pair with K star. And this is method is really new. I will show you in the next slides that it works extremely well. However, first, how we actually obtain the correlation function. So we obtain the correlation function by integrating the two particle correlation function where the interaction is and multiplying by the probability to find such pair in the specific Q3 band. And of course, we integrate over entire available key star phase space. Now to the results. So I want to first introduce the proton-proton lambda uh, system because in this case, we have two different particles. Uh, we have protons and lambdas. So to know lower order contributions, we need two measurements. One is the case when two protons are correlated and the lambda is not. The other option is when lambda is correlated with one of the protons and the other proton is not interacting at all in the system. 
So the, in the results, in the two figures, what you see is the correlation function is a function of Q3 for the two cases, and the green points are the data, and the green band is the projector method. And there are, again, few things that we can see. One, the two methods are in agreement, in a very good agreement, which means that we have constrained these lower order contributions, both by looking at data and by taking this, let's say, semi-analytical approach. Another thing we see is that the projector uh, uncertainties are much smaller, allowing us to reduce the uncertainty in the final measurement of the cumulant, which I will show you. Of course, to compare now to the three-body uh, correlation function, we need a total lower order contribution, which we obtained by following the Kubo rule and uh, summing up over all possibilities. So this is the result. Here is another thing which <laughs> it's important to understand. If there is even no cases, no triplets, where there is three-body interaction, where all three particles are interaction, interacting, sorry, you would still measure correlation function, which is very visible. And it, if you see it, it goes even uh, to up 3.5 at 100 MeV over C. Now, we can do a similar game for the case of PPP. Here we have three identical particles, so the only correlation we need to measure or estimate with the projector is when we have two particles interacting and one not. And we see again very good agreement, we see total lower order contributions. Now the most interesting part is to really compare these lower order contributions with our measurement that I showed you at the beginning. And this is done here. So again, on left side, the PP lambda, on the right side, the PPP. So any deviation from the band, which is obtained with the projector method I just showed you, tells us there is some deviation because of the three body effects because it should not come from anywhere else. And I want now to go into detail, so if we subtract these lower order contributions from the measurement, you obtain the cumulant. Now, if cumulant is equal to zero, it means that you can explain your system using only two bodies. Zero, it means you see three body effects. And what we see in people on the system is that above 0 0.2 GV over C, the cumulant is actually zero. So here we don't expect the triplets where three particles are interacting, or at least the contribution is really small. The first two bins are above zero, which tells us there is a signal. However, um, our uncertainties are still rather large, as you can see, and if we look at statistical significance, it's, two, it's 0 0.8, if I remember correctly, I don't see, um, which is small. However, the system in general for the three body interactions is very interesting because you have only two same uncharged particles. So whatever signal you see should mainly come from the strong interaction. Now the good news is that we will start this year our run three data taking in Elise. And I am working currently on offline three body trigger which will allow us to um, increase our statistics for this specific measurement up to two orders of magnitude. So we should really have very strong sensitivity and I hope to see many peers which are interacting, and many triplets which are interacting. Now in case of PPP result, uh, please concentrate on the blue line, which is the case of PPP, the, the blue data points. We already have larger statistics, and here again we see that above 0 0.2 we are in a rather good agreement, so not in a rather good agreement, but it's really zero, so there are no three body effects which we observe. In case of the second and third bin, you can see already large deviation, and it's 6.7 sigma which is already an evidence that we see something really important. However, this system, interpretation-wise, is much more complicated because you have three identical particles. So your interaction, which you see here, might come not only from the strong force, but as well from the Pauli blocking. And uh, we are currently working with theorists from PISA group to hopefully get more theoretical interpretation of the data. Now let's move to the another channel I mentioned at the be beginning, the Masonic one. So first, the PPK plus correlation. We first estimate the lower order contributions, which are shown here, and we see that the shape is actually rather complicated. We even go below one and then again above one. However, the data can again be very well described with the projector method, meaning that we have very, very well-constrained lower order contributions. Then we compare to the data and we see again that the first several bins are not in a good agreement with the projector, suggesting some three-body effects. 
If we look at the calculated cumulant, which is here, we again see that at this large Q3, we really obtain something which is zero, so we see no three body effects. However, the first bins show some uh, negative values. Again, if we look at the statistical significance, it's zero, it's two point something, I don't see now. Uh, it's above two, which is not that large. So our measurement in the current data sample is compatible with the zero hypothesis. However, as I mentioned before, we will have much more data in run three, and then we see what will happen. Uh, the final result I want to show you is the proton-proton K on minus cumulant, which, as I mentioned before, is interesting for the exotic bound states of conic nuclei. So what we see here is that actually the entire P3 region is rather compatible with zero. So we see no, let's say, relevant three-body effects, or we don't have the sensitivity for it right now. But again, in RAN3, we will have much more data. And what it would mean if our measurement is confirmed that in the case of KNN systems, the three-body interaction should not play a very big role. And to summarize, uh, I showed you the new method which we developed and confirmed with four different measurements. And the first measurement I presented was PP lambda, where we have the significant, the, the, the basically accept a compatible results to the null hypothesis. And as I said here in RAN3, we really expect up to two orders of magnitude increase in data. Then in PPP, we already have relative uh, important signal with high enough statistical significance, as you saw here. Um, and for PPK plus and PPK minus, I as well showed that we are compatible with the null hypothesis. So the main message to take from this is that we are already able to develop the method in run two, we already see statistically significant deviations from zero, and in run three, we will have much, much more statistics, and we will be very happy if you want to provide us with some theoretical interpretation and work with us. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting data, yeah. So, okay, questions, please? Yes. Yes. Wolfram? You used uh, the terms uh, three-body correlations and you used the term three-body interaction. And it seems to me that you were not making very serious distinction between the two. Uh, could you tell me how you really would like to identify in a three-body correlation function genuine three-body interactions? Because this is a, a really a theoretical concept which has to be uh, very, uh, very much subject to precise bookkeeping. How would you be able to distinguish a genuine three-body interaction from iterated two-body interactions which contribute to the three-body correlations? So I tried to be rather careful with the usage of the two words. I think I mentioned it only at the end. Uh, th that's what, what you said is the reason why I always try to say correlation. Because when we subtract the lower order contributions from our current understanding, we subtract the particle pairs where two particles are interacting. So the signal we see actually shows how often, let's say, we have a triplet where three particles are really interacting. Now for theoretical interpretation, we need as well to see higher statistics data because with this data it's uh, a bit... Uh, but the idea would be really to have theoretical prediction for it and you can, cons so if you would have theory where you can perform this uh, calculation, the good thing with femtoscopy is that you could constrain lower order contributions with two body measurements. And then when you constrain your theory to, do, to, two, body to two particle correlations, you can move on including the third particle and including the three body forces. So I think that we do need theoretical interpretation to say more as you said as well. Okay, okay so please. I saw me that you were using the, this, this uh, famous I mean, mix event, I mean, uh, technique, I mean, to get backgrounds and all that. <laughs> it is funny, it's dangerous. You know, I'm a theoretician, but at some point in my life, I had to write a paper on that. Mm -hmm. It's very treacherous, very treacherous, the method. Yeah, I have a paper where I explain that. Because, you know, I mean, you get uncorrelated events, and if the cross-section that you study, I mean, is very energy-dependent, 
Then when you choose random events, they are chosen statistically from the region, I mean, that has bigger cross-sections. But this region might have nothing to do with the other region of energies while you are investigating events. So at the end, you get, I mean, things which, I mean, have no sense at all. I will give you that reference. It's very interesting. But now, since I'm talking, I sorry, wanted to ask a question. I, sorry, I could hear you not very well at the end. So what is the problem? I will tell you. I mean, it's a long, long story. But can I go, I mean, to the first transparency, you know? I mean, the first transparency, and that would be a question. The first slide that you have. And first slide. Because, yes. You know, actually, I mean, Angel Ramos, I mean, asked this question at the beginning. And next one. <clears throat> this one, this one. I mean, she asked it, but I want to elaborate further because it will just apply that, I mean, to K bar N. Imagine you want to learn about K minus proton interaction. You have 10 channels, eh? 10 couple channels. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, I mean, you have the, uh, the freedom that you have are, I mean, first, you see, you, have, you can produce any of the 10 channels, and then the 10 channels can collide or can make transition to the final K minus proton, couple channels. Mm -hmm. But then you have the uh, 10. You know, 10, I mean, unknowns, which are the production, I finished, which are the unknowns, I mean, for the production, the intermediate channels, plus 10 unknowns, which are the transition matrices from these channels, I mean, to the final one. So I have 20, eh, 20 unknowns there. So uh, then at the end, the correlation function that you have, I mean, I don't know what is the meaning or how you are going so, to interpret. Is that, I mean, what is by Yuki? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, sure, I mean. So. Th th I mean, so he, for a couple know, channels, you can account I know he mentioned in the system. He wrote, and he wrote, I still have in my mind the equation that he wrote. But the fact is that you have there 20 degrees of freedom, and I don't know how you are going to handle that. So it was already shown by Yuki, and there will be another experimental presentation of uh, KN interactions. You cannot reproduce very well the couple channels in theory. And uh, I mean... <laughs> Okay, sorry. We can uh, discuss of, later yeah. as well, but... <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's, I mean... Okay, please continue discussion later, I'm sorry. But we should go to the next speaker, but thank you very much for your uh, discussion. Thank you for your talk. <laughs> Hi, the next speaker is Professor Eppelbaum. Thank you for your coming. He's going to talk about... Uh, Precisely nuclear interactions from chiral effective field theory, where do we start? Okay, yeah, okay, so uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for the invitation. I'm really very pleased to be here. And I was asked to talk about the uh, three body force, so three nucleon force. I apologize already now that I will probably be the only participant of this conference who will not be talking about s strange systems. But nevertheless, I think it's quite interesting and instructive to see what we can learn about this much simpler, uh, non-strange baryonic systems. Okay, so we know, of course, that's a, so let me start with a two nuclear force. We know it's very simple, so the structure can be parameterized just in terms of a couple of functions. And so that is actually the reason why we have, you know, the so-called high precision potential since 30 years. All of them describe the data almost perfectly, but if you take these interactions and you start calculating, let's say, three-body observables, then you start seeing deviations, for example, even for the total cross-section, as you can see in this logarithmic plot. So obviously, if you see deviations for the total cross-section, and if you now go to polarization data, then the discrepancies will increase, as you can see here in this example. Well, that's of course not a big deal. It just tells you that something is missing. So three, three nuclear interactions are missing. And now the first thing you might have in mind is to try to parameterize them in the most general way. However, you see the structure, if you add the additional nucleon, structure becomes really very complicated. So you definitely need a guidance if you want to parameterize, you know, this tremendous amount of information in a systematic way. So you need to use guidance from theory or some kind of models. So three body, three nuclear forces is actually quite an old topic as two body interactions as well. 
And so different models have been developed. So here you can see some examples of typical processes that have been taken into account. But now, of course, you want to know, okay, how can we quantify, you know, if these models are doing a good job in the description of the data? So some 10 years ago with uh, experimental colleagues, we have actually done a sort of a global analysis of all available uh, three bodies scattering data at that time. And so the idea is very simple. So you consider given observable and you do calculations based on two body interactions only. That is what is plotted on the X axis. So the deviation between experimental theory then you add your three-body force model and recalculate it, and the deviation is again plotted at the y-axis. If your three-body interactions uh, are doing a good job in improving the description of the, of the data, you would expect you know, these points to be close to horizontal axis. That is what we see indeed for the uh, differential cross-section and elastic anti-scattering. However, if you go to polarization observables, we even break up you can see basically no improvement at all. So this immediately tells you that, well, the spin structure, the three-body force is not well understood at the moment. That is, of course, what we would like to uh, do now using a systematic method based on chiral effective field theory. So there were already several introductions to this topic. So the method is based on the most general effective Lagrangian for points and nucleons that contains all possible vertices, interactions, which are compatible with the symmetries of QCD. Now, the symmetries, of course, don't tell you anything about the values of the low energy constants, which need to be determined from experiment. Uh, but uh, what you can do, on the other hand, is a systematic perturbative expansion of your scattering amplitude in uh, this uh, expansion parameter Q, which is given by momenta, assumed to be of the order of the pine mass, divided by some breakdown scale, let's say, typically of the order of the rho meson mass. So you can see the expansion parameter is not really that small. So that's not QED. Don't expect too much. But the beauty of this thing is that you have so many data in the, in the non-strange sector that it is absolutely no problem to push, or at least in principle no problem, to push the theory to higher orders. And that's exactly what we want to do. So. What I'm going to tell you, or to, to be talking, is developing this chiral FT into a precision tool. So we don't want these uh, chiral interactions to be considered as yet another model, phenomenological model, but rather we want to try to be predictive. Okay, so here you can see uh, chiral expansion of the nuclear Hamiltonian. So this direction, that's what we would like to go more accuracy, higher orders. Unfortunately, of course, also more work and higher complexity, more low energy constants. And so what is shown here in this table are only the various topologies. And so this blue blobs are in fact point nuclear scattering amplitudes, which are sub-processes for, uh, for nuclear forces and which are calculated within the same theoretical approach. All the pi nuclear low energy constants have been reliably determined uh, in the pi-nuclear system. This means that all these blue uh, contributions are parameter-free predictions, no parameters, okay? On the other hand, you also see here this red vertices associated with contact interactions. So they involve, of course, parameters that need to be determined from experiment. And here you can see the, the number of the corresponding low energy constants. Now, almost all that is shown in this table has been worked out in the last decades using dimensional regularization. That's an important point. I'll come back to this later on. And also keep in mind that in all applications we will be discussing, I will be using a finite regulator. So there was already some discussion on this. Uh, maybe I would like to draw your attention to our recent paper where we have rigorously proven uh, renormalizability of this finite cutoff EFT in the two nuclear sector. And uh, yeah, so I will try to convince you later on that having a finite cutoff can actually be turned 
to your advantage. So this is yet an additional way to ensure consistency of your calculations. Okay, so let me briefly show you state of the art in the two nuclear sector, and uh, it's given basically in this table where you can see that the that our most recent interactions developed in Bochum uh, provide essentially statistically perfect description of an end data up to the point production threshold. You know, to be fair, I should mention that a somewhat worse performance of the high precision potentials is basically because of the additional experimental data that have been measured after these interactions were constructed, okay? This is yet another visualization of, you know, all these differences. What is shown here is a, is a total cross-section in the two nuclear system. So red line is our result. Here you can compare it with experimental data and also with circles, which are Nijmegen partial wave analysis and CD bond and another family of chiral interactions. And so this plot explains you the error budget of our studies. You can see if you go to higher energies that everything is dominated, the uncertainty is dominated by truncation, uh, truncation error. Okay, so how do we actually estimate truncation uncertainty? The uncertainty coming from neglected high order terms. The idea is very simple. And so let's take a look at the chiral expansion of let's say uh, total cross-section of this particular energy in the two nuclear system. Here you can see explicit results at various orders in the chiral expansion. The idea is very, very simple. Uh, in fact, these coefficients which you obtain in your calculations know already about the convergence rate of the underlying effective field theory. So you can infer from these coefficients informations about the size of the neglected higher order terms. And if you put this into a Bayesian framework, you can just calculate it posteriors, marginalize over neglected higher order terms and obtain your truncation errors, which you can see here in this picture. So this red bars, 68% uh, degree of belief intervals, uh, yellow ones are 95% degree of belief intervals. Now, this is just one calculation for one particular cutoff value for 50. Now let me come back to having several cutoffs. And now you can repeat the same analysis using different values of the regulators. And of course the residual lambda dependence should be within the truncation error. So that is exactly what we observe here. You can see repeating these studies using different cutoffs. And at the end of the day, we see almost no residual cutoff dependence. Okay, so let me now move to uh, heavy systems and all these studies are done by the LENPIC collaboration. And so I will be talking in the next slides about the inclusion of the leading three-body force which is given by the simple diagrams. And so you can see here it depends on two new low energy constants, CD and C. So usually what essentially everybody is doing is to fix one of these low energy constants to the triton binding energy. That's very convenient. And for the second one, what you can do is you can uh, use the differential cross-section in ND scattering. Here is the idea of what happens if you calculate the ND cross-section using two-body interactions only, then you will see it develops a minimum area, okay? So this deep increases if you increase the energy and at some point uh, you start at this minimum area to be sensitive to the three body force contribution which is more or less angle independent and flat. And so that is exactly what we are using in order to determine the second parameter in our three body force. So we are just using the beautiful data by Kimiko Sikiguchi from RECAN, 70 MeV, and this scattering, and uh, this allows us to completely fix the Hamiltonian at this, this level. Now we have our Hamiltonian fixed, let's make predictions. And so let me start with uh, ND total cross-section. And so this is what happens if you uh, use two-body interactions at increasing orders in chiral FT expansion. This is exper experimental data, and here you can see the under prediction of the total cross-section, which I mentioned already at the beginning of my talk. 
So if you have only two body interactions, you under predict the total cross section. Now, if you add three body force, which is fixed with the parameters as explained before, you nicely agree with experimental data. And also the size, so the contribution of the three body force generally agrees very well with uh, the expectations based on the Weinberg power counting. Now we have also looked at large number of uh, complicated uh, polarization absorbables in elastic and T scattering. So these are again our predictions, except for this plot, which shows you here the experimental data by Sikiguchi and Sun at 70 MeV. This is the data which we have used in order to tune the second of our low energy constants. But other than that, everything else are predictions. And here you can see two bands, orange and green. Orange is next to leading quarter, green next to next to leading quarter. And the bands are our degree of belief intervals, one sigma, two sigma, truncation uncertainty. So you can see that at this level, so at least up to N2 area, we are describing the data. But of course, the accuracy of our calculation is fairly low. So that's only next, next to leading quarter. Don't expect too much. We have also looked at uh, light P shell nuclei. Here you can see our calculations. And basically, if you take a look at light nuclei, you can see that adding the three body force brings your predictions directly to experimental value. This is, by the way, pure predictions. The Hamiltonian is fixed already in the two and three nucleon system. No free parameters. Okay? Beautiful results for. Light nuclei, however, you also notice uh, somehow systematic overbinding trend if you go to heavier systems. And so for this reason, we wanted to study whether this overbinding is a feature that is related to the two-body interaction at the level of n 2 or maybe to the three-body force. So in order to answer this question in a paper which appeared on archive yesterday, I believe, we have performed a large number of calculations by taking into account corrections to the two-body interactions beyond n 2 Of course, our results are still as accurate as next to next to leading order because we don't take into account the three-body forces at higher orders, but nevertheless, we can see what happens with various nuclei. And here you can see the oxygen uh, isotope chain calculated uh, we, again, without any parameters. So the blue line is this already mentioned overbinding at the level of N2LO. However, you can see that once you take into account uh, corrections to the two body interaction at higher orders, you are in a beautiful agreement with experimental levels. I would like to emphasize that usually this kind of agreement is only achieved if the Hamiltonian is fixed or fitted to this kind of energy. So that's quite remarkable if you keep in mind that it's fixed in this tiny region of the nuclear chart. We have also looked at various low-lying excitation levels and basically everything is uh, in agreement with the experiment, but there is not so much sensitivity to details of the interaction. Now, of course, it would be boring if uh, we would be doing calculations at N2 area, everything works, well, boring. So this is an example of a problematic things. Uh, as you can see, so here you can see again the oxygen isotope chain, but now not the energies, which are beautifully reproduced, but rather the radii. And so you can see, well, there is like at least 10% discrepancy for the radii. And here you have to keep in mind that, of course, in calculating radii, we don't take into account corrections uh, uh, from meson exchange currents. So in order to see what the effects of meson exchange currents could be, we have initiated actually a program in Bochum by doing high accuracy calculations of very light nuclei, something that we can calculate even up to an 4 law. And here you can see, so the results for the deuteron have been published already. That's a structure radius quadruple moment. Take a look at the uncertainty. All these calculations are at the level of per mil accuracy. That's, that's our predictions, okay? 
So here you can see the calculations for the charge radii for helium-4 is in beautiful agreement with a recently measured mm, 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 uh, spectroscopic uh, data on mm, muonic uh, helium. And also, this is our prediction for the isoscalar charge radius of the Srinuk system, where, in fact, we are something like 10 times more accurate than current experimental data. But the important point is that we can now take a look at the size of the meson exchange contributions, and we do see that they tend to increase if you go to heavier systems. So whether, whether on, or not, you know, this meson exchange currents will be, indeed, the resolution of this deviation remains to be seen, but at least this looks uh, plausible, I would say. So this is my last transparency, and uh, so, so far I was only showing you results for the leading three-body force. Now you can ask why. If everything was calculated already, why just using the leading three-body force at the level of N2 LO? Why not to push it to N4 LO? The problem is, or the question is, whether or not uh, it's consistent to introduce a regulator, a naive regulator on the three-body force, and uh, whether, you know, the resulting calculation will be consistent. Now, you can actually answer this question, test it uh, uh, rigorously, and so you may, uh, remember that when solving the Fadev equations, we, are, we want actually to make certain kinds of resumations. However, uh, if we restrict ourselves to purely perturbative case, then we still must reproduce scattering amplitude. So let's just check what happened. So here you can see a Feynman diagram. Really, Feynman diagram gives you on shell amplitude, four dimensional integrals. On the right hand side is what you obtain using the Fadev equation. So here you can see iteration of the two body and three body force term and the genuine three body force contribution. Now, if you use dimensional regularization here and here, everything is fine. Same answer, same result, consistent. The problem is, if you do the calculation in the usual way, so you have introduced here cutoff regulator for two-body and three-body force, you uh, calculate this iterative diagram, and you will see that it is linear and divergent, as you would expect, based on naive dimensional analysis. Now, in this bracket, you can see the structure of the counter term that appears out of this iterative diagram. The first term is not a problem because it involves a point momentum Q3. It has exactly the same structure as the CD3 nucleon force. So the counter term is present. You can just absorb it into the CD counter term. But this term has a different structure. It doesn't involve the point momentum, and it violates chiral symmetry, meaning that you will not be able to regularize and renormalize the right-hand side of this uh, equation. Of course, the resolution of this puzzle is that you have used dimensional regularization to derive the three-body force and cutoff regularization to calculate this iteration. If you would have done everything properly using cutoff regularization to derive this, this guy, you will see it will generate linear divergence, which will cancel exactly this problematic term. So this just tells, tells you that unfortunately you cannot use this naive regularization and you really have to work harder and recalculate everything using a consistent and symmetry preserving cutoff regularization, which is a challenge. This brings me to the summary. So uh, I believe that the main uh, bottleneck right now in uh, precision nuclear theory are three-body forces. And so uh, I have shown you that including the leading three-body force is doing a good job. We are improving the description of the data, but the accuracy is low. And we believe, according to our experience in the two-body sector, that one would need to go to a 4 LO to have a really high-precision description of uh, three-body data, which will require dealing with two challenges, deriving consistent three-body interactions 
and also performing fits using presumably some kind of emulators. And uh, let me also mention that we would also need, of course, uh, uh, more precision data for polarization observables, and there is an ongoing experiment at RICAN by uh, Kimiko Tsikiguchi as a spokesperson. Here are my comments about generalization to the SU3 sector, as you asked. And uh, basically, you will see that I'm somewhat skeptical uh, about whether or not this can be developed so the SU3 business in chiral effective field theory can be developed into really a precision approach, but nevertheless, perhaps with help of uh, latest QCD simulations to provide more data, this may also become reality. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so uh, many questions. Uh, Okay, first, uh, Holst. Yeah. Evgeny, quite impressive what you have presented us here. And I'm uh, also impressed by your description of the oxygen isotopes. But you said you had to modify your two-body force. Could you elaborate a bit what you did with the two-body force and how that then uh, has, which consequence does it have for the two-body scattering? Yeah, so this is basically not a modification of the two-body interaction, but it's exactly the same calculation, but we only take into account corrections in chiral effective field theory to the two-body interaction at the level of 3 LO and then 4 LO. So these are exactly the same calculations, but this N4 LO results are based on the two-body forces that provide a high precision description of NN scattering data. That's the whole point. And you can see here the impact of relying on the precise description of the two-body data. So that means this is in fact an extension of the two-body calculations to NL4. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, next question please. Thank you. Can you have the last slide? Fine. Okay, I want to make some comments, you know, because I think Wolfram already pointed, you know, put the finger in the point, you know, what is a three-body force? What does one mean by three-body force? And I think what he meant, I mean, and he we can correct me if not, but, you know, when you have this diagram in the middle, okay, I mean, I, I'm talking, I directed the thesis of Alberto Martinez and I learned all these things. So, when you have the diagram, I mean, there in the middle, take there the line to the left, right? And you have there one particle, I mean, they are intermediate particle. So this amplitude there is of shell if the particle there is of shell, fine. Then, I mean, you can separate the amplitude into an off-shell part and an off-shell part, right? And the off-shell part just goes like if the momentum is Q, roughly like Q square minus M square, and that kills the propagator, right? And then you get a three-body force. So you see mm -hmm. from the off-shell part of these amplitudes, you are getting three-body forces already. I mean, it's, you are calculating it, I mean, and you don't notice, but you're already getting three body forces. Now, the point now comes, and that's I find very important, is in the thesis of Alberto Martinez, we found that we only, we didn't do for three nucleons. We did for two mesons and one nucleon, and for three mesons. But what we found there is that the, uh, using chiral Lagrangians, that the off-shell, uh, the contribution to three body from the off-shell parts there, what cancelled exactly, but exactly, from three body terms that the same chiral Lagrangians were providing us. So now, my belief is that many of the diagrams that you put there, eh, I mean, that you say, and you, you uh, classify them as three body forces, which they are, but I believe that many of these terms that you have there go to cancel off shell, eh, I mean, parts that you have from the iteration that you have, I mean, of the two body. So the, the, the question now is, what do we call three-body forces? Because mm -hmm. I would not call these terms that go to cancel the official parts of the iterated two-body, I would not call that three-body forces, because the, what comes from the two-body forces of shell, this is not physical. Anything mm -hmm. that comes of, of shell, you know better than me, is not physical. Anything that comes to cancel non-physical things, we should not consider physical. 
So that's the first question, you know, if you could identify, sorry, and, but it's a discussion, you know, if you could identify which pieces go into a cancellation of the A and physical parts, then you could call the other one three body forces, and that would be something. Now, and I finish with that, the, the thing is, is more than semantical, eh? because I mean, it's a first question of definition, but second, more than question of definition, is that whatever you get for three body forces, you cannot transport. You cannot give now, I mean, to Wolfram, or you cannot go to Gal, give to Gal, because they will have other models in which they generate other off-shell amplitudes for the two body. And then, I mean, you cannot transport that. Unless we give a very precise definition of three body forces, you cannot transport them. And so this is more than semantical. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe, maybe I have a chance to briefly comment on it. I uh, absolutely agree with this point, and also it was uh, Wolfram pointed out, which is always something I have in mind when hearing about presentations about femtoscopy. So from the point of view of quantum field theory, we don't know what three point force is. We actually know what is the S matrix. Three body force is our invention, series invention, two body force, three body force. That is a very useful object but it's scheme dependent, scheme and convention dependent. I keep repeating, especially the three body force, which is already a tiny correction to the two body Hamiltonian, small, is strongly scheme dependent, okay? Now, here what we are talking about is the on-shell three body amplitude, which is again a physical quantity. And so what I was showing is that in the scheme which we are using, it is wrong to just make naive cutoff regularization combination with dimensional regularization. You will reproduce wrong onshore physics. And I believe this will be the statement in any other approach. This was the whole point. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, because of the time, we have to stop the discussion here. Okay, thank you very much for a nice talk. <laughs>
And the amazing thing here in this plot of the binding energy derived, but also updated for normalization reasons uh, throughout the years. So this is uh, an update that John Milner did a couple of years ago, and it appears in our review from 2016. You can see that a single wood Saxon potential with parameters listed under the figure uh, explains all this binding energy. We called it a textbook example of shell model in operation because in nuclear physics, you cannot really see the deeper states. And here you can see down to the 1s lambda in lead 208. And the extrapolation that the wood Saxon potential gives you uh, in going to large A, which is here to the left, A to the minus two thirds is the uh, X coordinate, gives you this uh, 30 MeV, which we consider D lambda, the lambda nucleus potential depth minus 30 MeV. But that by itself does not tell you how much of it is due to two body or three body interaction. So uh, what do we know about that in models that are based on two body interaction? Two body interaction not necessarily confined to lambda n uh, system, but coupled uh, lambda n sigma n model. So we have the Nijmegen models and they actually give you uh, usually uh, overbinding and the figure that uh, Tamura-san showed us in his introduction uh, gives actually this minus 40 MeV for the two body. This will be roughly my also conclusion from this empirical work, but remember that I want to uh, limit my attention to data and not assume this model or another model for the two body interaction. So, uh, okay, they have uh, the right overbinding for the two body force. Uh, going to effective field theory, current effective field theory, uh, the leading order gives you substantial uh, cut of dependence. They also overbind. Uh, the NLO uh, models uh, are close to no overbinding, but again, I noticed in the various works, uh, uh, there are two or three works in the literature which I'll cite in my proceeding version, uh, they actually, there is a strong cut of dependence. Now, we want to see whether we really have overbinding by the two-body force, because uh, if we had underbinding, it would be disastrous for neutron star matter. It will make the equation of state uh, soft, and uh, you will never reach uh, the neutron mass uh, region of two solar masses. So, and then if it is repulsive, we ask how large uh, the contribution, the three body contribution, which is denoted D3 lambda uh, is. This is very important for the next speaker, so he will uh, continue from this point apparently. Now, uh, attempts uh, to discuss this problem and to show that D lambda three, the three body contribution to the well depth is repulsive and is large. Uh, this was done uh, by series of papers by Leonardoni et al. And I think that uh, these figures were shown several times in this conference. On the left side, you see how in their calculation in red, the two-body interaction overbinds, but it overbinds tremendously. No, no other realistic model gives it. And as a result, the three-body uh, well depth that they need is also very large. The reason for their work, which is highly unrealistic, is uh, in the, mentioned in the last uh, two uh, bullets here. It uses problematic lambda helium-5 binding energies, which are overbound by themselves in one version, or if they are not overbound, then the other lighter system are underbound. And also it uses 
lambda O17, but I know of no binding energy measures for lambda O17. So this is really a bad choice of initial data. More seriously, you find if you look at Leonardoni PhD thesis, which appears on the archive, and you go through the more than 100 pages uh, work, you'll find that actually their nuclear cores are very compact. They miss the nuclear radius by 20% or more in well-known nuclei like oxygen-16 or calcium-40. And if you scale that uh, size uh, dimension into the well depth uh, by third power for the two-body uh, volume integral for power of six for the three-body, you find that uh, our result, the Friedman-Gall result, would become something like 80 MeV uh, two-body well depth attractive and 55 uh, MeV repulsive three-body. So we can actually explain most of their large number just by scaling because their calculation was not sufficiently accurate uh, in reproducing the nuclear cores. Usually, you don't have to be that precise in the nuclear core calculation because the B lambda is a difference between two binding energies, but you cannot miss it by 20%. That's too much. Okay, so... Now, I have also critique of the skerm hart fork methodology. In, and that actually, I'm not attacking particularly the Schulze Hiyama paper that is listed here. In fact, it started with Milner Dover Gall, the same paper. In fact, uh, if you read it carefully, derived, in quote, derived something like 30 MeV uh, repulsion for the three-body interaction, 30 MeV uh, repulsion. And that's the first row uh, in the table. When one uses uh, optical potential, uh, row dependent, density dependent, uh, that consists only of two terms. One is linear in row, apparently due to two-body interaction, and the other is three-body term uh, given by row square. If you do that, the first line shows you that the two-body interaction gives you almost 60 MeV attraction, and the three-body compensates by 30 to get something a little bit less than the 30 MeV attraction. And if I look at this paper uh, from 2014 by Schulze and Hiyama, I see that their numbers are quite uh, similar. Uh, maybe they have some extra contribution from effective mass contribution, but that's already minor uh, compared to the other two main contributions. Uh, we did it uh, in the first paper using just three uh, hypernuclear data points, and they look, do comprehensive thing, uh, which means that if you choose correctly uh, the binding energy you want to use, uh, you don't need the other ones. I mean, it, may hide you fitting problem. Now the present thing, if I do the same kind of two terms optical potential, would give me something that we, uh, in our present work, we verified is very close to the previous result, to the milner dover gall result from 88. So this was our starting point. This is what we checked. What was missing in all these works, and I said it also in the, in, in the friedman gall talk about Xi hypernuclei a few days ago is this what I call WRW97 that accounts for Pauli correlations. Pauli correlations start in the optical potential with rho to the four thirds, but as you'll see soon, the numbers, the functional form implies that it's not confined just to the rho to the four third term, but its effects spill out also to rho to the five-thirds rho square. So part of what you get for the rho square, say the 20 MeV in this table or 30 MeV repulsion, might come from Pauli correlation, which are hidden in the fitted parameter. So you have to be very careful. Now, in favor of this uh, WRW potential uh, term, I would 
I would say that it was widely uh, used in K minus atoms and nuclear calculation, and I think that uh, Yarka Obertova will somehow mention or use it on Friday. Unfortunately, I won't be here on Friday. So, okay, so now uh, what is this uh, WRW uh, correlation? Um, you start with the first row is the V2 lambda row is just the simple uh, row, linear in row potential, but note that what I call B0 lab there is density dependent. And the density dependence is listed in the second row and it includes in the denominator Kf. So that's the Pauli uh, term in its simplest form uh, applied to a situation where B0 conceptually similar to the lambda n scattering length uh, is the same for singlet or triplet. It's not bad approximation in hypernuclear physics. Uh, and then there is a kinematical uh, correction there uh, which uh, relates B0, which is in the center of mass, there is scattering length to B0 lab. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the Pauli effects uh, spill out beyond the row to the fourth uh, term and uh, affect you. We use a lambda nn term, uh, which goes like rho square. We could also introduce there the Pauli correlation, but that's a small effect because we don't have higher order terms that would be affected by that. We check that. That's not important for our purpose. So let me then show you the first fits that we do. What we show here is calculation across the periodic table of the binding energy of 1s and 1 lambda, uh, 1s and 1p uh, binding energy in what we call models P and Q. Model P assumes only a two-body interaction. So the upper uh, diagram shows you starting from lambda n16, which is the third point uh, uh, in going from left to right in A. Uh, so you see, uh, if we do just one parameter for the two body, we fit, fitted to the binding energy of lambda N16, uh, the 1P, which is in red, uh, is missed. And the other lighter 1P states do not come bound. Uh, so it's, it's not a good representation. The next thing is that we put also the three body term, but still no Pauli for these two diagrams. And you see now that starting from the light elements, the 1s and the 1p are okay, uh, but you develop some uh, departure from the data in the blue curve for the 1s as you go to lead 208, which is the uh, highest uh, point we have. Okay, so now something in favor why we chose lambda N16. We wanted to have good data. Now this is, to my mind, the best data that we have in hypernuclear spectroscopy. It comes from JLab, it's uh, uh, electro production, and also the choice of lambda N16, which is a hole in oxygen 16, shows you just four single particle levels that you have here. You have here the lambda in the 1s and the lambda in the 1p. The spin orbit of the uh, core nucleus uh, and the 6 MeV related to it. So that gives you a combination of four levels and you can identify them uh, with the peaks. So this is a clear single particle structure. Another reason for choosing something close to closed shell is from my own experience. Many years ago when I tried with Dick Dalitz to see the effect of three body forces in the P shell, we had for uh, sigma star 1385 derived potential, we had five parameters that we had to include in shell model studies. And that was too much for fitting the data. And the importance of them declines, some of them uh, three of the five decline as you go to the end of the shell. So you want to minimize the spin dependence 
in this within shells. You want to go from closed shell to closed shell to closed shell as you develop what we conceptually call nuclear matter. So that's another reason. So now, uh, these uh, curves now, models X and Y, they go with what we call yes Pauli. We put the Pauli effect. And first, uh, we see that something uh, funny happens. We expected that uh, the fit will improve for the heavier elements, but uh, it doesn't. You see, it works well uh, uh, in the beginning for light elements, but then you develop departure. And here you realize that you have to do something that will separate the uh, what we call symmetric nuclear matter configurations, the part of the core that belongs to N equals Z from the neutron axis. And the reason is that all, in all these models for, say, sigma star 1385 that Wolfram Weise will talk about, but also in sigma, there is a term uh, in the three-body potential that goes like tau 1 dot tau 2 for the nucleons. And that means that apart from exchange contributions, the excess is decoupled from the symmetric part. In fact, you can do microscopically even better by considering different shells. And largely, it will be not very different. We tried that. So instead of rho square in the three-body potential, we use rho of the n equals z part square plus rho square of the excess. We don't have uh, overlap rho of one times rho of the other. So that's very important, and that gives you uh, the choice y. And the choice y, plot y, is the uh, lower plot, and that's uh, our final one. And, uh, and now I summarize the results in a table. So uh, whether you call it X or Y, but it, we take it from Y, the lowest one shows you something close to minus 40 attraction from two-body interactions and 14 MeV for the three-body interaction. And uh, I show you also that the old uh, milner dover gall thing is very similar to what we here used as Q without Pauli and so on and so forth. Then we change some binding energy. Lambda N16 has also a charge symmetric uh, hypernucleus. Lambda O16, its binding energy is not that well known, but we play within limits. So I won't bother you. We get this uh, error or uncertainty estimates there. And then uh, I remarked already that if we scale our results according to the density, to the, uh, to the discrepancy of 20% in the nuclear ready in the Lonardoni at our calculation, we get the, uh, the depth that are listed in the uh, lower, lowest part of this page. So I summarize uh, the density dependent uh, optical potential methodology applied uh, correctly does a good job across the periodic table. The Pauli corrected lambda n term plus lambda n n term uh, uh, are very well defined. Uh, a thing that I didn't say is that the lambda n term also uh, comes out uh, with a strength that is compatible with a two body lambda n scattering length, which is a kind of microscopic uh, test ground. And uh, we have to decouple uh, the n equals z component of uh, the nuclear density from the excess nuclear density. And these are the numbers. And now the implications to dense neutron star matter uh, for the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting result. Okay, so uh, please uh, ask questions. Yes, first. Uh, Avram. 
I think that what Evgeny said, that we are, have no clear concept of three-body interaction, I think that is a very right statement. What we see here is probably, and also in your numbers, are those various polarization effects of the nucleon exerted by the medium or from the nucleon or from the baryon to the medium. And uh, that involves certainly not only three body interactions, but that is a many body effect. And uh, so it's very hard to, dis to extract numbers like a three body correlation or an interaction from, from potential, say. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Any microscopic calculation that you think about uh, will introduce some extras. The question is, how sizable are those extras? I think from at least my experience, perhaps also yours, in hypernuclear calculation, I did more light, light nuclei in the P-shell, not so light, light, and you did in heavier systems. The polarization effects or so are not that large. I expect them to affect on the level of one MeV or less even. That's my estimate, so. But that will be on the level of binding energy, so that means that is in total a large effect. Okay, any other questions? So we know that with the sigma degree of freedom, then with the sigma degree of freedom, then we will need very strong three-body lambda and then first to describe the SL hypernuclei. In your calculation, you don't have the sigma degree of freedom. So that doesn't mean that your estimation that three-body force here is kind of unrealistically very large. Yeah, so as compared when let you let have the sigma. You talk about the coupling lambda into yeah. sigma. And right. Okay. Yeah. Go, go, go on. So I mean, <laughs> without the, sig the coupling sigma, so the three-body force, the lambda and then must be very strong in order to describe the SL hypernuclei. And now you don't have the sigma degree of freedom here. So does that mean that you are three-body force, the lambda and then it also should be much larger than it actually should be if you yeah. have the sigma degree of freedom? We, we thought about this problem. In fact, uh, I didn't mention it here, but uh, we, if you look, my, my, experience, my experience comes from shell model studies in the P-shell. And there, uh, there, we, in the determination of effective metric element, spin, spin, spin orbit, tensor force, that John Milner did, uh, over the years in the P-shell, he also shows you how the excited spectrum uh, of maybe 20 species in the P-shell is well understood. The gamma ray experiments that Professor Tamura initiated, all that is well understood in terms of considerably smaller number of parameters. One of them is the what we call lambda-sigma mixing, namely virtual excitation from lambda to sigma. And that is because we find that the importance of having sigma admixtures as you go to heavier hypernuclei and the lambda is in the uh, lower orbit, but the nucleons go to higher orbits, that decreases very, very quickly. So I believe that most of what we call, or, or sh looking at the data as lambda NN interactions is not from the, uh, from the coupling between lambda N and sigma and from the free body force that is initiated there. And I think that the next speaker has also this distinction as far as I can judge. So perhaps I should uh, leave this object, but I understand the question and I think that that's a relatively small effect. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, <coughs> we need more discussion, but uh, let us go to the next thank uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Gar. <clears throat> so the last speaker in this session is Professor Wolfram Weise. 
he's tell us about uh, hypernuclear three body forces and the strangest neutron stars. Thank you, Hiro, uh, and uh, thanks for having me here. <laughs> uh, Thank you for coming. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, a great pleasure to be able to communicate again in three space dimensions, isn't it? I mean, um, yeah, the, 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 the title uh, is uh, referring uh, more to the second part of my talk, Strangeness in, in, in Baryonic Matter. Um, but in order to go there, <clears throat> I think it's also useful and helpful uh, to give you, in the first part of the talk, sort of a brief summary of uh, where we stand in terms of uh, trying to understand the constraints on the equation of state of uh, dense matter as it comes from the uh, tremendous progress that our astrophysics uh, colleagues have provided in the last 10 years or so. Of course, Isaac has already given us a, a very good survey of that, so let me just uh, summarize in the first part what we do know from neutron stars. And there are these three columns uh, which have been cultivated very much so in the uh, last 10 years, namely the neutron star masses uh, determined by Shapiro delay measurements, um, uh, the uh, gravitational wave signals uh, which uh, begin to constrain the quadrupole deformability, the tidal deformability of neutron stars, and uh, through the NICER telescope at the International Space Station, uh, we have uh, uh, for the first time really uh, uh, quite interesting constraints on uh, neutron star radii. Uh, so this, was, this really changed the paradigm in our understanding of uh, uh, what neutron star matter might be uh, composed of. Uh, this is the uh, observation, the first observation of uh, uh, two solar mass neutron stars. And nowadays, uh, nobody can develop any equation of state without being uh, uh, able uh, to support uh, two solar mass neutron stars against gravitational uh, collapse. Uh, uh, here are some uh, more of those. Uh, nowadays we have uh, three very solidly uh, determined uh, two solar mass uh, uh, scales uh, all through the uh, very precise measurements of uh, Shapiro delay. <clears throat> now, that already had an enormous impact on, our, uh, on the way uh, we uh, dealt with uh, neutron star matter. I mean, uh, before, these, before the event, before the advent of these two solar mass uh, objects, uh, there was a freewheeling theoretical spirit. All sorts of uh, exotic matter uh, were discussed, and obviously just by the mere fact that we have to cross this red line nowadays, there has to be sufficient pressure in any equation of state uh, to cross this red line, or at least to reach this red line, uh, that already rules out uh, very simple forms of exotic matter, like uh, simple kaon condensates, simple forms of quark matter, of course, the advocates of exotics, uh, they now try to put in more and more repulsive correlations uh, even between quarks in some of versions of those models to stabilize uh, their equation of state. And that's, of course, in principle possible. Uh, but uh, uh, in practice, uh, we would like to uh, go further and uh, discuss the constraints which come from um, uh, neutron star observations itself on the stiffness of this equation of state. Uh, th this is another uh, uh, set of observables that helped very much to uh, sort of rectify our view of uh, uh, the equation of state of uh, dense matter. And these are these uh, 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 radius determinations from uh, uh, observing X-rays, uh, soft X-rays from uh, hot spots at the surface of uh, uh, rapidly rotating neutron stars uh, observed with the nicer uh, telescopes. Uh, that has been analyzed by 
two independent groups within the nicer collaboration. That's very nice because they compete with one another, but they are in the same group, they work with the same data and come perhaps to slightly different results, but still compatible uh, 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 within the uh, given uncertainties. And you see here a 1.4, a genuine 1.4 solar mass neutron star is supposed to have a radius around 13 kilometers. Uh, the two solar mass uh, neutron star, uh, our prototype two solar mass neutron star uh, is supposed to have a radius which is close to that. And this is absolutely fascinating, right? You change the mass by such a drastic amount and the size of the object is still the same. That already puts very strong constraints on the equation of state. And the, the other thing that one should mention here is that these radii are large. Uh, still 20 years ago, uh, there were discussions about neutron stars which uh, should be so small, say nine or 10 kilometers, that they can accommodate quark matter in the center, in the core of the stars. This is, moral, uh, this is a, a difficult story nowadays. We have to produce, uh, with any equation of state, uh, neutron stars which have masses uh, larger than 11 kilometers, uh, uh, somewhere between 11 and 13, 14 kilometers, right? This is the new constraint. And uh, the other uh, interesting constraint, not very accurate so far, comes from gravitational wave signals, uh, which uh, you begin to interpret in terms of the quadrupole deformability experienced by one star in the uh, gravitational, the strong gravitational field of the companion star. And uh, there are uh, certain dimensionless numbers which uh, characterize this uh, deformability, uh, uh, tidal deformability, and they have been analyzed to a level now where one can uh, discuss the individual deformabilities of the two uh, companion stars. And, uh, so as a consequence of this uh, uh, fantastic developments in, in astrophysics, observational astrophysics, uh, there have been in, uh, great amounts of uh, 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 analyses uh, uh, of the equation of state, which, uh, uh, which is uh, supposed to be consistent with all these data. And here are just two examples, two out of many examples. The uh, techniques used are uh, contemporary uh, Bayesian uh, inference uh, uh, techniques, and they, they mostly come to quite consistent conclusions with uh, one another. Uh, let's take this example here. Uh, so in order to, oops, sorry. In order to um, support these two solar mass uh, uh, neutron stars, which uh, have core densities typically between five and six uh, times nuclear matter density, equilibrium, de equilibrium density of nuclear matter, you need really uh, pressures uh, uh, of uh, quite a few hundred MeV per Fermi cubed, right? So these are very high pressures from the point of view of creating them with any uh, microscopic uh, dynamics. Now, um, we have uh, made our own uh, very much expanded uh, Bayesian uh, analysis uh, uh, of uh, all those data, and uh, we come to uh, this conclusion, which as far as the uh, equation of state pressure as a function of energy density is concerned is basically consistent within uncertainties uh, with all uh, the analyses uh, of our astrophysics colleagues, but I want to point out one uh, very important thing now for the upcoming discussion within this talk, and that is the speed of sound. The speed of sound squared is the derivative of pressure with respect to energy density, so it is a more detailed uh, piece of information characterizing the uh, stiffness and the phase structure uh, in the equation of state. And just from the uh, data alone, you get a picture like this. There is a, a continuously rising uh, uh, speed of sound which crosses a certain 
canonical axis, namely uh, uh, the speed of sound squared uh, being one third, that is uh, the value that corresponds to a relativistic uh, uncorrelated Fermi gas. Uh, it's called the uh, conformal limit because it is, uh, in general, uh, the kind of speed of sound that you have uh, for, uh, uh, that you end up with in any kind of conformal field theory, field theories in which the trace of the energy momentum tensor uh, is equal to zero. And if you cross that, and if you, uh, the speed of sound becomes much larger than this uh, 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 sort of uh, canonical value, then it means you have very strong correlations inside of the system, strongly repulsive correlations inside the system. Right? So let's keep that in mind. The uh, range of energy densities or densities which are characteristic of uh, 1.4 solar mass neutron stars or two solar mass neutron stars, they are in this range here, right? And so within uh, that range, you don't uh, uh, see much of an action other than the uh, continuously growing uh, speed of sound, uh, which means that you are already very much restricted in discussing possible phase transitions, for example, in this matter. If there would be a first order phase transition in this dense matter, the uh, uh, the uh, speed of sound would uh, spontaneously drop to zero, actually, for a first order phase transition. For a crossover, continuous crossover, it would be much less dramatic, but you would have sort of a maximum developing in the speed of sound. So the speed of sound as such is a very, very uh, important piece of information that uh, uh, needs to be discussed uh, uh, if you want to construct equations of, uh, 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 yeah, uh, equ equations of state from any kind of microscopic point of view. So this is just uh, 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 complementing or completing this kind of analysis. Uh, this is what comes out, out of such a, a st uh, high level statistical analysis in terms of the mass radius relation here and uh, for the uh, tidal deformability, uh, in this case of the, uh, the first observed gravitational wave uh, uh, signal. So um, we can summarize perhaps this section now that we would like to construct equations of state uh, by the minimal, by summarizing the minimal conditions to be satisfied in any theories of uh, dense baryonic matter. Uh, of course, we have to start in the vacuum. That uh, is the principal input condition, and that's uh, where we uh, should obey the rules of low energy QCD and spontaneous uh, chiral symmetry breaking. So pion dynamics uh, uh, should be well integrated. Uh, uh, realistic nucleon-nucleon interactions uh, and uh, reproducing phase shifts is, of course, a, an absolute must. Right? Uh, then at low density, uh, we are helped uh, quite a lot by um, the uh, progress made in chiral effective field theories uh, that is supposedly uh, a framework that can be trusted up to, say, one and a half or two times uh, uh, normal nuclear matter density. And that includes uh, the extrapolations to asymmetric nuclear matter uh, and uh, the discussion of the symmetry energy. So all these uh, phenomenologically very well established numbers from uh, uh, nuclear physics should, uh, should, be, uh, should be respected. Nuclear thermodynamics, of course, included in the fact that we have a first order liquid gas phase transition in symmetric nuclear matter at relatively well-defined, uh, with well, relatively well-defined parameters. And then comes the high-density domain, um, neutron star maximum masses of uh, two, solar, uh, two solar masses, uh, two solar mass, and even a little bit beyond should be uh, uh, covered, uh, and the neutron star radii should be large enough to fall into this nowadays established uh, empirical frame between somewhere between 11 and 14 
uh, kilometers and uh, the tidal deformabilities from gravitational wave signals are not so much imposing uh, uh, yet because of their relatively big uncertainties, but that will change. I mean, this is a, a big industry developing. And uh, so this is how uh, theoreticians uh, reacted to the situation. Um, there are equations of state uh, given in terms of nuclear degrees of freedom alone. Um, I will not go through the, the, those uh, very much, uh, but uh, most of them uh, satisfy the uh, needs to, um, to be uh, compatible with the principles of uh, spontaneously broken chiral symmetry at low densities, uh, sometimes with uh, non-perturbative extensions to higher densities in terms of functional renormalization group methods. Uh, then there are a class of uh, uh, equations of state which do have nucleons and hyperons uh, in order to keep hyperons in the game, and that is of course our theme here, our primary theme in this session, one has to have quite strongly repulsive effective interactions between the hyperons and the nucleons you know, and the, the nuclear environment. And then there are hybrid models where uh, one has uh, no phase transitions really, but uh, sort of a continuous uh, crossover uh, between hadronic phase and quark-luon phase. And uh, in such models, in order to reach the, uh, uh, the, the uh, large pressures required to stabilize two solar mass neutron stars, one does need, however, to put in basically by hand very strong repulsions also in the quark sector. Uh, which is more or less ad hoc. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> to summarize the situation where we stand, uh, the green line is a typical model which uh, 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 uses uh, chiral EFT um, combined with non-perturbative uh, functional renormalization group methods to be able to extrapolate to densities uh, higher than, larger than just uh, twice nuclear matter and then uh, this is anchored in good nuclear physics information in the first place and then extrapolated to neutron star uh, physics such that two solar mass uh, neutron stars can be supported. And then, of course, you reach uh, an unknown <coughs> territory uh, which uh, certainly goes to quark matter at some point, uh, perhaps at around 50 times nuclear matter you would enter uh, into uh, a phase uh, in which uh, QCD becomes perturbative. And this is then, again, a well-defined limit, but of course, unfortunately, totally unobservable. It just uh, is a cornerstone for uh, where any extrapolation should go asymptotically. Now, let me come back uh, here to this uh, uh, theme uh, that I wish to emphasize very much, namely uh, to look into uh, the, uh, uh, the properties of the uh, speed of sound uh, in dense matter, uh, which seems to grow more or less continually, uh, continuously into the neutron star uh, density range. Uh, what happens beyond that, of course, is very interesting. Is there a chiral crossover? Uh, chiral symmetry restoration in terms of a crossover, which uh, could be a scenario like this. Uh, uh, there are discussions going on. Uh, QCD, perturbative QCD resummations might keep the uh, uh, square of the speed of sound beyond the canonical one-third value, uh, but this is uh, certainly up to discussion. Uh, uh, what we are discussing right here is uh, the range up to about five to six times nuclear matter density. And uh, up to this range, we uh, basically, from all sorts of uh, analysis of the astrophysical data, we see uh, this generic uh, shape of the speed of sound. Now let's come to strangeness. And here I can be very short, in fact, because uh, much of... Uh, What's uh, on the slides from here on has already been reported in many ways in uh, different talks. The framework uh, that uh, we like at least is chiral SU3 
uh, effective field theory. And as far as uh, the uh, strangeness uh, minus one sector is concerned, it has been uh, uh, quite well uh, fixed and established up to the level of next to leading order in the uh, chiral counting. Unfortunately, these uh, reddish domains, uh, which are very well accessible nowadays uh, uh, already in the nucleon-nucleon interaction, are not yet accessible really systematically uh, in the strangeness uh, uh, sector, simply because uh, in practice we still have a, a far too uh, small database. Right? So uh, this is one of the points I would like to make in the conclusion. We have uh, certainly to increase, to, to sharpen and uh, improve the database uh, uh, in the two-body sector. Okay, but that is the framework. And then, well, this, these pictures have been shown before. Here we are at the level of next to leading order in the uh, chiral expansion in discussing the lambda nucleon interactions. This has been updated uh, a bit more recently to what's called NLO, next to leading order 19, uh, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, that's where we stand right now in terms of the two-body input for discussions of the uh, hyperon nucleon interaction. And uh, this picture has also been shown quite a few times here in this uh, conference. This is a great step forward, I would say, especially because you're uh, uh, touching a channel here, sigma p to lambda n, which is absolutely crucial to understand in terms of the uh, lambda proton going to sigma nucleon and back to lambda proton interaction because that mechanism comes in leading order here, whereas it comes only in second order in the lambda proton diagonal interaction, right? So this is a test case. And you see here that uh, the uh, NLO uh, 19 and NLO 13 uh, work pretty well in doing that. NLO 19 perhaps a little bit better than NLO 13. And so this is the starting point for the discussion at this moment of uh, all sorts of other type of processes. Uh, you, you have seen many times uh, this uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, mechanism, the uh, uh, analysis of lambda p correlation functions using uh, femtoscopy studies. And uh, uh, this is just to indicate NLO19 works, okay? Uh, it's uh, very comforting, comforting to know that uh, the data here are really so precise, especially um, at uh, low momenta. Uh, and that is, uh, means the, the long-range part of the uh, force is uh, pretty well under control. And so the next step is to go to hypernuclei. And uh, uh, there are a couple of, um, say, modern calculations uh, which all uh, more or less consistently lead to the statement that if we go to heavy hypernuclei like uh, lead 208, um, there is overbinding. There is too much binding if we just use uh, a realistic um, uh, lambda and two-body force like uh, NLO uh, 19. And uh, so that, of course, uh, starts the discussion of uh, how to go beyond, and that's where the three-body forces come in. Right? Within the chiral SU3 uh, effective field theory scheme, the three-body forces are treated consistently with the hierarchy of uh, two-body forces, and they come in uh, uh, first at uh, next to next to leading order. Um, uh, as such, uh, connecting the full baryon octet with uh, all the members of the pseudoscalar octet in SU3 there would be too many parameters, so one has to restrict oneself as long as one doesn't have more information. And uh, so one way to, to proceed is to use the, uh, um, the hypothesis of decuplet dominance in intermediate states of these three-body uh, 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 force pieces, 
Um, this, is, this is something that worked very well, we know, in the uh, three nucleon sector. Um, it's the Fujita Miyasawa uh, hypothesis. And uh, once one does that, and uh, at, least, at least as a starting point, the number of free parameters is basically, basically re reduced to two. Two parameters associated with this uh, uh, contact term. And then one can go ahead and simply calculate, still keeping these two parameters in mind. But at least we have sort of a systematic way of going beyond just two body forces. And here you see what happens in symmetric nuclear matter for the single particle potential of a lambda in n equal to z uh, nuclear matter. At two body level, I just mentioned, we have this uh, overbinding. In this case, it's not just such a drastic overbinding. This is a, a Bruckner uh, beta Goldstone uh, calculation, um, just by about 5 MeV or so. But in order to uh, rectify that, putting in three body forces within a certain range of uh, uh, parameters uh, would certainly help, first of all, to fix uh, hypernuclear phenomenology, at least to the old value of minus three, uh, uh, 30 MeV uh, in the center of the potential, which I think in a way still holds because it's still good phenomenology, but it needs to be improved and sharpened, of course, as we go in the future. Okay, so three body uh, lambda and N uh, interactions uh, help at this point, and this is where we don't fiddle around any longer. I mean, we now live with whatever extrapolation to higher density goes on from here, uh, not only in symmetric nuclear matter, but also in uh, neutron matter and neutron star matter. Of course, that leads us uh, to the uh, hyperon puzzle here is just one out of many examples of how this uh, puzzle has emerged uh, already decades ago, actually. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the point is, uh, as we know, that uh, just using two body forces uh, would uh, uh, make the equation of state, uh, the pressure too low uh, for supporting um, uh, two solar mass uh, neutron stars. You just couldn't reach the red critical line anymore in the mass radius diagram. Uh, here is another very interesting uh, approach, uh, alternative a little bit to uh, what others are doing. This is uh, the quark meson coupling model of uh, the Adelaide group. And I think we will hear a talk uh, uh, tomorrow, I think, about this. Um, this is a model which can accommodate hyperons in dense matter and still keep the equation of uh, state stiff enough in order to do the job. And the reason is that uh, in this model, uh, the baryons are coupled to a strong density dependent uh, sigma field in such a way that uh, uh, at this order in the uh, expansion, uh, a scalar polarizability comes in uh, uh, where this term, in essence, effectively uh, uh, just uh, simulates many body forces. And these many body forces are repulsive and they drive uh, the equation of state into pressures uh, which then allow to um, maintain uh, the presence of uh, hyperons, lambdas in particular, uh, in the core of neutron stars. However, uh, they were kind enough also to plot the uh, square of the sound velocity here. And you see, when you, uh, this is quite typical, when you uh, let new degrees of freedom enter your uh, uh, dense system, the uh, uh, sound velocity uh, changes uh, rapidly. It drops. Whenever a new degree of freedom comes in, uh, it tends to drop because you can distribute the pressure on more degrees of freedom. And that means that the derivative of pressure with respect to energy density drops. Okay? But then we should remember that uh, uh, perhaps we, we cannot say it very sharply now, but uh, uh, at least I was uh, trying to indicate that the tendency from the observational point of view 
without any microscopic discussion from the observational point of view for this uh, uh, squared um, uh, energy density was to rise more or less continuously and cross the uh, canonical one-third axis here uh, at some point somewhere between three and four times nuclear matter density. Whereas adding hyperons, even if they support two solar mass neutron stars, would suggest that the, uh, uh, the sound velocity drops, right? So here we have a very interesting question. Can we focus even more by future astrophysical data on the way this uh, uh, speed of sound behaves at high densities, because that's a distinctive feature in the whole discussion. So we can go along. Uh, this is our uh, analysis again um, for uh, three body forces entering in symmetric nuclear matter on one hand and neutron matter on the other hand. And uh, uh, so then we can uh, also construct neutron star matter with a few uh, percent of protons added to the neutrons and see uh, what happens there in beta equilibrium. And then we can study the uh, chemical potentials for the neutron on one hand and the uh, hyperon on the other hand. And you see, if we had used only two body forces, uh, admitting that hypernuclei would be a little bit overbound in this way, then the uh, chemical potential for the lambda would cross the neutron chemical potential typically between two and three times nuclear matter. Just the standard result that many people came up with, uh, calling it uh, the hyperon puzzle. But then you add these three body forces, which are anchored uh, uh, just by uh, reproducing uh, hypernuclear phenomenology, and otherwise uh, they scale with density just uh, as uh, chiral SU3 effective field theory would like them to scale, then you see that uh, you have a chance uh, that uh, the lambda chemical potential does not meet the neutron chemical potential anymore, in which case the lambdas would simply not uh, appear and you would be happily living just with uh, the classical picture of a neutron star being mostly neutrons, right? Okay, um, I would like to mention at this point, because it fits exactly to this, uh, uh, to this uh, topic, uh, once again the results of the previous speaker. Uh, uh, Abraham and Ailey found a slightly stronger rho squared term than we would have found, but nonetheless, I mean, the qualitative tendency uh, somehow goes there if uh, even you look at hypernuclear phenomenology in greater detail. And so this brings me to uh, the conclusions and outlook. Um, I think I just uh, gave you a position where we stand right now. There are many, many open questions, of course, and uh, I, th uh, I think it's, one statement is clear. The understanding of uh, uh, strangeness in dense matter, and in particular in neutron stars, uh, requires a, a, an understanding of the detailed balance between hypernucleon, hyperon nuclear, two and three body, and even many body forces, right? Uh, how can one get this uh, quantitative understanding? Um, if you go to the vacuum, I think the three-body correlations uh, can tell us something, but not all. I think it is more important uh, for the discussion of uh, what happens in dense matter to see very precisely what the density dependence uh, uh, is. And uh, 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 terms of low order in density dependence are primarily driven by two-body forces terms of higher order in density dependence begin to feel the many-body problem. Right? And th this is the, 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 the balancing that we would like to know. For that, we need to be uh, even more accurate in our knowledge of two-body forces than we are right now. Uh, uh, Johann Heidenbauer has uh, made pioneering steps forward, I understand, uh, going to higher orders uh, in uh, Chiral SU3 effective field theory 
but for that uh, to become, uh, say, a solid statement, one needs, it needs to be backed up by a much, much more extensive uh, database uh, in two-body scattering on one hand, uh, accompanied by uh, the, uh, the, the kind of femtoscopy uh, analysis. This all has to come together in a way. There is not one single experiment uh, with so many degrees of freedom uh, which uh, can sharpen our minds sufficiently well, right? It needs the whole orchestra, in a way, to do that. And uh, on the many-body uh, level, I think uh, uh, it is uh, absolutely important to scrutinize the density dependence of the uh, energy, uh, you can call it energy functional, uh, in, in hypernuclear systems. And, uh, that's uh, where we really hope very much to go forward to high resolution. High resolution is the key for this. And that's why I'm really, uh, I really like this picture taken here from the, uh, the new beamline, HIHR beamline proposal at uh, JPARC, where they kind of promise uh, a resolution uh, in the few hundred, 300 kV range or so. I think that would help a lot uh, quantifying the constraints that we need so desperately in order to proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for encouraging us. So, uh, okay, so, uh, Isaac. So, thank you, nice, nice talk. I would like to, to know your opinion there was an additional event that you didn't mention, this gravitational wave, which was the GB190814. And this is a particular special signal because it's coming from the merger of a black hole of 23 solar masses and a compact object of 2.6, which is not clear what it is. I, sorry, I, I, I could not really understand. No, there was, there was in, in, a, in a August 2019, a new gravitational wave signal that uh, is not in your list. That, that, and this signal comes from the barrier of a black hole. No, no, it's not in the, you, you didn't mention this guy. It's a black hole of 23 solar masses that merger with a compact object of 2.5, 2.6 solar masses. Oh, you mean there is an observation? A candidate. Yeah, yeah, it's a candidate. That that's the, and the problem but is. But that is, is, that is very critically discussed, I think. Yeah, 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 because, it's not, because this guy is, is sitting in this mass, mass gap yeah. region. Yeah. So it's too low to be a black hole. But if it is a yeah. neutral yeah. star, it's extremely yeah. heavy. Yeah. And then, what, uh, what we can say from our uh, statistical analysis, the Bayesian. Uh, inference analysis. One can play games uh, by assuming, for example, that a 2.3, 2.4, 2.5 solar mass uh, neutron star exists. And that indeed would sharpen the statements about this uh, uh, speed of sound tremendously. If you would have only one example of that kind, mm -hmm. you could begin to sort of bend the uh, speed of sound curve over and uh, perhaps begin to discuss transitions. But uh, for the uh, 2.1 solar mass uh, situation, that is not yet uh, uh, high probability, let's say it like that, yeah. So this, this would be, of course, exciting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Jigina starts. Well, I am, I am very happy that you mentioned the quark meson coupling model. I just would like to make an update that, that actually what you showed was just the preliminary result. We have now not only zero range uh, speed of sound, but, uh, sorry, zero temperatures, uh, um, sorry zero temperature speed of sound, but also we have got finite temperature systems and we studied uh, speed of sound and we also have got 
adiabatic index, which is extremely important because it shows all the transitions between uh, nucleonic and hyperonic matter very, very clearly. I will talk about it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so uh -huh. it's basically advertisement. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. What I want to point out uh, is that uh, whoever uh, uh, constructs an equation of state with or without uh, uh, hyperons uh, should, should really check against uh, 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 such kind of figure. It's uh, quite important to extract the speed of sound uh, from that equation of state and uh, uh, compare it to the constraints. I mean, these are not very strong constraints so far, uh, but they, they give a tendency which is uh, going to be improved, I think, as astrophysical observations uh, proceed into the near future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, uh, it's time to close this session. And thank you for your participation. And also, thank you very much for all the speakers. Okay. Before you leave, I would like to ask the authors of the posters to put their posters off because in the afternoon we will have separate, two separate sessions here, so we need a place which is there. So posters will, be, will disappear in any case. Then I invite uh, members of the International Advisory Committee for the meeting which will start in 15 minutes, one floor up in the meeting room called uh, Earth, which is just next to the dining room. And conference photo will be made tomorrow after first session. So if you would like to be on the photo, please come to the morning session tomorrow. That's all. Thank you.
Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the first afternoon session, which is plenary session. And I welcome our first speaker, Dimitar from TM Munich. And he will talk about hyperonucleon and hyperonucleon nucleon interaction studies for hair femtoscopy. So 20 minutes plus five. Okay, thank you. Hello to everyone, and thanks the organizers a lot for the kind invitation. It's also a big pleasure now to finally meet people in person and be able to discuss uh, interesting physics. What I will try to convince you today is that uh, what uh, uh, we can do with uh, femtoscopy is actually rather a lot. It's one tool that we have at our disposal, but it's just as multifunctional as a Swiss. Ah, okay. But it's just as functional as a Swiss army knife. Uh, and uh, where we will start is to uh, study the strangeness sector, so we will study the uh, proton-lambda uh, interaction, and also we will extend that to the three-body force. Uh, after that, we will put that into the context of studying neutron stars, and eventually we will move to some more charming uh, stuff uh, with respect to the dimeson interaction with other light uh, hadrons. So let's get into the topic. Uh, what is femtoscopy? Well, the principle there is rather simple. So we go to our favorite collider experiment. It would be the LHC. We smash particles together, and of course, we produce a lot of new uh, species, which uh, can be emitted together, and we'll be interested to understand the correlations between them to finally study the final state interaction. So the way we achieve that is by uh, essentially measuring two distributions, both as a function of the relative momentum between particles per that we can build. And first is the so-called same event sample, where we build our pairs from particles stemming from the same event or the same collision, so obviously they will be uh, correlated in some way. On the other hand, we can also construct a reference correlation-free sample, it's called the, the mixed event, uh, where we managed to, to build it by essentially simply taking two particles from two different collisions, and by definition, they will not be uh, correlated. And for femtoscopy, keep in mind the interesting collision would be just uh, below 400 MeV in K star, where we will concentrate our studies. So next, we define our correlation function, which is simply the ratio between the same and the mixed event, which ideally, if we don't have any correlations acting, um, <clears throat> will be equal to unity, as you can see here. But the moment we have some sort of an attraction ongoing, for example, to do the final state, which we are interested in, we will see that the particles kind of cluster together at low relative momenta, which leads to an enhancement of the correlation function. And the opposite holds in case we have a repulsion acting. And to put it in a bit more exact uh, framework, this would be the kunin pratt relation, well, uh, it is uh, postulated that also this correlation function can be expressed as the spatial uh, integral over uh, a source function, which just gives us the probability to emit two particles per, uh, a particle pair at, uh, uh, with a certain relative distance between the particles R star, multiplied by the wave function, which naturally carries all the relevant information about the interaction. And as uh, you have uh, already seen previously today, uh, we can even expand this to study the uh, couple channel dynamics. Now, I just want to very briefly uh, uh, mention the emission source that is rather important for us. Uh, first, we have the choice to use uh, different collision systems, and uh, the main difference is, of course, where the source distribution peaks, so which uh, range of the interaction we test. In the case of proton-proton uh, collisions, this would be the blue line, you see that the uh, highest probability to emit uh, particle pairs, it's at around uh, two for me, and then increases to uh, <coughs> higher values in proton-lead and lead-lead collisions. And if we compare now this to a typical nucleon-nucleon potential, uh, we know that the typical range of the strong interaction is around two for me, so if we want to get a, a really clean and uh, enhanced signal, we have to use small collision system such as PP, which we uh, most often do, although there are some also very interesting prospects in making a, a scan over the range of the interaction uh, by studying different collision systems. This is going to be, uh, was discussed already by you, and will be again discussed by uh, Ramona tomorrow. And the last point that I want to mention is that regarding the, the emission um, uh, source, we had a dedicated study on that, and uh, we have shown that, uh, luckily for us, we do have uh, common emission for all baryons uh, in PP collisions, again, which allows us to fix this emission source by measuring a co correlation we know, where well, we know the interaction. This would be the proton-proton correlation function. So we managed to fix our emission source 
And from there, we can use it to study any other particle pair of interest, such as proton lambda. And now, let's move exactly to that, and again, put it into the context of the study of neutron stars. We already heard a lot about it, but in short, this is, uh, these are very compact, extremely dense uh, objects, so essentially, like the uh, Manhattan-sized object, object uh, with the ma mass more than that of our sun. And this leads to extremely high densities, which surpass even that of the atomic nucleus. So it begs the question, in these extreme conditions, what is actually uh, inside? And there was already a lot of discussion about that. I, I will briefly put it into the context of what we do. So, of course, we know that uh, there are uh, uh, neutrons. We also know that these neutrons are fermions. They occupy some discrete quantum levels. And we also know that if we increase the density, this leads to an increase of the Fermi energy and uh, also to increase of the chemical potential, which is defined as the sum of this Fermi energy uh, and the effective mass of the particles in medium. That also implies that at some point when we have enough particles inside, it might become possible to form more heavy particles such as hyperons to start occupying new quantum levels. But all of that kind of uh, is complicated by the fact that the chemical potential depends on the interaction among particles, so between lambdas and the surrounding nucleons and so on. Uh, and we know from scattering experiments that uh, the uh, nucleon lambda interaction is uh, attractive. So we, we would imagine, considering only uh, the, these two body forces, that uh, hyperons would be um, produced in neutron stars. But as we have uh, seen in previous talks, it leads to a lot of complications uh, related to the modeling of neutron stars and the equation of state. Essentially, we cannot reproduce massive neutron stars uh, as the equation of state would become uh, rather soft. And one of the proposed uh, solutions, among other others, is, of course, that we might have a repulsion due to the many body uh, three forces, uh, which will eventually prohibit the formation of hyperons. Uh, and, and that seems to be also in agreement with hypernuclear experiments. It has been actually the main uh, motivation to uh, perform these studies. Now, moving a bit to the theoretical side, we uh, already also had a lot of discussion there, both by uh, Wolfram and uh, Jochen. Uh, and uh, to put it into the context of the Carroll effective field theory, we now have up to next to leading order uh, calculations. And uh, it has been uh, stressed that at the moment we have uh, a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of parameters to fit, which cannot be uniquely defined uh, with the current existing experimental data. So uh, we need more data to be able to achieve that. And uh, in particular, uh, here I uh, show the example of uh, two different parameterizations of the NLO computation, NLO 13 and NLO 19. So the first one has a, a slightly stronger two-body attraction in vacuum, whilst the, the other leads to a bigger three-body repulsion at, at large uh, densities. Uh, but either way, what has been very promising solution to the uh, hyperon puzzle is this plot. What you can see on the y-axis is, again, the chemical potential plotted here as a, a function of the density. The orange line is our baseline, so it is the chemical potential of the nucleons, and the idea is as long as the uh, uh, chemical potential of the lambda remains above that line, we will not produce these particles, while if it drops below, uh, we will. And if we only consider two-body interactions, this is the dashed line, we indeed cross that line while considering the three-body interaction on top, it has been demonstrated, we are able to stay above that line, essentially prohibiting the formation of, of lambdas and explaining these massive neutron stars. Now, again, I cannot stress this enough. The main trick is that we need more data, though, to really make quantitative uh, descriptions. And we have already seen there is a lot of uh, effort to improve that also with scattering data. Uh, it has been uh, touched by both uh, um, uh, Koji and Nick. Uh, but these scattering uh, experiments still will go kind of into the uh, larger relative momentum sector. While with uh, femtoscopy, we can challenge the low momentum region, and that is the main benefit, as you can see uh, here. So on the left, you can see our measured proton-lambda correlation function, and I would like to uh, point out a few things. Uh, here on the right, by the way, we have correspondingly the cross-sectional measurements overlaid with the predictions from chiral theory. So our correlation now, as you can see, it, it shows uh, beautifully the two-body uh, attraction. Uh, so the, it goes up, and it stretches all the way down to K star equals zero. So we can really probe this super low momentum region. Uh, in this um, zoom in on the y-axis here on the bottom, what you can also see is that we observe very nicely 
the kinematic cusp that corresponds to the coupling to the N-sigma system, which the Carroll theory predicts but was previously uh, unobserved. So for sure, we make a lot of improvement uh, already. But it would be more interesting to compare now these data to the Cairo theory, and uh, this is what, uh, what we did. I would like to, to point out that actually the paper was accepted just yesterday, so very timely. Uh, and um, uh, this is the, the final word. Uh, so when we put the NLO 19 as, as well as NLO 13 uh, um, <coughs> parameterizations, we see that at large relative momentum we can describe the data uh, rather well. Both actually fit uh, nicely. But if we now concentrate on the low momentum region, so below 100 MeV, we see something interesting. Uh, in both cases, there is uh, some sort of a systematic deviation. So still, let's say, on, on the edge of being compatible with the data. Uh, but definitely in the case of NLO uh, 13, it is already incompatible. It deviates by more than uh, four sigma. And this is the first time we have man managed to experimentally observe uh, su such differences between the two parameterizations. And moreover, we see that even the, the better fit is still far from perfect, uh, meaning that we can impose further constraints on, on the chiral model uh, for the future, which is, of course, uh, fantastic news. But we didn't stop there. We uh, also, as it was uh, shown uh, today by Laura, uh, can perform three-body um, uh, <coughs> femtoscopy. And in a nutshell, the way it is done is that we measure the three-body correlation function and we subtract from there the two-body contributions to obtain what is called the cumulant, which has the property that is zero in the absence of correlations, and then rises above uh, zero if we have attraction and uh, is negative if we have uh, repulsion. And this is now the result that we obtained for the proton, 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 and proton, proton, antiproton uh, cumulants. What is already fantastic to observe is that more or less we get what we expect from our intuition or from theoretical predictions. So in the case of proton, proton, antiproton, uh, the cumulant is essentially compatible with zero. While in the case of the proton, proton, proton case, we see uh, rather significant, it's above six sigma uh, deviation, uh, pointing uh, to some sort of an additional repulsion here. Uh, and, of course, now going to the more interesting case of proton, proton, lambda, uh, if we are completely honest, at the moment we don't see any significant deviation from zero, but what is absolutely fantastic is that we can measure it with a fair precision, which now in the uh, LHC run three, which is already ongoing, we will increase the statistics here by a factor of 100 at least. So you can imagine very soon we'll be able to make much more quantitative statements in that system as well. With that, I would like now to move to the charm sector. There was also a poster about it, about Daniel, so feel free also to discuss this topic with, uh, with him. Um, I will start with a little bit of uh, motivation uh, why we wanted to to do this study. Well, first, our uh, heavy ion colleagues uh, are always uh, telling us that uh, the, the uh, char mesons are really one of the ideal probes to uh, test the QGP. The reason being that they form very early on in the collision, then they, they experience the full evolution of the system. But the problem uh, that, that exists is that after hydronization happens, there still might be, of course, final state interaction acting upon the particles, and in particular, with the many, many surrounding light hadrons. And that needs to be taken into account in any uh, analysis. However, for, for example, for the dimeson pan interaction, there are no experimental measurements. There is literally nothing available, and we have to rely entirely on theoretical predictions, which would be fantastic to test. And the way to do that, we believe, is phantoscopy. Uh, because, as we said, we can literally measure any particle pairs that, that we would like, as long as we have the statistics. And further on, I want to mention one point. We can employ here the Lednitschke model to relate the measure correlation function to the scattering parameters of the system, which is what we have done for the d meson uh, pion uh, interaction. This is now our result. Uh, with skipping a bit on the technicalities, we have performed actually a simultaneous analysis of both the pi plus d plus as well as pi plus d minus system, which gives us access to the different isospin states. Uh, and b both, uh, so the scattering lengths of both of these uh, isospin states are plotted here on the y and uh, x axis. And we drew here our confidence level where we, we find the best fit of, of these two systems. And uh, these points here represent the curl 
theoretical predictions that are on the market. And what is already very interesting to see is that while we have a good agreement uh, with respect to the isospin three half, that's definitely not the case in the isospin one half. So we have uh, some sort of a significant tension. Uh, that by itself is a very interesting and an open question that we are yet now to uh, try and uh, study further and discuss, of course, with uh, <coughs> colleagues from uh, theory. But what is already very nice is that we give the opportunity to use now a data-driven constraints for the, the meson pan interaction. And uh, we did the same game with the d meson proton correlation function. Uh, this is our corresponding uh, measurement. So one must uh, uh, admit that again here, now we lack a little bit the precision that we, we would like to have. Nevertheless, we see in the first bin some increase uh, compared to, to unity. Uh, and while we are still compatible with the Coulomb interaction only, we definitely show a preference towards models that, that have an attractive nature. And as a matter of fact, this green line, so the Yamaguchi prediction, even has a bound state in it. Uh, and here again, the claim is uh, that given the upcoming LHC run three, we will manage to increase the statistics significantly and clarify the situation uh, with much higher precision. And now there is one last point that, that I would like to discuss. It goes a little bit to the long run, so really 10, 15 years from now, but definitely we can say that the future there looks very charming indeed. There is now a hot uh, discussion ongoing about the existence of um, charm molecules. We have, for example, this in particular measurement by LHCB, uh, where it was shown that in the invariant mass of uh, D0, D0 pi plus, we have a, a very significant peak appearing just below the D star D threshold. Uh, and this is being treated as an ideal candidate to be some sort of a molecular state, maybe even a tetraquark. Of course, no, nothing at the moment is known about the structure of this state, and it has to be investigated. And what has been also discussed by um, uh, Yuki Kamiya uh, in his talk, uh, it is uh, fantastic for such systems to perform a scan, essentially, over uh, different collision systems. So measure the correlation function across proton-proton, proton-lead, lead-lead collisions, because this would probe different ranges of the interaction, and then we can learn something about the structure of this state. And uh, at the least, uh, there was a simulation performed with the projection what would the precision look like after the at least three upgrade. This would be for the run five. And we see that by then we would have fantastic precision to test exactly such type uh, of systems. So you can imagine we can very the, then with high precision pin down exactly how the, the interaction looks like, compare it to theory, and understand much, much, much about this particular system and possibly about many other systems that, of course, we didn't have time to discuss today. So with that, uh, I'm already at my uh, uh, conclusion. I hope that I indeed managed to convince you that with particle correlations, aka femtoscopy, uh, we can perform many, many different interesting studies because essentially we measure any particle pair we like as long as we have the statistics and we can say something about the interaction. And this has been uh, extended both to the couple channel sector as well as the three body sector, as it has been discussed in other talks. In my talk, I have especially put stress on the proton lambda and proton proton lambda interaction, uh, where we uh, definitely see that we can impose now further constraints on the Carroll effective field theory, which is fantastic, as this would lead to a further improvement of our knowledge what the equation of state looks like, and uh, of course the hyperon puzzle regarding the existence of these massive neutron stars. And we have a lot of um, uh, further applications. Most of them will be discussed now uh, here or have already been discussed during the HYPE uh, conference. For example, uh, the uh, Keonic sector is uh, very interesting. We will also have presentations regarding uh, proton-neutron correlation already in this session. Um, and uh, we managed to study with high precision also the multi-strange systems the charm systems, as I showed you, and we have fantastic prospects beyond uh, LHC run three. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Dimitar. Plenary is open for discussion. No question? We have a lot of time for questions now. <laughs>
There's one over there. Thank you for your uh, nice talk. And uh, I want to know about the detail of the fentoscopy itself. So, so as Kamiya-san explained, uh, in case of the k and correlation function, the channel coupling effect so with omega uh, coefficient is important. But uh, in case of the p-lambda, so you can explain the how the correlation function shape, including the sigma and cusp shape region, without any maybe the channel coupling effect. So. So, and, uh, but, uh, but uh, in case of the uh, lambda and sigma in case, the channel coupling effect is also large. So, is it necessary to consider about the, uh, some omega term uh, in case of the p lambda or and the other case? Just a uh, uh, so parameter. I, 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 I didn't fully catch all of the questions. So, it, it is uh, about uh, the coupling between p lambda and uh, p sigma? Uh, and sigma it means and just a p lambda correlation function. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's uh, go back to, to that. Uh, so, here, right. So, in this case, just you can explain the uh, correlation function, the mm -hmm. data with the, how say, uh, with, uh, with some yeah, calculation based on the uh, calorie uh, uh, FT model or something. But uh, in case of the k bar n case, so omega, omega k n, or it means channel coupling effect, is also the parameter I'm thinking. So, uh, no necessary to consider about some kind of, it means the n lambda and n sigma is coupled, so then. Maybe. If you need, um, if you want to take into account ch a couple channel studies for this. Ah, yeah, well, I mean, uh, the, the Couple channel is, is already included in the chiral computation. So it has the full treatment of the proton lambda and n sigma coupled system. That is why we have also this cusp predicted by theory. And as a matter of fact, the amplitude of this cusp has been very interesting to test if, if it can reproduce what, what we see. And this has been shown to be the case without the uh, need to further fine tune anything. So the, the chiral theory seem to already do a, a very good job in that particular region. Uh, we have further seen that, uh, this deviation here in the low momentum region, and it must be said that even there, uh, the uh, coupling to n sigma plays, albeit an indirect role for that, uh, but, but certainly because the theory itself contains everything, no matter in which actually region you see the deviation, it, it always kind of is a convoluted effect of everything. Uh, and it is in the calculation uh, fully. So with that, we are really able to, to test also the, the couple channel dynamics. And I, I must say that it is also very interesting to measure the, the proton sigma zero uh, interaction directly because this is just another, let's say, observable that we can test. And I think I have a plot about it uh, over here. This has been done. But again, unfortunately, at the moment there, we don't have high enough precision to, to uh, have let's say, even, even more constrained. Uh, again, it would be improved in the future, for sure. Okay, thank you. Any further question? This one. Thank you for the talk, it has been nice. But just, just a comment, yeah. Uh, the TCC, I think it has been proved many times, and there are many, many works about this, that is a paradigmatic case of a molecule. The D star D molecule and most probably isospin zero, such as it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Again, I mean, this, this is a distant project, but the, the, the message to take home is that we will have definitely the precision to, to these extremely exotic, <laughs> uh, yeah, exotic states to, to study them in the, let's say, a little bit more distant future. Okay. Then let's thank Dimitra again. <laughs> and we move to the next talk, which is given by Hannah Zbrovczyk. And she will talk about uh, strange hadron correlations and heavy ion collisions at rig energies and below. Okay, this, this so. 20 minutes yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so. First of all, let me thank organizers for this kind of invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, strange hadron correlations uh, measured in the heavy ion collisions at rig energies and uh, below. So uh, my talk will cover a few important topics uh, uh, related to correlations that are important from the point of view of rig program. So uh, 
I will start with a description of strong interaction between uh, baryons, or rather I should say anti-baryons. Then a few words about motivation to study hyperon nucleon and, nucle and hyperon hyperon correlations. Uh, then I will show you what star measured in context of strange baryon uh, correlations and their interactions. I will discuss possible bound states. Uh, then a few words about uh, coalescence production in case of deutrons. And finally, uh, non-identical particle correlations and what can we learn from this topic. So uh, let me start. So here you may see a very well-known uh, QCD phase diagram plotted as a function of temperature and baryon chemical potential. And here you see this area uh, that, des that describes early universe that is uh, reproduced by LHC experiments like ALICE. And if we go down with collision energy, then we enter this region, which is uh, uh, which is uh, covers, uh, covered by a uh, RIG experiment, a star. So starting from crossover, first order phase transition between hadron gas and quark gluon plasma, uh, including still hypothetical critical point between crossover and first order transition. And if we go down with collision energy, then we enter this exciting region of neutron stars. Okay, so if uh, we ask the question what kind of energy region RIG covers, I have to admit that STAR covers very wide range of collision energy. So uh, we touch this region uh, very close to, um, to, to, to early universe, and then we go down almost reaching, uh, reaching the region of neutron stars. So you may see that STAR have, has very wide scientific program covering really very wide and important uh, part of QCD. Uh, phase diagram. So now uh, I hope all we know very well and all we uh, believe that uh, uh, we understand that femtoscopy is really important um, technique to uh, discover recently uh, interactions between particles. And uh, just in case if you need uh, more confirmation whether this topic is important, I would like to I uh, mentioned here two uh, recent nature papers, the first one by Starr about interaction between antiprotons and then a recent uh, Alice paper about strong interaction uh, between, uh, between hadrons. Okay, so maybe a few words about heavy ion collision and the femtoscopy technique. So here you may see uh, a scheme of heavy ion collision. So we have the pre-collision, the collision itself, then system, uh, uh, then system expands, uh, hadronized, and finally we have freeze out. And of course, we have many experimental techniques to study to study properties of the system created as a result of heavy ion collision, and femtoscopy is one of them. So it is important to know that uh, traditional femtoscopy was proposed to determine properties of source sizes. Uh, of source created as a result of heavy ion collision. So traditional femtoscopy tells us how big is the source, uh, what's the, uh, what are directions in, the, the, uh, what are sizes in different directions. We can also determine properties, for example, related to um, time, em the emission, uh, time emission of particles and the time of life of, uh, and the lifetime system. So. Uh, as a result of heavy ion collision, the system that is created is really tiny. So the system is of, of the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters, so this is fem femtometers, and this is the name of the technique, the femtoscopy. The time that we deal here is 20, 10 to the minus 23 seconds, and we understand very well that it's absolutely impossible to detect properties of such system by any direct experimental technique. And now, with help, comes the method of femtoscopy, which, which, is, uh, which originates from uh, HBT methods proposed in astronomy. However, we have to be aware of the fact that there are, many dif there are few differences between HBT method applied in astronomy and, HB and the interferometry for the femtoscopy method applied in case of heavy ion collision. So first of all, we have different scales. In case of heavy ion collisions, we, de we deal with uh, sizes of uh, with, so with uh, sources of with sizes of the order of femtometers. While in the case of uh, HBT method in astronomy, we have tens order of magnitudes uh, bigger system. Then we have different measured quantities. In astronomy, we measured intensity of the signals detected uh, in these detectors. 
Uh, in the case of heavy ion collision, we measured particles' momentum. And finally, we have different measured quantities. Uh, because in the case of astronomy, we, are, we, we measure angular sizes of stars, while in the case of heavy ion collision, we measure sizes of the source. Okay, so, uh, as I already mentioned, femtoscopy from traditional point of view is the method uh, proposed to determine um, sizes of the source emitted in, in heavy ion collisions. So using two particle correlations as a function of the relative momentum, we are sensitive to correlations that arises due to quantum statistical effects in case of fermions, we have Fermi Dirac statistics, in case of bosons, pose Einstein statistics, and also we are sensitive to final state interactions, the Coulomb for charged particles, and strong interactions for many other systems that we discussed, for example, during this conference. So it is important to stress that in traditional uh, femtoscopy, when, where, when we want to determine properties of the source, we have to assume somehow uh, uh, description of this correlation in terms of, for example, quantum statistical effects. And then we determine properties related to source. However, we can invert this program as, uh, problem as we know very well. And if we assume we know properties of the source, then we can test uh, parameters describe, uh, describing, for example, strong interaction. So this is what is really important, exciting for us nowadays. Uh, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, as, uh, the emission function is the object of study in case of traditional femtoscopy. Then we have, uh, uh, then we have uh, this wave function, which is object of study in case of non-traditional femtoscopy. This is uh, what is measured and studied nowadays uh, in uh, many places. And, uh, and here is the is the recipe that we measure two particle correlations uh, defined as a ratio where we have pairs of particles coming from the same collision where we, where, when we measure, where we are sensitive to these two particle correlations. And then we normalize this by the distribution coming from different events where we obviously do not expect any femtoscopic correlations. Okay, now let me move to results. I, I would like to start with, uh, with uh, this result related to, um, uh, to strong interaction in the case of uh, antiprotons. Uh, anti so it is important that before the studies, uh, any knowledge about uh, nuclear forces was derived from studies that were made on nucleon or nuclei. So before the studies, the nuclear force between antinucleons, uh, I mean the studies were never performed. So it is important to stress that the knowledge about interaction between two antiprotons is really fundamental to understand much more sophisticated uh, cases, much more sophisticated anti. Nuclei. And here we have star results. You have comparison of proton proton and anti proton anti proton correlation function. And then, uh, and then we tested parameters of strong interaction using uh, Lednitsky's model. So we have two parameters D0, F0 describing uh, parameters of interaction. And then, uh, function by function, assuming different these parameters, we checked, uh, we checked uh, agreement between uh, theoretical prediction and experimental data. And here you see, you, you may see a high square map uh, where we see this dip uh, from which we read the best agreement between uh, theoretical function and experimental function. And this is the way how we uh, read the best uh, parameters describing strong interaction in the case of antiprotons. So, uh, two parameters, F0 and D0, uh, in the case of a uh, system composed of two antiprotons, uh, first of all, we found to be consistent uh, with two protons, which is uh, something we expected. But on the other hand, I would like to pay your attention that uh, this is the first uh, paper, this is the first result where, where we have present description of the interaction among antimatter, taking into account the most elementary antimatter particle as antiproton is. So here we reach quantitative verification of matter-antimatter symmetry in the context of forces that are responsible for binding of antinuclei. 
Okay, if we move forward, uh, now we have very important topic uh, nowadays, so hyperon nucleon and hyperon hyperon interaction. So let me start with the statement that of course studies of hyperon nucleon and hyperon hyperon interaction are in progress. So they are very important and uh, some experiments uh, also uh, make some efforts in order to learn as much as possible. From the uh, theory point of view, major steps forward have been also made. Here is, uh, I mean, lattice QCD, for example. So we have numerous vertical prediction. However, we really need clear evidence, for example, to, to, to see whether we see any signatures of bound state. And this should be really studied and uh, this should be really taken into account by few experiments. So the existence of hypernuclei is uh, confirmed by attractive uh, hyperonuclear interaction. So this is a hint that uh, this indicates uh, the, that uh, hyperon is bind inside nucleus. Another important uh, topic is that uh, hyperon nucleon and hyperon hyperon interaction leads to important implication um, for the possible formation of these bound states related to nucleon hyperon hyperon hyperon. And also, this is also extremely important, as we know very well, to physics of neutron stars. So the structure of neutron star uh, is uh, still unknown, and hyperon appear there uh, depending on hyperon, hyperon, and nucleon, hyperon interaction. Okay, so what can we uh, put uh, from our side to this what we know? So here you may see uh, results from star experiments related to lambda hyperon. So this is lambda, lambda. Uh, correlation. So uh, the main motivation of this study was to find a uh, possible bound state, a six quark state. And uh, here, due to uh, quite limited statistics, uh, then we took into account uh, higher data collection in order to verify this hypothesis. So here I, might, um, I must say that this is, uh, this is the result of preliminary study, work still in progress. However, we found F0 parameter becomes positive, which is a hint. Uh, to, our, to our hypothesis. Okay, and now let me discuss uh, shortly another uh, system of, uh, related to lambda. Here you see proton lambda measured this time at Hades. So uh, here you may, see, um, you may see results of proton, proton, and proton lambda system. So proton, proton was uh, analyzed in order to determine the properties of source size and then having this, it was possible to study parameters of the interaction and here you may see parameters extracted uh, based on this study. So it's important to state that femtoscopy technique to study interactions between particles can be applied in many colliding systems, with very different energies, which really is a big um, help to improve uh, uh, what we understand about hyperon nucleon interaction. Here, another system, this is proton omega, uh, the results coming from STAR. Uh, unfortunately, due to rather limited statistics, this is the best what we could measure at STAR. And uh, so, taking into account amount of data uh, available uh, so far, uh, we, could only, uh, we could only conclude that uh, scattering length is positive, which favors proton omega bound state hypothesis. However, uh, any more detailed um, interpretation of result was impossible at this uh, at this uh, that time. So this is also something which uh, we plan to perform. Uh, here, proton uh, proton cascade. Here you may see a first measurement of proton uh, of proton uh, xi uh, at at, at Rick. Uh, so here you see the correlation function together with some model prediction. It's important to say that this preliminary study does not include uh, uh, feed down correction, so we have to be aware of the fact that in such systems some particles come from weak decays and then we have to be very careful in interpretation uh, because we really want to determine the correlation, correlation parameters related to uh, primordial uh, particles. So. Uh, so, so this is uh, this is the first atom that we uh, that we prepare, taking into account uh, cold cold collision performed at free uh, GeV. Okay, uh, here we have uh, xi uh, 
cascade cascade correlation. This is the first result obtained by uh, by star. So uh, here you see a preliminary function and first attempt were done in order to estimate parameters of the strong interaction F0 D0. So from the studies we found a F0 parameter positive. So based also on the studies we are able to, uh, to verify a hypothesis about, uh, uh, about uh, possible uh, bound states. Okay, let me move to, uh, let me move to uh, next part, uh, neutral chaos. So here I will just mention a few uh, important uh, aspects. So for more details, please uh, stay and listen to uh, the AMA talk. So the aim of the study is to study um, all possible combinations of charge chaos and neutral chaos. So here you see uh, K charge, K charge, K0, K0, and K0, K charge. Of course, uh, we understand that there are different interactions and effects between these all possible combinations. However, uh, taking into account properties of source that emits this particle, we rather expect similar sizes. So uh, even if we have different uh, shapes of correlation function that arises due to different interactions, uh, uh, this is very interesting to compare all the systems together in order, for example, to verify hypotheses about possible, uh, uh, possible for quark uh, state. Uh, okay, so here you may see uh, results of K0, K0 for two different centralities. So uh, here four different parametrizations were tested. Of course, here we underline how important are strong interaction uh, that are here. Uh, uh, here you may see K0, K charge. Uh, so also we, uh, we test four different parametrization of, uh, of, uh, of uh, strong interaction. And uh, then uh, having uh, these four, uh, this four uh, different parametrization, we take all our results together in order to see how they, uh, how they look uh, comparing all together uh, plotted as a function, for example, of, of centrality. So, here, uh, taking a look at this uh, bunch of different results for different systems, as we expect uh, similar source sizes, in this way we can simply verify which, uh, which description, which uh, description of the interaction uh, is this one that uh, fits better what we observe in our data. Okay, um, almost uh, last uh, topic I would like to present uh, is not related to strange particles, but this is, uh, I think, important topic uh, from the point of view of our recent measurements. So uh, we study nuclei formation at uh, 300 GeV, so you may see a very nice collection of different uh, functions for, uh, so here you see a uh, proton-deutron and also deutron-deutron. And what is important, I would like to pay your attention to this last part of this, this result. We have deutron deutron correlation function, where uh, taking into account some model prediction, uh, we, could, uh, con we could confirm that the scenario that includes coalescence, uh, form is the formation of deutron due to coalescence fits really better to our, to our data. So this is another result that confirmed that deutron are uh, produced, uh, formed via uh, mechanism of coalescence. Okay, and the last part of my, of my, of my talk is related to non-identical particle correlations. So um, I saw uh, many talks uh, today and also on the other days, uh, you mentioned a lot about, uh, for example, kion proton. So this is also the system that we are interested in. Here you may see comparison of all possible systems uh, of kions, uh, pions, kions, and protons for like signs and unlike signs. Here you may see that uh, the correlation function descri describing um, K proton uh, due to the strong interaction uh, looks differently. This is what we understand. And this is also another system that we, that we, that we study uh, at STAR and we try to uh, we determine, we learn more about, about these uh, interactions. However, the main motivation of the studies was uh, not to, to study in details uh, this K on proton correlation, but rather to determine uh, some properties of emission process. So for example, having two, two non-identical particles emitted, uh, then we can determine some properties about, for example, emission sequence, so which particle of which type is emitted earlier or later, or from which part of the source. So if we take 
take into account uh, some uh, results, here you may see that if we decompose our correlation function using uh, spherical harmonics, the components, one of these components, if it deviates from zero, is, it indicates possible asymmetry. And this is what we understand. We see really consistent description of all the systems, so we are sensitive to this asymmetry in the emission process. And the conclusion is that heavier, that, that heavy particles that are heavier are directed towards edge of the system, or also there is another possibility that there are, uh, there are emitted uh, earlier. And this is the, the end of my talk, so very briefly, I tried to cover the most important topics uh, studied at RIC energies in terms of correlations. So, of course, we are interested in, uh, uh, in the description of strong interactions, so this is, I would say, uh, the most important topic nowadays, but except this, of course, we have program which covers also other uh, interesting um, problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hanna. Questions, comments, Laura? I, I think it was um, slide number 31 where you showed DD correlation. 30, well, maybe I'm wrong. Don't know, the other one. Uh, this one, okay. This one, okay. So um, I didn't understand why with the coalescence uh, assumption, the correlation function is lower, so this would be like okay, so the red line. So what happens there? Okay, so here you have the data, experimental data, and two different models were uh, t taken into account. So we took SMASH uh, with and without coalescence put inside. So, so from the first view, it looks that the model that includes coalescence fits data much better. But keep in mind that these are preliminary studies and more no, no, investigation. I, this I got it while you were talking, but I don't understand uh, why. So why with coalescence the correlation goes down? This is normally the effect that we see if uh, the distance is smaller, basically. If the radius is smaller, then the correlation goes down. But uh, I, intuitively, I do not uh, understand why coalescence should uh, make this difference between blue and red. So. Um, do you maybe have an intuitive explanation why it's like that? Okay, maybe we can ask uh, the Smash people and, uh, okay. I will think of this. Yeah, I, we can I, ask I, I them. Got, okay, the thank you. No, the question is already what kind of coalescence is this? Is this an impulse moment? Is this momentum only? Is this momentum space correlations? I also fear so. Uh, perhaps the coalescence is too simple. Any other question? Okay, then I have one on the Xi proton. This one? Uh, no, the Xi proton. proton. Because it's also this something plus crap. What is this actually simulating? I think it was your QMD plus crap. This, this is what I wondered. So what is the theory curves here? So one is a Gaussian source fit. The one is a Gaussian source fit and the other one is your QMD plus crap. So, because your QMD should, in principle, model this behavior. So, CREP is doing something. In yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, in case of your QMD model, you don't have phantoscopic correlation inside. So, then you use another soft okay, afterburner, which puts your correlation inside to the model, right? So, this, this is how, because otherwise, you would get completely flat behavior. Okay, so it's kind of afterburner. So, the CREP is the software which really puts your correlation to inside. The model. Okay. I don't see any. For the question, so thanks again. We move to the next talk that is given by Rafa Lalik on review of strangeness physics program at Hades, past and future perspectives. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, it's nice to be here and give you a talk about the Hades, uh, about the past results, and also what are the expectation or perspectives from the, uh, our newest data. Uh, and for the purpose of this talk, I divide the topic into like six bubbles, uh, like strange production. Uh, oh, I speak of course about hyperons, so uh, this is strange production uh, for hyperons, hyperon structure, hyperon nucleon interactions, hyperon polarization, 
hypernuclei and mesointeractions. Hypernuclei was already covered by Simon on Monday talk, so I will not speak about that because it's also heavy ion, and in my talk I am mainly looking into the uh, elementary reaction. And also, the mesointeraction were covery, uh, covered yesterday by Laura, maybe not intentionally, but she discussed most important results, so also I will not uh, touch this topic uh, today. So, what are the X perspective for Hades? Uh, Hades is currently the first detector fully operating on the fair phase zero since already four years. Uh, we had already two beam times uh, for that. And uh, to prepare for this operation, Hades went, underwent uh, several upgrades. The most important for us, what for the topic of today, are I I installation of the ECAL, so calorimeter, which allows us for the first time to measure the neutral photons. Upgrade of reach, which improve our efficiency for the dielepton pair uh, measurement, and that's what Hades was built for, to measure dieleptons. And two other detectors, which I will cover shortly, uh, for a detector and ITOF. Uh, currently, Hades still is operating at CIS-18, so it's the uh, GSI new experimental hall, but when CIS-100 will be finished and the CBM cave will be finished, the Hades will move to the CBM cave and will be operating, not the same time, but uh, alternately to uh, CBM, and will allow us to also make measurements uh, for heavy ions, maybe for elementary reactions, at larger energies available at CIS-100. Now, for a detector. That's one of the most important detectors in terms of the new measurements, which uh, I'll be discussing today. Uh, Hades is a classical magnetic spectrometer. It has a magnet surrounded by the uh, tracking chambers. We have time of flight detectors to have particle PID. And of course, in the beginning, like around the target, we have a rich detector, which provides us uh, direct uh, identification. But Hades has also small gap. There was a gap up to like 15 degrees from zero to 15, which we are blind. And with higher energies and knowing that hyperons are mainly produced very anisotropically, so we have forward and backward in the central mass system um, production, we were losing a lot of, a lot of hyperons by just being blind in this uh, sector. So this detector opens us, uh, even uh, for some of the channels, actually doubles our acceptance uh, for uh, measurement significantly. And this very simple detector, it's um, cooperation with the Panda, so we took uh, Panda strobes and we installed eight layers of the Panda uh, stro uh, tracking strobes. We add a RPC detector based on the Neuland technology, so we really make this detector very cheap, very fast, but it's very effective for us. The last upgrade, which is also very important, is the ITOV installation. ITOV is a scintillator detector, which uh, uses SIPNs for readout, and it's installed just in the, in the front of the tracking chamber. This is this red line here. And with ITOV, we have improved our tracking capabilities, because now we are not, uh, we, are, uh, we have better uh, trigger selection and better purity of the trigger. Before our uh, trigger detector sitting on the back were very sensitive to secondary particles, giving us a lot of bad events. Now with this ITOF we have much more cleaner uh, sample. And all these updates were of course made for something and the something is, was the proposal which we uh, submitted two years ago to the uh, GSI PAC committee uh, where we focus on the production of four main topics for our, uh, for our uh, proposal, but in general it was production of decays of hyperons and inclusive hadrons and laptop production in PP reactions at 4.5 GV. So that's the new energy now available uh, to us at CIS-18, thanks to the preparation for uh, fair phase zero. And this uh, proposal was accepted with recommendation for being executed, and in the beginning of this year, in February, we ran the experiment, we collected the data, now the data are being calibrated, and hopefully next year we'll be, we'll start, uh, be seeing first results from uh, this experiment. So now let's uh, let's see what we can expect or what we hope for uh, uh, from this experiment. Let's start with strange production. Uh, 15 years ago, there was the first experiment, well, the major experiment for proton-proton at 3.5 GV. From that experiment, we have um, produced or measured a lot of different um, interesting data. Uh, of course, we're speaking about hyperons here. No, uh, uh, and um, most of the channels which we measure were measuring, uh, were measured exclusively. So we are looking for the full, uh, full uh, event topologies. But many of these events, in the end, end up with producing a lambda. So we decided to collect all the events or the different reactions which we measure, put together, and create a 
uh, data-driven model for inclusive lambda production. So we have, of course, some gaps. We didn't measure everything. So with the gaps, we use uh, results from other experiment or we use some educative guess what we can expect. We put it together and then we try to describe what we see from the data. Well, the model was partially successful. It, it, uh, it was able to describe part of the spectra of the lambda, which we see especially in the, this is a spectrum showing the uh, different differential cross-section uh, as a function of um, momentum in the central mass versus uh, cosinus theta. So uh, for the high momentum values, we had very good agreement between data and, uh, and the model. In the but in the very forward and backward direction, these discrepancies were uh, larger. So the well, model wasn't perfect, but uh, also we didn't have all the data. So now, with the new experiment, we hope that we can make this uh, maybe m m model better and uh, we will try to describe the lambda production in a much better way. Uh, but what also we did, we took uh, data on one of the exclusive channels, namely PK lambda, which is the first channel w which produces the lambda, and we combine that with data of the experiments like COSI, uh, TOF, DISTRO, FOPI, and we make a combined PVA analysis in the region from 2.14 to 3.5 GV uh, in order to dis describe all the contributions to PK lambda production. We know that in the, our energy regime we are dominated by resonances, and these analysis actually show us that we have a seven resonances which mainly contribute to this, uh, to this channel. Then we also, uh, Sigma was one of the channels which we couldn't really measure at that time. We didn't have proper methods or we didn't develop that yet. And the detector also wasn't um, very, um, the best suited for this measurement, especially we didn't have a lambda, uh, sorry, a photon uh, measurement. But uh, nevertheless, we, in the last year, we tried to m try different approaches and we make our first measurements of the sigma zero production. That would be, uh, this is data from the uh, exclusive channel, so PK sigma zero. This topic will be covered today by the valid talk, so listen to this talk if you are going to listen more about this topic. But also one of the measurements we did, we tried to anyway, uh, find the uh, uh, sigma zero in the uh, proton naivium reaction. Of course, we didn't see uh, phion, uh, photon directly, but then we used a trick, but looking in the photon conversion in the detector material and looking for the lepton pairs, trying to reconstruct the photon and then finally found uh, to sigma zero. So it was for us kind of benchmark what, whether we can see uh, the sigma zero in the future uh, experiments. Then going heavier with the masses, we are coming to the heavier hyperions. Uh, so we have lambda 1405, which we already uh, know very good and was uh, discussed uh, several times at this meeting. We have lambda 1520, as we have uh, sigma 1385. So again, we measure uh, this uh, production of these hyperions in the exclusive matter. We, uh, we have uh, described few production channels. Uh, we try to learn as much as possible so about anisotropy of production of these hyperions. Uh, contribution of the resonances, so we provide a few uh, data points. Uh, and also recently, so these measurements which are like 10 years old, but recently we start looking into lambda 5020 again, into proton-proton and proton naivium reactions, and that's the preliminary results, and now we'll come to the results soon again. Uh, let's for now go uh, forward. The next is the Xi minus hyperon, which was also uh, several times discussed in this meeting and had us make a few measurements. Uh, first was the proton niobium, then we have argon KCL. In both measurements, we extracted some cross-sections, and these results were interesting because we have uh, two issues with that. So the uh, things we now called uh, Hades uh, puzzle, or Xi puzzle. First was that uh, in argon KCL, we are able to produce Xi with the energies much below the production threshold. And the second was that our statistical hadronization models were not able to describe the yields of uh, Xi, which we seen in the experiment. So now we are trying to understand what is the reason for that. And one of the ideas is that, like with other hyperons, we have also contribution from the heavier uh, resonances. And there is idea that there's N star going to sigma K plus, K, uh, sigma K plus, K plus. Uh, and uh, that is something what we can try to see in the elementary reaction, but also in the uh, PA or uh, heavy ion reactions. But for sure, we need a reference spectra in the proton-proton, so that is one of the main objectives for the beam type to find, to measure the Xi and production in the, in, the, in the PP reaction. Now let's come to the hyperon structure. 
Uh, okay, lambda 14.05 already discussed. Now we discuss about the structure. We already know it has two poles, sigma phi and uh, chi nucleon. In Hades, we are sensitive to the sigma phi uh, pole. And uh, with that, in the mass spectrum, we see peak and around 1385 MeV. And unfortunately, this peak overlaps with the uh, with the sigma 1385, which has more or less the same uh, the same uh, mass. And at that time, we were only able to measure uh, these two particles using the charge sigma pion channels. Now, with calorimeter, we can also uh, look into the uh, neutral sigma pion channels. And uh, this channel is very nice for us because it's exclusive for lambda 1405. So if we see the line shape of lambda 1405 via neutral channels, we won't have contamination from the other hyperons decays. And of course, with the new data, also we aim for the higher statistics, so overall better quality uh, data. Uh, and now we are back to Lambda 1520. So there was a paper by, uh, from since like 20 years ago, which said the question whether Lambda 1520 is also a molecule of sigma 1385 and pion. And if it's molecule and in the, in the, in the cold nuclear matter, it should, um, uh, feel the interaction with the with the matter, and that will influence the broadening broad, broadening of the spectrum of the lambda 1520. So with that, we start to looking exactly into our data at 3.5 GV. We knew that we ha won't have many statistics, but at least we wanted to try to see something, and that was the results. Those are preliminary results that's awaiting for the PhD defense of our colleague from Hades, uh, and the publication should be next year. So. Uh, 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 we have, we'll have, let's say, we'll try to draw some conclusions from the spectra we see now, but of course, with the new uh, uh, data at higher energy, we expect much better data quality and to look into PP and PA experiment, uh, most likely pro uh, proton uh, silver is on the list of our future experiments, which we hope to perform with others in the next two, three years. And then we can have a uh, better picture of the Lambda 1520. Uh, now, one of the most important topics for Hades, because it's directly related to what Hades was bid for, so looking into the hyperons uh, structure via electromagnetic decays. So we have two cases, this is the virtual photon and the uh, real photon. And uh, why electromagnetic? Because uh, electromagnetic transition for factors are very sensitive probes of hyperon internal structure. And now we can measure ETFF via three different uh, processes. We can look into the electrons, for example, scattering on the uh, nucleon or hyperon, but for happens it's difficult because we cannot easily make a hyperon uh, target. <laughs> then we can look into the uh, colliders, E plus E minus, but that's only available for the higher Q square values. And the third re region, which is perfect for Hades, is the Dalitz uh, decays region, uh, where Hades has very good efficiency for measuring the electrons and the hadrons in that case. But before we come to Hades, let's look first on the reverse pro uh, process, which is a photo production. So if we have a virtual photon, which is uh, impacting the uh, hyperon or any nucleon, you can have uh, two effects. First, if you are on the lower energy, you might feel the meson field or meson C, which is surrounding the hyperon. And if this, in this meson C, you also have vector mesons, which have the same spin like uh, uh, photons, then they two might couple each other, and then you start to see maybe some structures in the, um, in the spectrum. We mainly we speak about uh, uh, invariant E plus, E minus uh, mass. So uh, that's what is reflected in this uh, blue bar, these different spectra, that's what is a so-called vector dominance uh, model. And if you have higher energy photons, they can go through the sea and they can directly interact with the quarks which are inside the nucleon. And uh, such measurements were done. That's an example of the photo production of the delta with, uh, uh, that's of course not a direct reaction, but there is some um, secondary reaction inside, uh, inside the system, where the experimental data could be described by the model which includes the quark core yeah, for the um, higher Q square values and a pion cloud in this lower uh, Q, uh, Q square region. And then Hades tried to do the same, but now with the uh, proper Dalis uh, reaction, and that's the result from the Hades. For, this is the first ever measurement of the, the Delta uh, Dalis decay. And we, with our data, we are a cluster consistent with the model of uh, pion cloud and quark core. And now interesting thing is that this, what you can see for 
delta uh, decay. Uh, so if you can see in this transition from delta zero to neutron, it has a symmetry, uh, symmetry partner, uh, flavor symmetry partner for sigma 75. So we can go with the neutron sigma 75 via delta decay to the lambda. And if we can measure, make this measurement, then we, for the first time, we'll have insight into the structure of the hyperon. So that's one of the most important results which we expect uh, with the latest beta at Hades. There are the theoretical papers which are uh, try to uh, describe this process. So you can see that's the DALIS and the sigma decay. So now model is, now we need our data which we can now uh, cross-check with the model. Uh, okay, uh, sigma DALIS decay is only one of the processes. Second process is the, uh, that we try to see whether we can also measure DALIS decays of the other process, of the other hyperons. So sigma zero we know we can do, lambda 1520 we can also measure. F sadly, we will not have data, enough data or statist our statistic on the lambda 1405, but yeah, two other uh, hyperons are available for us, and that's in the virtual, uh, virtual photon sector. And, the, and for the real sector, of course, we are now opening the um, uh, feed of the hyperon spectroscopy, which also is not well well uh, known yet, we have only a few measurements, many from class, about uh, some of the hyperon uh, real photon decays, and now with Hades we also hope that using our calorimeter we can extend our knowledge and also cross-check our data with some mod other models. We try to describe the structure of the hyperons using data on or uh, using uh, the waves of the, uh, of the photon decays uh, in, uh, as a kind of uh, probe for the internal structures. So we are waiting for the new data and uh, for discussion with the uh, tortician about the models, which are from 80, so they're like 20, 30 years old, but there was no satisfactory data for now to, to verify these models. Hypernuclear interaction. Okay, that's a topic which was also covered uh, on this meeting often. Yesterday, Lavra gave us a nice receipt how to cook a neutron star. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Laura is an excellent cook. I mean, I remember how was she cooking in, this, uh, in the kitchen was excellent meal. Us in the laboratory is also excellent work. But of course, she had to learn that somewhere. And that was Hades, where she was first making um, the cooking. And Hades was one, one of the first experiments, I think even the first one, which uh, published the lambda-proton um, uh, correlation function. Uh, so we, we just presented here. Of course, later uh, her work was followed by, uh, she followed the work in Alice. So now we try to also check whether we can look into satisfactory data on the P lambda or lambda lambda correlation in the new experiment. So we make some uh, simulations, we have some uh, cross-section estimation, and then we found that, well, maybe we will not overcompete it, Alice, because of the scale of the detector, but maybe at, with some things we can be competitive or at least provide some satisfactory data. So in uh, Hades, we are on the lighter system, so for sure we will have higher or higher fraction of the small relative momenta uh, than in Alice, because in Alice we have large energy, so our mo relative momenta range is very, very big, and we only looking for these low uh, momentum values. In Hades, we'll have more data in that region. Uh, also, we'll have much uh, uh, smaller feeding from the higher, zone, uh, higher hyperons. So in the Alice, you have higher uh, hyperons, which has to decay. So that's kind of, uh, it reduces the purity. In Hades, we don't have this problem. We have many, a lot of la lambdas, direct lambdas. So uh, from this point of view, we, we are more cl uh, cl uh, cleaner. And also the soil size uh, corrections, which we expect in Hades will be smaller than in the other experiments. So by, uh, let's say, checking what we, uh, what we can gain by comparing our statistical uh, errors with what uh, Alice was published, we, saw, we see that in the optimistic uh, scenario, we can actually have comparable statistical error or uh, precision than, than Alice. Actually, this cross-section uh, which we see here uh, for uh, lambda, lambda was not easy for us to estimate. We didn't have so many data for, at 4.5 GV to really relate to and make up uh, estimation for our count rates or uh, cross-sections which we expect. We had to use, let's say, data, data which are available in the experiments above and with lower energies. Uh, and uh, we have a large discrepancy of between, let's say, two, we propose two different values for, um, uh, for uh, cross-section for the lambda-lambda, and also this is for xi-minus because this is a very similar system. 
This is an optimistic uh, scenario with this blue line with this 3.6 uh, microban. More uh, optimistic is 0.35, so it's 10 times lower. True, probably somewhere between these uh, two lines. Okay, hyperpolarization. Okay, so uh, hyperpolarization uh, that, well, Mm, that I will then cover shortly. We measure polarization in the proton myoglobin. That was the first system where Hades measured the polarization. Now we are measuring the polarization in the heavy ion systems. We also try to measure that in the proton proton. We were not very successful. We had some issues. Uh, it was proton proton 3.5. So now we'll also try to do that in uh, 4.5. We'll see what the results comes from. For, for this uh, topic, I don't have any estimation yet. We just know that we can do that because we'll have enough statistics. But for sure, uh, this topic will be interesting and also one of the um, uh, main topics where, where Hyperon group and um, within Hades is uh, interested to uh, measure. And to summarize everything, that's our uh, pr uh, the proposal and project uh, for the Hyperon program at uh, recent experiment. We made estimation of, for different, is the, okay, for different channels. So you can look up this table where you can find ec our expectation for number of counts for different reactions. That will also give you the uh, feeling about the quality of expected quality of our data. And if you want to learn more about what we propose please look up at this uh, paper. This paper was used as a base for this uh, proposal, so you will find all the information inside this paper for, for everything related to the hyperons. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We have time for a few questions. Actually, I had a few, but I forgot them. Uh, <laughs> because sometimes it's hard to read it here, I guess from mm -hmm. there it's easier. Uh, if you go, I think, three slides back. So, yeah, it is estimates. <clears throat> so, what is actually the, the, what is splattered on the y axis and the middle plot? It's D, N, D. Oh, this is, this is number of, uh, so. The x-axis is the source size. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, radius, and the y is then and that was the uh, number of uh, number of uh, counts. Okay. Yeah. So the expected number yes. of particles yeah. which you reconstruct. And you said we are, you have compatible errors uh, in comparison with Alice. But it's, uh, we are yes, we, so uh, we took the data from Alice, we look on what are the statistical errors, and then we try to find uh, what would be the statistical errors for the same beans, beans uh, for Hades, and that's why, and that's uh, the relative uh, this difference between the, uh, uh, what, 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 what was, pro, uh, yeah. The blue, the blue, blue line, yes. basically. So it was yeah. the errors. So th those are, we, as I said, we have two cross-section scenarios because we were very uncertain what would be the final cro uh, cross-section production for double strangeness in our uh, experiment. So the blue is the case where we have 3.6 microbands. So we have done higher statistics. So we have statistically statistical error low, lower, and the red is lower cross-section. So our errors are larger. Okay, but uh, can you make any estimate of the systematic uncertainty then? No, not at this, uh, okay, not at this okay. uh, stage. I don't see any hand. Then thank the speaker again. <laughs> and we move to the next talk, which is from Alice. It's uh, by Bhavani Singh on extending strong interaction studies to nuclei with Alice. Measurement of proton, deuteron, kaon, deuteron, and lambda. I cannot read it. It's cut. <laughs> you have to tell us. You have, uh, you know, the time is over there. We don't have 20 minutes. Yeah. Sorry? 12 minutes. 12 minutes off. Okay, so that's wrong. Okay. Hi. So, uh, myself, Bhavani Singh, and on behalf of Alice Collaboration, I would like to talk on uh, extending the Alice Strong in Interaction Study to nuclei via the measurement of proton neutron correlations in PP collisions at 13 TV center of mass energy. So, the main motivation for the study comes from two key points, one is the interaction, and the second one is the production of light nuclei. So in the inter interaction part, I would quickly mention uh, a nice uh, talk given by Laura Sakshnite, where she told us that there is a direct way to explore the interaction among the three nucleons. So similarly, the proton-neutron correlation also provide us an indirect way to explore the interaction in the system of three nucleons. 
In this direction, there are also scattering experiments available, which can be used to uh, constrain the interaction, uh, interaction in PD. And for example, if you draw the sketch and you assume that the point, uh, there is a point-like particle, deuteron and proton are point-like particle, then the sketch would be looking like uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, now, um, the PD system becomes even more interesting when we uh, look at the other aspect where we have a deuteron as a light nuclei, and the production mechanism of light nuclei is not well understood. So there are models such as a stati statistical hadronization model can be used to, uh, um, a statistical hadronization model can be used to study the uh, uh, formation of light nuclei uh, at a fixed temperature, saying that it, uh, the, all the nuclei and the pro particles are for, uh, produced at the same common surface, which would be then the second picture that I show here. And also there is coalescence-like picture where the, the particles initially state is a PPN interaction, a PPN particle, and then asymptotically they form a proton-deuteron system. Uh, in both the models, what we do not know is the formation time of light nuclei. So what we try, with, or with final state interaction, what we try to achieve is or uh, explore is the formation time of light nuclei in this direction. So in all of the th three cases, if we, if we now have a good knowledge of the interaction between proton and deuteron, then perhaps we can go back and uh, try to explore, uh, in extract information about how they are produced. So to study the form, uh, to study the formation and um, final state interaction in our, um, we use femtoscopy at LS uh, experiment uh, at the LSC, and uh, the a, a nice introduction has already been given in uh, given by uh, many people in this uh, in several talks. So I would quickly just remind uh, make a reminder that the correlation in femtoscopy the main observable is a correlation function, uh, which is. Uh, the correlation in the relative momentum of the particle pair, a distribution of relative momentum, uh, momentum in the particle pairs. The, uh, the theoretical definition is a kunian pratt equation, which is uh, the integra integration of a uh, integral of the source times uh, wave function is squared, and the source dis function describes how, how particles are di distributed, and the wave function, modular wave fun function is squared, actually uh, describes how they interact. In experiment, we define this uh, correlation function as a ratio of uh, distribution of the relative momentum in the same event divided by the distribution on, in the distribution of the relative momentum in the mixed event. And at the large case, the no, it is normalized such that at large case star the value of correlation function is expect, expected to be one. Um, if we now know it, in this case, if we know the source function, uh, for example, then we can study the interaction or vice versa. For example, if we take now uh, source source size equal to one for me and an attractive potential between two particles, the correlation function would go above one. In the other case, if we have a repulsive interaction between particle pairs, then the correlation function goes below one. Um, now, we, in order to, um, at the, uh, to study the experimental uh, correlation function, we use Alice experiment, and the, in the Alice experiment has excellent uh, particle identification capabilities, which pro makes it a good platform to perform the femtoscopic studies. Uh, in this analysis, we use uh, run to high multiplicity data of one billion event, and the particle momenta are reconstructed using time projection chamber and time of flight detector. The purities of, of uh, um, the purity of selected particles, uh, protons and antiprotons, deuterons and antideutrons, is nearly 100 percent. So the sample is uh, rather pure, and with this such a pure sample, then one can go further and build the correlation function. So what I show here is uh, the sum of pairs and anti-pair correlation function as a, and, and the plot over here, the correlation function is shown as a function of k star. So if you now look at here, uh, at the large k star, the correlation function is flat, but as soon as we go towards low k star and at the very, somewhere close to the 50 MeV so on, the correlation function goes below one, indicating that uh, there is a repulsive kind of interaction in proton-deuteron system. Um, what we see here in this uh, the, the plot is the black color is the systematic uh, uh, statistical uncertainty, and then orange boxes are the uh, uh, systematic uncertain un uncertainties. And in addition, we also provide uncertainties to the uh, normalization, which is around 1.3 percent. So now to interpret this data, we need a model calculation, uh, and as according to the kunian pratt formula, we need two ingredients first uh, for the model. The first is the source size, and typically in PP and PLAD collisions, we assume the short distance, uh, distances are short, short, and the particle emis emission is assumed to be a Gaussian, uh, assumed from a Gaussian profile. 
So the ALIS has already performed um, studies where, they, where we have um, where we have considered proton-proton and proton-lambda correlation, and then we establish a uh, relation between R core and the uh, transverse mass of the particle pairs. And we can see that the, the distribution shows that there is a unique, um, there is a common scaling between uh, both across the system. So in the, all baryonic systems, we have a common scaling, and so does the PD should have. So with now, um, now for the us, uh, for in our case, we have a proton deuter, um, the transverse mass of a proton deuteron pair, which is around 1.06 for me, uh, 6 GeV, and corresponding to that, we can then extract the R core, which is around 0 0.97 for me. In addition to this uh, R core, we also have a, the strongly decaying resonances, short-lived resonances, which can feed to the protons, and then effectively the R core becomes uh, increases, and this account has been already taken care of. And therefore, now the, the new source size is then R effective, which is around 1.06 uh, for me, obviously, for me. Now, with the, we have the source size, and what we need is the interaction. And for the interaction, in a very simplistic case, one could take a, this two-particle wave function, which accounts for the Coulomb and a strong interaction, and only for the uh, uh, S wave, with, meaning that only S wave is equal to one half and three half channel, and then um, the assumption there it, it is made is that the both particles are point-like, meaning that our, we refer to the first sketch where we have proton and deuteron as point-like particle. Now these calculations are based on a scattering parameter, so that we have several scattering parameters listed over here in the table, and according to, uh, corresponding to all the scattering parameters, we have also model cal calculations. Uh, and now if we look at the model calculation at large K-star model and the data agree, however, if we go towards low K-star, there is a peak-like structure showing that there is a strong attractive interaction between uh, proton and deuteron. So, so this means that at, large, at source size equal to 1.06 for me, model and the data both disagree. It is also kind of anticipated uh, because the deuteron is uh, obviously a light nuclei composite object of nucleons and cannot be treated as simple uh, as like point-like particle. So now, however, one could go further and just try to see how the model behave if we increase the source size. And what we do here is we increase source size from one Fermi and go up to the larger value, let's say three Fermi or so on. At largest, like three Fermi value, the correlation function by the model agrees with the data. However, now we, have, we are left with the, the underlying PPN interaction, which is not treated very well. So obviously, the next question would be to then uh, go for the, and uh, in addition, the, the determined source size for, from the empty scaling is around one Fermi. So the, then one would have to think about what can, do, uh, what can be improved here, and the improvement will be then the interaction part. So one would need then the model which treats the P PD system as a more realistic case, including the three-body dynamics of the nucleons, and we have already work in progress where we project the uh, pairwise interaction of the PP, PP and PN, and also the three-body interaction to the PD correlation uh, on the case star of PD correlation. So once we, uh, and this cal the model calculation is done by uh, PISA theory group, Michele, uh, La Alejandro, and Laura. And this calculation is based on the potential like uh, AV18 potential, uh, argon V18 potential, and the three body parties covered by the Urbana 11 potential. Uh, in addition, the demand in this calculation is that the deuteron is already formed at the same time as that of other hadrons, and um, the deuteron wave function is uh, accounted uh, using the AV18 and N potential. So now if we look at the model calculation here, we can see that the model uh, has some sort of a repulsive kind of a structure at low K star, and uh, more or less uh, at the large K star, it's a flat. And this is then the picture which we have the, in the middle, um, and I showed in the, earlier, uh, in the beginning. So the proton and the neutron is a structure which is a proton and neutron. So now if we now quickly just uh, have a, a qualitative look at the data and the model, we can see that the mo model qualitatively reproduced the data. And we also learned that the, our measurement is sensitive to three-body dynamics of nucleons. And, uh, and so the, uh, the pairwise and uh, PPN interaction should be properly treated when we um, calculate the correlation. Now, um, so with this, I already go to the summary. And to summarize, I bring the, all three pictures again. And in the first case, we all started with the saying that the PD is a point-like system. And then we used the scattering parameter and compared with the model, uh, the measured correlation function, we saw that this does not agree. 
But in the next case, if we go, uh, we treated the, uh, the neutron as a two-body system, uh, and then the third particle, which is proton, becomes a three-body system in general. And then uh, we properly project this contribution to the K star of PD. We see that the, 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 this kind of model qualitatively reproduce the data, and uh, it looks promising. So we would uh, like to now, the uh, next step would be to fi uh, fit the mo model to the data and uh, do some quantitative analysis. Um, in the third case, we still, uh, we, one could start with the initial, initial state of PPN and then project to, uh, asymptotically, then it would go to the PD system. Um, but here, we, uh, the theoretical calculations are still in progress. We have done already a preliminary calculation. We saw that there is a repulsive, strong repulsive kind of uh, uh, structure, uh, kind of um, effect is seen compared to the data. However, we need to further perform a study and uh, make a con uh, conclusion in this direction. So it would be interesting to see if, um, it would be interesting to see if we can, uh, uh, with the help of model and the data, we can distinguish between the uh, scenario two and third um, in future. And of course, we have run three um, ahead, so we will be having large uh, data sample so that we can perform uh, precision studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pavani. Questions? Uncles? Here, 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 in front. Thank, okay, thank you for this inter interesting talk. I think that, uh, okay, I have, I have no idea of how these things work, but I, uh, I have the intuition that in the third scenario, if you have three nucleons, first of all, the proton and the neutron have to generate a neutron, and eventually this neutron gets to the detector together with the other proton, right? I mean, and normally this proton neutron to go to a neutron, they emit also a photon. So I, I have the feeling that there is some sort of, of simulation of different processes that can give you to, the, to your final state. And I don't know whether all these possible processes uh, are going to be taken into account. So here, uh, what theoretically we expect is the, we start with the PPN state, and then we project it. Uh, we have a asymptotic form, which is uh, PD, actually, and then the neutron wave function is from AV18. And um, so this would then go towards the picture like coalescence. So the initial the PN interaction then will um, eventually form a deuteron, and the third particle remains like that. Yeah, but in your, your data, you collect data, I mean, all of all possible uh, processes must be contained in your data, right? So how yeah. do you know uh, what is the, I don't know, the, exactly. the, so differ the different weight of each process, for instance? Is that uh, known? Uh, yeah, exactly Yields, what we can. something like that. Perhaps, yeah, but what we can do here is then uh, we distinguish, like, uh, for example, first we start with only one scenario that, we are, that I showed. On the other hand, we can try just the PPN state and project it to the PD asymptotically and then compare with the data if it really agrees because the source size is already fixed from the empty scaling and that is around one Fermi. So eventually if we put a source size equal to one Fermi here, that would be like the neutrons are flying far apart from the, uh, the point where the proton was created. So this is also, and there are also other analysis such as K on neutron and can be performed so where we can confirm further. Yeah. I don't see any additional question. Then let's thank, uh, yeah, there. Kochi Miwa. Thank you very much, very nice talk. And uh, in the uh, PD correlation data, so the uh, correlation once, uh, uh, yeah, at the momentum at the 200, Mevova C, so the correlation once reduced. So in the final uh, theoretical calculation, so the uh, theory also uh, tends to similar same uh, tendency. So is this including some uh, physics? Sorry, I could not hear him properly. So he is asking about the dip. Yeah. And he said that in the correlation, so in the, I think he meant the, the last, the, the Alejandro calculation, the recent one, the preliminary, yeah. there was also a structure scene. But I think it's just not, 
you yeah, should so in, in the theory, um, the, the, since it's a preliminary calculation, but what they have already found out that the higher partial order, partial waves actually lead to this kind of deep like structure. Oh. But in the data, we have n sigma equal to 2.7, so it's hard to say that there is some sort of signal that we see unless, so we, we but for, in, from bins on, onward five to let's say seven, the total n sigma is 2.3 or something. That's, but indeed in the theory part, we have this higher contributions from the higher order partial waves, P waves and D waves coming into this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's thank Bhavani again. Thank you. And we move to the last talk of this session, which is given by Diana Parovska. And she will talk about femtoscopy measurements of 2K on combinations in gold gold collisions at the STAR experiment. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for time. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and show you a results uh, on behalf of the STAR collaboration. So today uh, I will show you how we see the geometry of the particle emitting source through the femtoscopy method. Most often we use pion femtoscopy to learn about the properties of the source uh, due to the high luminosity, uh, high uh, multiplicity, sorry. Uh, but when we try to analyze a different combination of particles, uh, we can measure all, uh, this, the homogeneity region a bit more precisely than through pions alone. Um, the femtoscopy method was introduced many times uh, during this conference, so I skipped this part, and I only mentioned that in the experiment we cannot directly measure the properties of the source, so uh, we create the correlation function to plot um, the correlation function to get, go, uh, give information about the source. And the correlation function in the experiment is given by this equation. So this is the ratio of the two distribution. A is a distribution uh, from pairs uh, from the same event, so they are correlated, and B is uh, the similar distribution, but pairs derived from the different collision, so they are uncorrelated. During this talk, I will show you some results from K0, K0, uh, and as we know, uh, K0 is uncharged, this is neutral particles, so uh, the combination of these particles close to the, uh, close, uh, close in the phase space, um, is uh, suppressed only by the strong, uh, is suppressed only by the strong interaction due to two near threshold resonances, uh, A0 and F0, which give us more pronounced signal. In the case of K0K charge, we have only strong interaction due to one resonance, A0. And here you can see uh, how different effects change the shape of the correlation function. The main motivation to uh, carrying out the Kion femtoscopy study to complement this from pion pion analysis is that Kion contains strange quarks. Uh, one of the possible signature of the quark gluon plasma is the enhancement of the production of the strange particles. Uh, next, uh, counts are also less affected by the feed-down from resonance decays, and they have smaller cross-section on reaction with the hadronic matter. So, Kion obtain information about the different region of the collision interaction. Very interesting is to compare results, femtoscopic results, for all possible Kion combination. K-charge, K-charge, K0, K0, and K0, K K charge. Additionally, we, uh, we know that K0 K charge analysis give us the possibility to examine the A0 resonance. And according to the current state of knowledge, it is possible that A0 resonance could be the four quark state, could be the tetra quark. Uh, to conclude this, we need to check if all combinations give us a similar size of the homogeneity region. Uh, now we have relatively good agreement for the um, uh, LHC energy uh, presented on this plot, but how it looks for lower rig energies need to be checked. This, uh, the femtoscopy method is successfully used in the star experiment analysis. We use information from two detectors, uh, time projection chamber and time of flight, to identify particles. The second detector is used uh, for this particle, uh, for momenta of this particle, where information from TPC is insufficient. The reconstruction of neutral particle is much complicated than in the case of charged particles uh, because uh, the neutral kions decay via the weak interaction into two daughters, the positive and negative pions, which bend away from each other due to the magnetic field in TPC. Once the secondary particle, so P plus and P minus, are reconstructed, the neutral particles um, are 
identified by the topology looking for oppositely charged pairs. And these pairs are extrapolated to a common point as far as possible from the main interaction vertex. Uh, yeah. And the momentum conservation uh, give us the possibility, allow us to measure the reconstructed, the momenta of the neutral particles from the reconstructed momenta of daughters. Okay, so in the case of K0, uh, the parameterization is uh, done using two methods. The first one includes only quantum statistical effects, and it assumes the spherical shape of the source with the Gaussian density distribution. Uh, it's given by this equation, and here we have two unknown parameters. First is the lambda, this is the correlation strength, and second is uh, R invariant, this is the radii of the particle emitting source. The second parameterization uh, includes the strong final state interaction, which is extremely important in the case of K0, K0 analysis. For this purpose, I use lednitsky boschitz model given by this equation. And here we have part related with the quantum statistical effects and also term uh, related with the strong final state interaction due to two resonances, F0 and A0. Uh, this part is also written in terms by the resonance masses A, uh, and decay couplings. And we have several experiments where research to find the best parameters associated with these two resonances. And the most commonly used parameters are presented on this top table, bottom table, sorry. Uh, and here we can see uh, the correlation function for gold-gold collision at 39 GeV uh, for free centrality classes, uh, for central zero, zero up to 10%, for non-central 10 up to 70%, and for minimum bias events. On the bottom, we can uh, result for the topic energy for 200 GeV exactly in the same configuration. As we can see, uh, the shape of the function change for the different centrality and change also between these two energy. Uh, we can also see that the yellow or orange line uh, connected with the Gaussian uh, parameterization do not describe uh, this shape, um, this deep structure around 0 0.1 uh, Jeff over C. So uh, this shows us that it is extremely important to include the strong interaction to our parameterization. Uh, the um, experimental results were, all, were also um, com we also calculate the uh, results from the models, and here you can see um, blue band connected with the URQMD data and red band connected with the Terminator 2 model. Uh, here we have results for 39, and here you can see also the same results for topic energy. Uh, as you can see, uh, we, d we have uh, for Terminator model, we have only data for the most central collision, and this is due to the work on Terminator for lower energies are still in progress. And as you can see, that uh, the URQMD model gives us very good agreement with the experimental data. Uh, now let's go to the geometrical source characteristics. Here we can see the centrality dependence, and this, this dependence is very beautiful. And as we expect, the larger size of the source is for the most central collision, and this is true for both energies. On the left-hand side, we have 39 GeV, and on the right, for 200 GeV. And we can see that, this, uh, that the size of the source decreases with the centrality. Uh, we can, uh, on this plot, we can also observe that the Gaussian parameterization, which do not include the strong final saint interaction, give us the larger size of the source. So this also shows the importance to include the strong uh, interaction. Here you can see also the energy dependence. Uh, as we expect, uh, the larger size of the source is the for biggest energy for 200 GeV. And to prepare uh, results for lower energies from energies from the beam energy scan program, we need more statistics, and this will be done uh, during the second phase of the beam energy scan program. Uh, here all, uh, we can see also that the um, uh, these empty markers connected with the model calculation are very sim um, are consistent within the uncertainties with the experimental uh, results. Okay, so let's move to the next part of my talk related with the K0K charge analysis. Here I also use the lednitsky lubosic model, mm, uh, but this time the equation, uh, this formula is quite different. We do not have part related with the quantum statistical effects. We have only a part related with the strong final state interaction through one resonance, A0. And also here you can see the table with the most uh, popular uh, parameters. 
Okay, but uh, this, uh, but how the, looks the correlation function? Here we can see the correlation function for k0, uh, k plus ectopic energy. As, as you can see, this uh, function is characterized by the deep structure on the beginning of our function. And the depth of this deep change uh, for the different centrality. And we also see that um, the A0 parameterization give us a very good representation of this uh, deep structure of the signal region. Uh, we also see that Antonelli parameterization as of 2001 and 2003 give us very good, uh, describe this shape very well. It looks quite worse for the Martin parameterization, especially for the non-central and for minimum bias events. And here you can see also the centrality dependence. As we expect, larger size of the source is for the uh, most central collision. And from this plot, we can also conclude that the AHES of 2003 parameterization, which is characterized by the larger uh, resonance mass and, they, and decay coupling, uh, give us the larger size of the source. So this is this um, red points. But uh, on the other hand, the Martin parameterization, green points here, um, this is parameterization which is characterized by the lower mass of the A0 resonance, give us the smallest values of the source. And we can also see that this, uh, these two points uh, slightly uh, differs from other fits. Okay, uh, so last part of my talk, this is the comparison between K0, K0 results and K0, K plus at top rig energy. Um, we do not expect any significant difference between uh, size of the source for these two systems because uh, we have only one difference between them and this is the source of the correlation. So here you can see uh, results for the Antonelli parameterization and uh, here we have very good agreement between these two systems. For AHES of 2001 and 2003, we can see that um, results from K0, K charge uh, are larger than from K0, K0 and the situation is completely different in Martin parameterization where results from K0, K0 analysis are larger. Uh, so from this plot, we can conclude that the Antonelli, which give us the best agreement, uh, will favor the assumption that A0 resonance could be the four quark state. Okay, so now uh, I compare all this plot into one. At first, we have results for K0, K0 uh, analysis. Uh, the different color describe different uh, uh, and Lednitsky Lubosz's parameterization. Uh, here you can see also um, circle uh, markers corresponds with results from K0, K charge analysis, and also uh, published results from uh, K, uh, K charge, K charge. And as you can see, these yellow stars uh, have the same trend like uh, points from K0, K0 analysis, and also we can see that these all points connected with also these blue points from K0, K charge analysis are very consistent. So we can also, from this, we can also conclude that Antonelli favors um, A0 as a tetra quark. Okay, so this brings me to the conclusion. Uh, the correlation, the femtoscopy uh, is sensitive to the homogeneity range. Um, from the K0, K0 uh, analysis, we can conclude that the strong final state interaction uh, significantly affects from, um, to, on this uh, correlation due to two resonances, and it is crucial to uh, include it, um, the strong interaction into our parameterization. The radius of the source, uh, we observe that the radius of the source uh, give us beautiful centrality and energy dependence. And also extracted source radii from experiment are comparable with this from the models. From K0, K charge uh, analysis, uh, we can learn that A0 final state interaction parameterization give us very good representation of the signal region. Uh, we also saw from this plot that um, the parameterization with the larger A0 mass, I mean and, uh, Antonelli parameterization, give us the larger size of the source. Uh, from comparison uh, between K0, K0 and K0, K charge, we can conclude that Antonelli parameterization favored the assumption that A0 could be the tetra quark. And also, um, we, have, we can see very good agreement between uh, this free uh, combination in the case of the Antonelli parameterization. And high statistic data taking during the second phase of beam energy scan program give us the possibility to analyze the neutral kion femtoscopy for lower energies, for energies lower than 20 jeff. And that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Diana. Questions?
No question. Laura? Hi. This Hi. is a bit specific question. If you go on slide eight. Slide eight. Where you show the transport models, yes. So I see that the two transport models give a bit different results, but they have as well very different uncertainties. So I wanted to ask what is included in the bands between the two different models? Because Terminator seems almost like you know a line, while in the blue line you really see some. I uh, for Terminator model, I have more data, so this uncertainty is of course smaller. But for reward KMD, we have very small statistics, and I plan to check for the this also for the larger statistics. So this is the difference between these two models. So this is statistical uncertainty? Yes, statistical. Is there any, I, I don't know this model, so this is like a general question, but are there any systematic uncertainties that people usually check for the transport? Because it's like, as we see, the correlation function depends on it rather strongly. I'm not sure. I think no. OK, thank you. Thank you for your question. Don't see any further question. Is it planned to use the isobar data from STAR also to do femtoscopy? Oh, yes, I think yes. But maybe not. Uh, not immediately, no, this yes, is clear yes, yes. also because. It maybe not during my PhD. Uh, okay. <laughs> that is, but maybe someone else uh, did this. Very good. Yeah. Don't see any hand. Thanks again, Diana. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we close the session. <laughs> Session's closed.
Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon session. Um, as I understand, my, our first five talks are going to be online. So, um, <clears throat> let's start with our first speaker. Hi. You have to unmute your speaker. Hi, good afternoon. Is coming from talk with Bastin. Yeah, you can start. Oh, okay. First, I will introduce because uh, I atomic X ray spectroscopy uh, experiment JPAC E03. And the next, I will talk about analysis status. So, so design uh, atomic X-ray spectroscopy is useful method for understanding the baryon-baryon interaction uh, in S equal minus two sector. Uh, in lower state, an um, atomic level is shifted and broadened to do the strong interaction uh, compared to the uh, with only Coulomb interaction uh, considered. <laughs> and uh, the information on XI optical potential can be extracted by uh, measuring X-ray energy shift and width. So at present, XI uh, atomic data is nothing. Uh, so we are aiming for a uh, world fast measurement uh, of X-ray from XI atom. So we performed a JPAC U3 experiment in last year. Uh, in this presentation, I will talk about uh, this experiment. So. This is a uh, experimental concept. Uh, in JPAC AO3 experiment, uh, we use ion targets. Quasi uh, free XI minus was produced by K minus K plus reaction. If XI minus stop in the target, uh, XI atom is formed and X ray are emitted. Uh, there are two advantages uh, to using an ion target. Uh, First is uh, enough dense uh, for higher stopping prob probability of the XI minus. Uh, second is absorption strength uh, reported in theoretical case study uh, is uh, suitable for our measurement. So, and uh, we performed uh, uh, with 10% uh, statics uh, last year. Uh, this figure shows uh, uh, level of scheme of XI minus uh, XI ion atom. Uh, we would like to observe this, these X rays. Uh, and the 5G state is expected to be dust orbit. And this X ray is uh, expected to have an energy shift and with uh, due to strong interaction. Uh, and the expected output are uh, as follows. Uh, first, uh, we are aiming to observe X-rays of this transition uh, with a high aid, uh, which is unaffected by strong interaction. And if 5G gamma is less than 1K EV, uh, uh, this transition is also observable. observable. Even if uh, the reasons cannot be measured, and the absorption strength uh, can be estimated from uh, its uh, yield ratio. So expected yield are as follows. So this is an uh, experimental set setup. Uh, in this experiment, uh, we target egg uh, like production and measured uh, X ray energy. Uh, for tagging the like minus production and uh, missing mass is reconstructed by uh, two magnetic spectrometers. So each spectrometer uh, performs a uh, particular identification and magnetic uh, and uh, measure a uh, momentum measurement. Uh, and uh, the X-ray energy is uh, measured by uh, German detectors. Uh, 
array hyperbola x. Hyperbola x is、uh, consists of、uh, clover type、uh, germanium detectors and vision cocktail suppressors and LSO、uh, pulsars for in beam energy calibration. So, germanium detectors energy resolution is 2K EV、uh, for 300. KV X-rays. Okay, next I will go on to analyze status. Okay, first、uh, I will talk about、uh, tagging the minus production. The left figure shows、uh, the correlation between scattered particles and mass square and momentum. So this region、uh, to、uh, this region corresponds Uh, to K plus.、Uh, K plus、e、yield is as, as expected. And the right figure shows、uh, the missing ma mo mass spectrum、uh, when this region is selected.、Uh, the above figure is when using a, a sheet to target、uh, for calibration. So this peak is a、uh, minus peak, and the high mass region、uh, corresponds to、uh, Minus star and Kuzai pi production. In the case of ion target,、uh, the distribution is uh, uh, broadened uh, due to the Fermi motion of the proton. Okay, next, I will talk about the、uh, German m detector array Hyperbola X. So, in beam energy calibration was performed、uh, using LSO p l s a r which emits.、Uh, 202 kV and 307 kV gamma, ray, gamma rays. And it was、uh, confirmed that、uh, the calibration、uh, could be performed、uh, with an accuracy of 0.3 kV or less. And the、uh, detection efficiency was evaluated.、Uh, the performance is、uh, as ex expected. So, About、uh, visual suppressor performance,、uh, this figure shows energy spectrum in KP reaction.、And、so the background in this region、uh, could be reduced by 70%. So the performance is also as expect expected. So Hyperbola X、uh, system work, worked well in EO3 experiment. Okay. Next,、uh, this is X ray spectrum uh, with uh, tagging the、uh, minus production.、Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, before uh, the expected、uh, minus yield、uh, was obtained, and the German i m detector system worked well, but uh, uh, not uh, clear peak.、Uh, <coughs> Sorry,、uh, but no, no clear、uh, X-ray peak has been observed uh, uh, in the current analysis. X-ray yield seems to be much lower than expected.、Uh, the X-ray of、uh, this transition are not、uh, affected by strong interaction, and so the cascade process may be different from、uh, what we expected.、Uh, we will proceed with.、Uh, The analysis and discuss the reason of the low yield. Anyway,、uh, if the background is reduced more,、uh, the peak structure may be observable. So I'm、uh, working on analysis to select the event with the high stopping probability uh, of uh, the uh, minus uh, for background reduction. So, And、uh, the minus uh, that uh, don't stop, don't stop uh, uh, at the target、uh, decay and make background. So we would like to select the、uh, stop event. Uh, but the、uh, minus, uh, so, uh, cause minus uh, momentum information is needed to determine if the、uh, minus stopped. Uh, but missing momentum have,、uh, uns have uh, uncertainties、uh, due to bad、uh, resolution and fed motion.、Uh, so we will uh, simulate uh, many times 
uh, under different assumption of the generation point and promotion for each event using GGRT4 simulation. And the uh, uh, design stopping probability will be estimated. So finally, uh, the event uh, with the highest design minus stopping priority uh, for background reduction. Uh, so this analysis uh, is uh, underway. Okay, so this is the summary. Uh, so design minus atomic X-ray spectroscopy uh, and, and can uh, can select it in the information of on the uh, potential, and uh, we perform the uh, minus ion atomic uh, X-ray spectroscopy experiment at JPAC EOSV and uh, spectrometers and the German detectors work well uh, but in the current analysis uh, nuclear x-ray peak has been observed and uh, so I will select the event with uh, high stopping probability on the minus for background reduction okay and that's all thank you for attention Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Okay, it seems that uh, the talk was very clear. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Tian Hao Shou from Fudan University. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to share our recent work about study of charge symmetry breaking effect in A equal 4 hypernuclear in 3G gold gold collisions at RIC. My presentation will contain this part. First, I will introduce our motivation and uh, the set up of the experiment, then I will introduce the signal reconstruction questions and the systematic uncertainties, and finally I will show our results on uh, charge symmetry breaking. Uh, first is our motivation. So uh, in not, not 1970s, the nuclear emulsion experiments measure the lambda body energies of uh, uh, of uh, hypo, uh, hydrogen four and uh, hypohelium four, and uh, they they found that uh, the lambda body energy difference between them in their ground states is uh, is large, about three hundred keV. And in in twenty fifteen, the JPAC E thirteen collaboration measured the uh, gamma ray transition energies of the excited. Uh, have a heading for, and uh, uh, they found that the uh, lambda body energy difference in their excited states is uh, much smaller than, than the ground states. Uh, and, and the A1 collaboration also measures the uh, uh, lambda body energy of the ground state uh, 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 hydrogen 4. Um, they update the wheel, but they still found that the difference in ground states is, uh, is much larger than the excited states. And then here, uh, this table shows, uh, shows some uh, model calculations of the uh, difference in ground states and the excited states. And we can find that uh, most of the model calculations cannot reproduce the experimental results well. And in, uh, and in 2016, this PRL paper uh, reported uh, results. Uh, their, their results shows that the charge symmetry breaking in uh, excited states is a negative view and its magnitude is comparable to the ground states. 
So we still need, need independent experiments to test this result. Uh, to study the quark-gluon plasma in the high bound uh, uh, density, density region, uh, the star uh, run in a fixed target model during the uh, best two pro program, and the red figure shows the setup of the star fixed target. Uh, uh, fixed gold target is mounted at the entry of the TPC detector. And it can extend to the extend the lowest collision energy to three G. And in twenty twenty eighteen, Star has uh, has taken over three hundred million events uh, in God God collisions at three G. Uh, in this analysis, the uh, uh, identific identification of the charged particles is mainly based on the energy loss uh, information from the TPC detector shown as the left figure. And uh, uh, the right figure shows the uh, track of helium 3 and helium 4 are also selected according to the uh, mass square information from the TOF detector. And then we can reconstruct their signals. Uh, the hyper, uh, hydrogen 4 is reconstructed via its two-body decay channel and uh, Hyperhelium 4 is reconstructed via its three body decay channel. Uh, then the signal is reconstructed with the uh, uh, K particle package. And uh, the K particle package shows a high quality of the reconstructed particles. And then we use the TMVIBT to optimize the signal. Uh, the, the TMV algorithm can distinguish the signal and the background according to their topological variables. Um, uh, so here we show the uh, t BET response for hyperhydrogen 4 and hyperhelium 4. Uh, for the TMV training uh, samples, we use the Monte Carlo simulation for the signal samples and for the background samples, we rotate the uh, helium 4 or the helium 3 track by 180 degrees to uh, obtain, obtain the background. Uh, in this analysis, we apply two corrections for the momentum of the uh, decay daughters. Uh, the first is energy loss correction. This is because that the particles uh, will uh, lose their energy when they travel through the TPC detector. Uh, the the red circles in the left figure shows the energy loss of helium-4. Uh, we can fit this distribution with the fit function and use the fit parameters to correct the, uh, uh, the momentum of helium-4 and show us the blue triangles in the left figure. Uh, the, uh, the energy loss with, the, with our correction is around zero. Uh, and the uh, and the, the second uh, correction is due to the magnetic field distortion. This is because the uh, momentum of the particles is reconstructed according to the momentum field of the star detector. However, it is suggested that the measured uh, um, magnetic field uh, uh, is 0 0.2 lower than the real magnetic field. So here we apply a factor 0 0.998 to the momentum of decay daughters. Then we check these corrections with the lambda environment mass. Uh, the black line in the red figure shows the lambda environment mass versus its momentum without any corrections is larger than the PDG mass. And the uh, pink line shows the lambda environment mass with our correction uh, is close to the uh, PDG mass. However, it still shows some fluctuation with its momentum. So we also, in uh, so we also consider this fluctuation as a systematic uncertainty. And, and then this slide shows the uh, reconstructed environment mass distributions of uh, 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 hyperhydrogen 4 and uh, hyperhydrogen uh, 4 and hyperhydrogen 4. 
uh, I want to mention here that this figure will be posted on the archive in the uh, next few days. Uh, then we can uh, then we can extract uh, their messes by fitting these uh, environment distributions with this fit function, uh, Gaussian function plus double x potential functions. And here we show the extracted uh, uh, extracted methods of uh, uh, hyperhydrogen four and hyperhydrogen four. Uh, this slide shows the systematic uncertainties of this analysis. We can see that the uh, systematic uncertainties mainly come from the momentum corrections. And here, uh, as tested in the Monte Carlo simulation, the systematic uncertainty from the momentum scaling factor can be mostly canceled when we calculate the, the difference of the lambda body energies. Then we can calculate the lambda uh, body energy according to the masses of the uh, hypernuclear and uh, their constituents. Uh, uh, here, uh, here we show, show, show our extracted lambda body energy for the uh, hydrogen 4 and hydrogen 4 in their ground states. And the red figure shows the energy level schemes of their lambda body energies. Uh, in this figure, the wheels for the excited states are obtained according to our results and the gamma ray transition energies from the uh, previous measurements. Uh, then uh, comes to our result of charge, charge symmetry breaking. Uh, the left figure and the right figure shows the uh, lambda body energy difference between hyperhydrogen 4 and hyperhydrogen 4 in their ground states and uh, excited states respectively. Uh, the black dots shows the uh, theoretical calculations and the uh, blue squares are from the previous measurements and the red stars are, are our results. <coughs> And here we also show the wheels of our results. Our results shows that the uh, the charge symmetry breaking effects in the uh, excited states is a negative wheel, and its wheel are and its wheel is comparable to the ground states. Uh, however, our results uh, have 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 large statistical uncertainties. This is this is due to the uh, st st stat statistics of uh, uh, hyperhydrogen for signal is low in our analysis. Uh, star has star has taken about uh, two billion events uh, in God God collisions at uh, 3G in around 2021. So the uh, green shadows in these two these two figures show show the projected statistical uncertainties uh, according to the uh, statistics of uh, around, around 2021. Uh, however, uh, we still need, need, need some time to produce this new data set and we still need more time to uh, analyze uh, this, this new data. So in summary, we uh, we are not uh, we mirror the, the environment masses and the lambda body energies of hyperhydrogen four and hyperhydrogen four in god god collisions at uh, uh, 3G. Here we show our results, and to study the charge symmetry breaking effect, we also extracted uh, the lambda body energy difference in their ground states and the excited states. Uh, our results shows that the charge symmetry breaking in uh, excited states is negative and uh, its magnitude is comparable to the ground states. Okay, that's all of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. So, so thank you very much for your nice results. Okay, thank you. Um, Uh, this. Uh, my paper.
there is a PLB from 2015. First of all, why do you have two points uh, in each figure for this reference? And more uh, severely, why do you make uh, my prediction uh, positive on the right-hand side where it should have been negative? You see PLB 744? Uh, PRB well, well, the one plus I had negative results, right? It's both positive. I have positive? <laughs> <laughs> so, do we have other questions? <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, you said uh, your statistics will be better improved, but yeah. how about st systematic error? Can you improve the systematic error? Uh, you, you mean uh, systematic uncertainty? Systematic uncertainty? Yeah, I think the systematic can also be improved because we use some new detectors, for example, the ITPC in the round 2021. Uh -huh. So I think the uh, presentation of the data will be improved. So how, how much improvement do you expect? Uh, I think it's very... Yeah, that is a very important point, yes. This is very, you know, very difficult measurement uh, in terms of systematic uncertainty. Yeah, you want I to think know how well you can go, yeah. Yeah, I think it's hard to expect because this systematic also depends on, on the different corrections we applied. So yeah, yeah, right. uh, it can be... Uh, it can only be answered uh, when we do the analysis, so... Okay, so thank you. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. Please. So we have time for one short question. Maybe to go back on your reconstruction of the lambda, actually, because the one sees that there is kind Ooh. of a residual. Is, uh, how much is this residual mismatch with the PDG? Is of the order of 30 keV or something like this? Yes. Uh, uh, mm. you, you, you mean which one? The, 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 the one on the right. So you have the lambda invariant mass, the reconstructed, and you still see that you have a systematic, uh, a systematic uh, discrepancy yeah. with respect to the PDG. Yeah, yes. I, you might remember it's about uh, 30, 30 kV. 30 kV, okay. Yeah. Okay, it's very interesting because we see almost the same also in Alice. And the thing that is actually also interesting is when you do this uh, scaling with the magnetic field, uh, do you check uh, how much these uh, also affect like the reconstruction of K0 short, for instance? Uh, yes, we also uh, check the K short. The change is almost the same. It's also about uh, 30 kV. Okay. Okay, for us it is different. Okay. okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome to IP22. You may start. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? Uh, you have to uh, uh, turn uh, a bit uh, off your uh, mic. It's too loud. Okay. Now is it clear? Much better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, greetings to everyone. And I would like to uh, extend my thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present on exploration of in medium hyperion nuclear interactions in the HYPE 2022, and that too sitting from India. So uh, this work has been done in collaboration with host Lenske. So why in medium hyperion interaction is uh, important. We have in the last two days and also today we have uh, heard many talks referring to this very important hyperionization puzzle regarding neutron stars, creating this dilemma whether hyperion exists in neutron star core and that can sustain 
a higher solar mass or not. So in order to have a better understanding of this, more investigations on hyper and nuclear interaction and their medium properties would be a great tool to uh, this issue. And on the other hand, uh, recently there is a great improvement in the experimental facilities starting from heavy ion collisions to hypernuclear experiments all over the world, starting from J Park to J Lab and all the other MAMI, KEK and Hardness, Alice, etc. Star collaboration, whatever we are having such nice talks in the last two days and also today. So for all the experimental observation analysis also, it is important to have a better understanding of the dense, dense medium behavior of hypernuclear interaction. And nonetheless, any investigation on this sector will also shed light to the SU3 flavor symmetrical limit that is always crucial for uh, investigation for strong interaction. So with that motivation, we started working on this project already some time ago, which now is revived again in view of the promising experimental data that is either planned or commissioning in different uh, hypernuclear or hypernuclear scattering experiments. Now, how one can proceed in this problem? There are two possible processes. One is from the microscopic approach and the mean field one. So in this talk, I will mainly refer to the microscopic one for which we first will use one bare interaction that is actually one boson exchange type interaction built, in, built upon SU3 constraints. Then we will apply the medium effect to G matrix calculation method. And this can eventually can be used for investigation of the density functional or structure calculation. As a parallel approach of this medium effect studies, there exist this mean field approaches where one can directly derive the effective in medium coupling constants also using this SO3 relations. More on these aspects will be highlighted by Professor Horst Lenske tomorrow. So moving on to this uh, topic today. So for our uh, work, we first use the bare interaction because from microscopic approach, it is always advantageous to have more insight already from the bare interaction uh, channels. So for this, we have used one SU3 flavor interaction Lagrangian given in this form where this B is given the, uh, by the SU3 invariant variant matrices and phi are the corresponding Mason matrices. And G and alpha are the interaction constant, which are uh, obtained from the octet and singlet coupling constants, and alpha is given by the F by F plus D ratio. With this input, we have then derived our one boson exchange type potential that we have then inserted to solve the lipman schwinger type equation to find scattering observables. So with that recipe, these are our main model parameters with the mixing angle two, which is signifying the mixing of octet and singlet mixture of the isospin zero particles. So to be the, uh, a realistic model, we have also incorporated that. And also to tackle the divergence, we have used one dipole form factor. So for that, we have also one cutoff. And to fix the parameter, we have used the available data points, which are very less of knowing compared to the nucleon sector and compensated from the theory side by a SU3 flavor symmetry. Thus, we can call this as an effective hybrid model. So this, with this recipe, we have then applied our model uh, results to find out and match with the available cross-section data for sigma plus p and lambda plus p channel. Uh, as you can see in this plot with large error bars, these are from these references from this uh, bubble chamber data experiments. And for with this feed, we obtained a chi-square value of 6.68. Our main interest is actually studying the medium dependence. So we are interested more on uh, deriving one 
qualitative a backbone interaction for which we are quite satisfied with the outcome. And this is our parameter set that we will be even using for other hyperlink channels and in principle for the all SU3 symmetry uh, variant vertices. And as a test, we have also applied this to this available cross section of sigma minus p sigma zero in cross section. And we could conclude that we have obtained a good description of data in the vacuum or bare interaction level. So with that, now our main focus is to actually find the behavior of uh, this hyperion interaction in dense medium. That we have done using Pauli blocking through Bethe Goldstone equation, where we have applied all this Pauli projector is multiplied with the Green's function. Note that this is a, a self consistent equation where the interactions are nested. And in this process, the density dependence is mainly caused by the Pauli blocking. And this process is also referred to as the geometric approach. So now, having the recipe ready, it is time to test how the outcome is. So here, uh, to test the effect of medium on the bare interaction, we have calculated this sigma plus p cross section for one is zero channel where these are the data and the red line is referring to the vacuum interaction that we have uh, calculated using our bare interaction. And then when we applied nuclear saturation density and half nuclear saturation density as given by this green and blue lines, we can see a clear weakening of the strength of the interaction, which is mainly caused in this case by the Pauli blocking. Now in hypernuclear studies, it is always important to also study the channel mixing behavior, which is very exclusive to this sector. And it is therefore important to investigate if there is any effect of medium also in this particular channel mixing. So here, for the lambda S minus one, a lambda P sigma plus N uh, phase shift for one is zero, we can see that when the medium effect is applied, uh, which is given by here the red line and the blue one is referring to the bare interaction value, we can see this cusp, which is referring to the channel opening is actually suppressed when the medium is present. So therefore, we can conclude from these plots that the effect of medium is to suppressing the channel mixing. Now, in this sector of variant variant scattering, it is important and convenient to also determine the low energy parameters using this effective range expansion where we can find the scattering length and effective range values, which are very crucial in giving direct information of the interaction. So here in our case also, we have derived them both for the bare interaction and also in the in medium case. And what we found when we studied the variation of these parameters, when we change the medium density, or if we can also study in terms of the nuclear Fermi momentum, we, we see, have seen this kind of behavior. On the left side, it is referring to the effective range values for different S minus one and S minus two channel. The green one is for sigma plus P, the blue one is for lambda N and the red one is for sigma plus sigma plus. And on the top, we have density variation and in Below, we have the nuclear Fermi momentum variation. So here we can see the very, uh, it is prominent from this plot all over, or the, it is not a perfect straight line, but we can conclude from this variation that there is some density dependence always on these uh, hyper and nuclear interactions when we change or introduce density. And gradually, when we reach the saturation density, the 
change in behavior saturated so the del, uh, when the medium gets more condensed the uh, value or the interaction also is behaving like that and similar behavior we have found for scattering length which is plotted in right side for s minus 1 and s minus 2 channels and this is also showing different behaviors and channel dependent density variations for uh, the scattering length. So you can conclude from these studies that the variant variant mason interaction vertices are in case of dense medium are acting as a density dependent vertices and these are coming out as channel dependent behavior. Now as a the application of these low energy parameters there is very importantly we can also determine the variant mean fields as written here for the lambda case which are directly dependent or can be determined using the singlet and triplet scattering lens similarly we can also proceed for the other hyperonic mean fields like sigma and cascade mean fields for which also knowing this in medium scattering lens one can determine the baryonic mean fields of these sectors so the effective range item terms which we have already uh, uh, discussed in the previous slides showing the density or this lift of momentum dependence resulting to this baryonic mean field momentum dependence no point to note here is that we still have this lack of scattering data but hoping knowing about all these promising experiments that this will be solved in, on in a better way soon but at for the time being this is now uh, compensated by our available su3 relations so this brings to the summary of my talk where we have reported about one revised version of one boson exchange potential for the hyperons, which we then apply to find the nuclear or the dense medium behavior for the scattering amplitudes and also low energy parameters, which then we found as coming out as a functions of density. And this can be extended to find out the hypernic mean fields. As an outlook of this approach, uh, this dirac Bruckner, hartree vertex functional can be derived and then single particle potential can also be derived, which will be highlighted by Professor Hauslenske tomorrow. And as a future aspect of this work, we are planning to extend this, uh, our work to hypernuclei and hypermatter and in possible also to astrophysical aspects. So with that, I thank all of you for your attention and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present you. So thank you very much. Um, are there any questions in the audience? So if so, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, oh, sorry, I haven't shared my screen. But one second, we don't see yet uh, the slides. How about now? Much, much, much better. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, good and afternoon and you, thank you well, for this opportunity. One second, can you put on the camera so we can see you? Great.
Okay, uh, go do ahead. you see uh, how about now? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Vishnu Pandey from Hampton University, and uh, today I would like to present about our recent hypernuclear experiment at uh, Jefferson Lab. Actually, uh, Professor Chang already gave a presentation on the same topic, uh, so some more details can also be found from his uh, presentation. Okay. Anyway, the experiment is uh, uh, performed in the experimental hall A of Jefferson Lab in uh, November 2018. And uh, the data analysis is uh, completed and the result is recently published. So some more details can also be found from this uh, paper. Uh, here is the experimental uh, setup for the experiment uh, as a coincidence experiment both high resolution spectrometers were used to collect the experimental data. And here are our two kinematics. The high dozen kinematics with um, electron arm central momentum about 2.1 GeV was used for the calibration data. And then we had a tritium kinematics with electron arm central momentum about 2.218 GeV for production data. For both kinematics, the two spectrometers were symmetrically positioned at 13.2 uh, degree with respect to uh, the beam direction. And here are our uh, beam energy and, um, and beam current used for this experiment. Okay, uh, this is our tritium target system. Actually, uh, all of the tritium experiment used same, uh, same target system. So there are so many targets. Uh, but we did not take data with all of these targets. And here are some solid targets, for example, the empty cell target and the carbon multifoil target. Uh, we took production data with the tritium target, which is a gas target. So the gas was um, filled in a cylinder made of uh, 7075 aluminum alloy. The length of the cylinder was about 25 centimeter long, and it has a diameter of about 12.7 uh, millimeter. And the maximum uh, beam current allowed um, uh, to the tritium target was about uh, 22.5 microamp. Okay, well, uh, one uh, most important part of this study is the system optimization as the experiment requires a high precision measurement. So a lot of data was taken uh, to calibrate our system and making sure the system is working well. Uh, therefore, the whole system was optimized as much as uh, possible. Here, I, I would like to mention a few optimizations. For example, the G-Vertex optimization, HRS angle optimization, and the coincidence time optimization. All these optimizations were done carefully until they satisfy our um, experimental uh, requirement. Uh, for the momentum optimization, um, we used the known masses of lambda and the sigma zero, which were produced by our um, e, e prime k reaction, uh, just like the previous hypernuclear experiment um, at Jefferson lab. And uh, during the momentum optimization, when the resolution of lambda and sigma zero reached about 2 MeV in sigma, um, the further tune did not improve our optics quality, and we recognized two problems. The first one was the time jitter for the RHRS VDC, and the second one was the dependence on the residual angular uncertainties. Okay, uh, the slide shows the um, raw TDC spectrum for the RHRS. In the first histogram, uh, uh, there are two spectrums. The first one with blue, blue color is the RHRS single arm tr trigger mode, and the red colored spectrum is the coincidence trigger mode spectrum. And you can see there is a big disagreement between these two spectra. And this problem was minimized by applying a software correction on an event by event base to the raw TDC data. And after the correction, both of the spectrum were in a good agreement. Okay, then a simulation of a dependence of missing mass resolution was carried out. 
uh, to study the uncertainty contributions from the beam energy HRS movement and the scattering angles. Uh, in addition, the simulation was aimed to predict the missing mass resolution of A equal to 3 system. Uh, from the simulation, we noticed that the angular uncertainties are dominated for the light mass system, especially for A equal to 1. Uh, while the energy and the momentum uncertainties are dominated for the heavy mass system, especially above A greater than 7. So finally, the simulation suggested that to reach uh, the best uh, achievable resolution under our experimental condition, a heavy mass system with negligible angular dependence need to be involved in the matrix tune along with the non-masses of lambda and sigma zero. So the only possibility of involving such a heavy mass system was the 27 aluminum uh, because the target cell was made of uh, 27 aluminum. In the first histogram, there are two sharp peak structures. The first peak uh, belong to the uh, beam entrance aluminum window and the second peak is the beam exit aluminum window. So the event from these two aluminum end caps were selected and then combined together to produce the 27 magnesium lambda hypernuclei, which is the second spectrum. So to involve this data in, in the matrix tune along with the lambda and the sigma zero message, uh, a peak search test tune was performed to find the event from the possible single particle state. And after optimization, uh, it has a few interesting structures. And the second uh, slide is the, uh, I mean, second spectrum is the closer view of the first one, where we can see uh, three uh, interesting peak structures, and the two of them are in, in the bound region. Uh, the resolution of the bound peak uh, agreed well with our simulation. Okay, uh, this is the missing, missing mass spectrum obtained by hydrogen data in the two different kinematics. Uh, for the tritium kinematics, um, uh, the sigma zero was uh, out of acceptance so in the in the second histogram we were unable to see the uh, sigma zero event with the optimized system the lambda and the sigma zero were landed at their non masses with a separation of uh, um, 76.87 mev over c squared and which is very close to the nominal separation the achieved resolution of lambda and the sigma zero also agreed well with the simulation okay uh, this is the lambda newton newton spectrum in this spectrum on the bottom there is a magenta color distribution which is the helium uh, contamination above the helium contamination there is a blue solid curve with a long radiative tail and this represent the three lambda from hydrogen contamination there is a green a distribution formed by the green crosses uh, which represent the accidental background distribution and above which is dominated mainly by the event from the lambda quasi-free distribution, sigma quasi-free productions, as well as some event from free lambda from hydrogen contamination. Uh, here the red dotted, uh, red dotted curve represent the lambda quasi-free distribution on the top of the lambda quasi-free distribution, there is another red solid curve, which is a free lambda from hydrogen contamination. And around the tail of the free lambda, there is another uh, solid curve, which is a um, sigma quasi-free distribution. The lambda and the sigma quasi-free distribution functions are obtained by fitting uh, the sim a simulated data and the sim a is a jefferson lab hall a standard simulation package the simulation used the helium 3 spectral function uh, where the final state interaction is not included and the free um, lambda curve is obtained by fitting uh, the hydrogen data in in the tritium kinematics and uh, finally this is our interesting region uh, which is the lambda newton newton threshold region okay this slide shows the closer view of the lambda newton newton spectrum and there is a small peak structure which is possible to be the expected resonance for which the experiment was looking for the fitting shows that peak is located slightly toward the resonance region 
uh, a simulation predicted the intrinsic uh, intrinsic missing mass resolution of a equal to three resonance to be sigma equal to 1.21 MeV, and uh, therefore its natural width is about 0 0.35 MeV. The statistical significance of this peak is about 2.7, uh, which is not sufficient enough to permit a definite identification. There is another broad Gaussian, which doesn't mean anything, but just taking care of the extra strength appeared above the lambda quasi-free distribution. Okay. The same mass spectroscope is again floated with the wider bins to reduce the statistical fluctuation. And with the wider winds, we noticed that there are some excess of event above the lambda quasi-free distribution. Okay. And this is the closer view of the lambda neutron neutron spectrum with the wider winds. And there are two enhancements uh, near the sigma and, and threshold lines. And these enhancement might be the signature of the sigma and N hypernuclei, which has been predicted long ago. However, the statistics is not sufficient to solidly confirm this observed state. Since the spectral function for helium and um, helium-3 and the tritium are different, the predicted quasi-free distribution functions may not be accurate, and this may actually affect, um, affect the interpretation of our observation. Uh, to conclude, the experiment demonstrates that by using the tritium target and the EE prime K reaction, it is possible to observe the three body neutral lambda and the sigma hypernuclei. However, our experimental system need to be optimized for higher statistics. Uh, from this experiment, one is small enhancement near the lambda and n threshold and the two enhancement near the sigma and n uh, threshold are observed. However, to make a definite identification, higher statistics are required. For more details, uh, the more details can be found from uh, from uh, our recently published paper, which can be found online. And thank you for, for your attention. So thank you very much for this nice talk. Are there any questions? Um, I have one question. Is there a <coughs> renewed experiment planned with the better statistics? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't he hear you. Could you repeat it again? Do you plan to repeat the experiment with better statistics? Yeah, actually, we proposed it uh, last year. The, it is conditionally approved, and we are, we are again, uh, again proposing it soon. Okay, thank you very much. Good luck with that. Thank you. Thank so you let's so thank the speaker again. So do we have another speaker? Yes. Hi, Ben. Uh, you need to share your screen so we can see your slides. Can you share your screen so we can see your slides? I'm trying to accomplish that. Thanks. OK. 
Can you see the slides now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Very good. Just make it into a, a presentation mode. Control L. Hey. <clears throat> so I would like to uh, discuss the question of the sigma NN structure that was. It would be more convenient if you could go talk. into presentation mode with your PDF reader. Maybe Control L can do it or. Sorry, Jerry, I didn't hear what you said. If you try Control L or just uh, change the presentation, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, the PDF into presentation mode. Which one? I guess you can minimize the screen by hitting the minus sign so that you can minimize a bit the screen you. so we can see. Uh, This is something in your PDF reader. Okay, this one, try to this one. Okay. Okay, go ahead with that. When can you start? I will try. I'm trying to. Uh... So, sorry, this is just a brief outline of the comments that I plan to make. Um, I would like to mention <clears throat> the tritium experiment that uh, was in the previous talk by Ben. And I would like to emphasize the structure that lies above the lambda neutron neutron resonance that they saw. I will uh, briefly discuss the fact that there is no T equal to sigma NN resonance. I will look at the possible resonances at T equal zero and one and discuss the model results that we have uh, produced. So, the uh, experiment <clears throat> was motivated by the IPHI collaboration report of a bound state of the three neutron lambda system. Uh, theoretically, the possibility of such a bound state seems quite remote. Uh, and therefore, the search really is for the resonance near threshold, which would lead us <clears throat> to a nice constraint on the lambda neutron scattering length, which has not been measured. So this is just the reference to the Pandy et al. FISRA FC letter. Now, the emphasis and this talk is about the two other structures which were observed at higher energies on the other side of the hydrogen peak. And these were interpreted to be possible sigma NN resonances. 
And I want to focus on the narrower structure closer to the sigma NN threshold. Um, in the paper by Pandy et al. referenced above, it was suggested that this should be a T1 resonance based on the calculation by Hirata and Hirabashi. Uh, we would like to suggest that it's just as likely that it's a T equal zero resonance. Um, <clears throat> the history of this is essentially that uh, in 1993, Afnan et al. found a resonance, a near threshold of T equals zero resonance while exploring lambda deuteron elastic scattering. Now, this uh, calculation was based on a separable potential model, including lambda nucleon, sigma nucleon, couple channel interaction. Uh, a decade later, in 2007, Garcia Lazo and collaborators utilized a separable potential approximation to a specific chiral constituent quark model of the hyperon nucleon interaction. And they concluded that the T equal zero and T equal one spin one half channels in the sigma nucleon nucleon system were the only attractive channels. Um, only the T1 channel was a sufficiently attractive to support a near threshold resonance. That was because the energy region that they scanned was very limited, so they did not see any resonance pole in the T0 channel. <clears throat> now, since the work we did in 1993, we've gone back and performed additional calculations using that same code, uh, which was actually developed earlier for the hypertriton investigations that we did. I'll come back to the results and details, but briefly what we find is both a T equal zero and a T equal one resonance. And they're closely, or their pole positions are very close to one another. And it's unlikely that they can be distinguished experimentally. Uh, other background information that's relevant. In 1992, there was an experiment performed at Brookhaven looking for a sigma nucleon nucleon resonance. Uh, that was a null search, they found nothing. In 2014, Harada et al. performed a distorted wave impulse approximation calculation that agreed with that null result, no resonance. However, their model results indicated that one should see a T equal one resonance in the in-flight helium-3 K minus pi minus reaction. So as I know, noted previously, uh, we had in 1993 found that there should be T equals zero resonance. And Garcia Lazo et al. published in 2007 model results su suggesting that there should exist a T equal one resonance in the sigma, near the sigma nucleon nucleon threshold. So if we compare the FIDEF calculations, uh, in the work that we did in 1993, we had a T equal zero pole, which is as a real part of 75.46 MeV, and therefore lies near the sigma NN nucleon nucleon threshold, which in our model is at 77 MeV. We did not distinguish in our calculation the various charge states of the sigma. In the Garcia Lazo et al. approximation, as I said before, they found an isospin one, J equal one half resonance, which lies close to the sigma B threshold. And because they limited their search region for resonance structure, the T equals zero spin one half channel did not 
support a resonance in their paper. Now, our recent calculations find a T equal one pole at 76.81 MeV, which is quite close to the 75.46 T equal zero pole. It's closer to the sigma NN threshold than the T equal zero pole, but the pole positions are close, so close to one another that they would be difficult to, ex to distinguish experimentally. Now the garcia lazo model result is a bit more sophisticated and it includes a tensor force in both the NN and YN interactions. However, in the garcia lazo calculation, although they had a tensor force, they did not include an L equal two spectator function. We have included the tensor force now in our in interaction along with the L equal two spectator pole. The result is that the two poles that we have found, T equal zero and T equal one, move slightly closer to the sigma in N threshold, but their relative positions remain unchanged. So in summary, I would like to say what we have found are our primary conclusion from our model calculations are one, that one should see both a T equal zero resonance as well as a T equal one resonance in the electroproduction from tritium experiment looking in the region of the sigma nucleon nucleon spectrum very near the threshold. Our second conclusion is that the two resonances will likely reside too close to one another to be easily separated experimentally, but they would account for a strong strength that one seems to see in the Pandy et al. experiment that I mentioned earlier. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, this is Nui speaking. So uh, is there any way to estimate or guess the how much the uh, event uh, can be expected for such kind of resonance when we perform the experiment or uh, can we check the uh, consistency between the, this picture and the uh, uh, the spectrum so that the enhancement. Uh, so we would like to have some, some guess or the guide uh, for the some number of the events we, how much, yeah. What one would actually need to do uh, an electroproduction calculation to get a good estimate of the cross section, mm -hmm. the sizes of the resonances. I believe that Harada could actually do that mm -hmm. in a fairly simple modification mm -hmm. of his K minus pi mm -hmm. minus uh, in flight distorted wave impulse approximation mm -hmm. calculation. I see. That is, I believe he could. He could generate for you the estimate that you're asking for faster than uh, mm -hmm. uh, Afnan and I could create a code which would mm -hmm. provide a valid calculation mm -hmm. for electroproduction. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank organizer of the hype to uh, invite me to this very beautiful conference. It's always very nice to uh, return to Prague. Come back home. Come back home. Exactly. So uh, during this talk, uh, what I would like to talk about is charge symmetry breaking, which was somehow addressed also, let's say, during today, during 
few uh, topics. And basically, here, uh, let's say as a first slide, I put something, let's say, obligatory, which is basically current experimental status, which is basically that we have a sizable charge symmetry breaking in zero plus ground state, and uh, while, let's say, one plus excited state, there is actually pretty small. Uh, basically, it is small, but also, let's say, these experimental errors which are there, they basically also include basically zero, so no, no charge symmetry breaking in this one plus uh, excited states. So then, having this ex experimental status, there have been, let's say, multiple works which have been done basically since uh, 70s, where actually it starts with, let's say, Dalit's uh, von Hippel mechanism, where actually they propose that, let's say, this strong contribution to, let's say, ground state charge symmetry breaking can be somehow induced by allow allowing uh, lambda sigma zero mixing in SU3 flavor. So then, let's say later on, this, let's say, mechanism was somehow generalized uh, in a publication of Abraham, where actually he somehow generalized it to apply it generally for, let's say, any uh, to, to a lambda and sigma and mixing potential. And then he actually obtained that uh, zero plus ground state can have, let's say, 240 keV, roughly. Uh, and then one plus excited state can have roughly 35 keV. So then uh, also, uh, let's say later on in let's say next publication, there was uh, there, there's a contribution or series or two papers of uh, Daniel who is sitting here and Abraham, where what they actually were done is that actually they use, let's say this generalized formula. And uh, what they did, they actually took all, let's say lambda and sigma, uh, lambda and sigma and let's say parts of uh, car EFT leading order interaction, and then they actually included, let's say, non-perturbatively this charge symmetry breaking in their calculations. So what they did, what they got is basically that, uh, let's say, the zero plus ground state can be roughly 180 uh, plus minus 130 keV, and then they got actually negative and but sizable, let's say, charge symmetry breaking in one plus excited state, but still it, uh, it is to be noted that it is within experimental, let's say, that it like it is in experimental uncertainties also uh, with the experimental predictions. So then uh, there is a newest, let's say, paper which has been published, uh, let's say, last year, which, uh, let's say, introduce uh, charge symmetry breaking in a slightly different manner. So what they do, they basically uh, so mention also during, let's say, this morning, but just to, let's say, summarize, so what they do, they actually try, let's say, two different mechanisms or several different mechanisms uh, where actually first one is to really include charge symmetry breaking using uh, basically spion or uh, let's say eta exchange using that is the Hippel mechanism. And there they actually find, let's say, let's say something, let's say interesting that basically if you include it into a four body system, you got relatively small charge symmetry breaking and moreover with opposite sign. So then uh, what they actually did, they introduced uh, in their uh, car EFT, let's say NLO uh, model, they in introduced uh, contact terms. And these contact terms were actually fitted, uh, they call it, let's say, charge symmetry breaking one. Uh, they were fitted directly to charge symmetry breaking in four body systems. So what then they did after, or what they got, are basically here, let's say those, let's say charge symmetry breaking low energy constants, which are somehow characterized, let's say in a way, if we can, if we, let's say, take a look on this, let's say, spin singlet, so the spin singlet is actually larger than in spin triplet, roughly, let's say, order of magnitude or half based on, let's say, which cutoff is basically chosen. And also there is actually a different sign in these, let's say, low energy constants. So then what they did, since they, let's say, fitted this low energy constant, they, let's say, predicted, let's say, uh, scattering lengths. So, so what I'm going to, let's say, talk, let's say, during this, uh, during this contribution is basically how we introduce charge symmetry breaking in pionless EFT. Uh, also, I will make, let's say, prediction for scattering lens, but then I will go somewhere, let's say, let's say beyond that. So, and we, I actually show that, let's say, using SU3 flavor symmetry, we can somehow, let's say, extract this isospin, let's, uh, isospin one admixture, which was, let's say, on the, on the second slide and uh, thus, let's say, somehow explain where actually this, let's say, charge symmetry breaking uh, comes from. So, Pioneer EFT was uh, already presented, let's say, today during, let's say, near stock, so I'm just here showing that basically there can be nuclear part, hypernuclear part, 
In our calculation, we fit everything to explicitly charge symmetric input. So then, uh, basically, we take some charge symmetric average of triton helium-3 without Coulomb, and also uh, lambda separation energy of helium-4 uh, helium lambda and hydrogen-4 lambda. So then, what we actually do, we include, let's say, charge symmetry breaking through, let's say, this mechanism that this uh, charge symmetric let's, uh, leading order lambda and low energy constants also with this projector we can see that we can actually write them as a contribution or as a sum of really low energy constants in lambda proton and lambda neutron. So then if we make, oh, sorry, if we make, let's say, this transformation, we can actually, we can actually see that this lambda and potential can be written again in this, let's say, leading order charge symmetric part, and then in this, let's say, charge symmetry breaking part, where you can see that here is this, uh, basically, this isospin operator, which, of course, let's say, somehow flips the sign if there's, let's say, proton or a neutron. So here, within our approach, what we do is that actually leading order is iterated. It's included, basically, non-perturbatively, but charge symmetry breaking is all, let's say, in all our, our calculation is included perturbatively. So then, uh, where we can fit our, let's say, these, let's say, two new uh, low energy constants, charge symmetry low energy constants. So we have these two experimental values and since we have, let's say, simple, let's say, perturbation theory, we can just write, let's say, this uh, system of two, let's say, homogeneous equation, and we can directly connect these, these charge symmetry breaking low energy constant with, let's say, these experimental values, where these are some, let's say, expectation values which were uh, calculated using charge symmetry leading order pioneer EFT. So doing so, uh, yeah. doing so, we actually extract, we then extract these uh, charge symmetry low energy constants and what we, what we actually get that uh, somehow in agreement what was, let's say, previously reported by uh, Heidenbauer et al. is that basically this sing, uh, spin singlet uh, charge symmetry breaking low energy constants are larger than in triplet and of, of also what we can see that they are mostly or predominantly an opposite sign where actually these, let's say, bands, which are here in these low energy constants, they come from experimental uncertainties of, the, of this charge symmetry breaking observable, of this, uh, what I shown before. So then, what we can do, we can proceed in more or less the same way. We can use, let's say, distorted wave on approximation and perturbatively include this charge symmetry breaking into, uh, uh, let's say, into our prediction for charge symmetric uh, scattering length. And what we get is basically that charge symmetry breaking mainly affects basically spin singlet. And it makes lambda n interaction actually more attractive. Lambda proton on the opposite, let's say, less attractive. And basically, it hardly affect, uh, hardly, uh, hardly affect, let's say, spin triplet. And hardly, and also we, we can see that also mostly an opposite sign. So then if we, let's say, compare our predictions with, let's say, paper, uh, let's say, results of CAR EFT, we can show, we can see here on the right side that basically our predictions for this, let's say, charge symmetry breaking, it basically is on top of, let's say, CAR EFT results. So this actually tells us something that basically, since we include some, let's say, our results in perturbation, in perturbation theory, that actually our, let's say, leading order charge symmetry, let's say, wave function of four-body system is actually include, let's say, all, let's say, relevant physics. So it's, yeah, it's, you can see that these, let's say, results are more or less the same. So what then? I mean, we somehow, let's say, arrived, let's say, to this point where we actually saw, okay, like spin singlet is, let's say, much larger. We see that uh, lambda neutron is basically uh, stronger than lambda proton. Spin triplet is, let's say, hardly, uh, is basically weaker with mostly opposite sign. So where does it come from, let's say this? I mean, so far, this was just, let's say, fitting four-body system, so it somehow, let's say, comes out, comes out let's say, naturally. So, but there, is there some, let's say, mechanism how to, uh, how to, let's say, how to explain this? And where actually, uh, into this, let's say, into this approach, where actually enters, let's say, this dialysis von Hippel mechanism, which was somehow uh, suggested before? So then what we actually can do uh, we can use dialysis von Hippel mechanism to, let's say, connect this charge symmetry breaking lambda and uh, constants in, uh, let's say, spin singlet and spin triplet through this, let's say, isospin one at mixture amplitude with uh, lambda and sigma n low energy constant. So here we can see 
somehow, let's say, traditional, let's say, diagram. In our, let's say, formalism, it is basically a contact term, where we have lambda n, sigma n, and then sigma basically uh, through, let's say, this admixture, it basically becomes lambda, lambda n. So basically here we have lambda n, lambda n charge multibreaking potential. So okay, so this is first step. So we somehow, let's say, derive, let's say, this uh, lambda n sigma n low energy constant, but then what? So what we can do, we can actually use a uh, result of uh, Dover and Feshbach, and we can relate basically these, we can relate this lambda and sigma and low energy constants with our NN and lambda N low energy constants. So now this can be done because our theory basically use same regulator. It's basically both uh, nuclear interaction and lambda interaction is treated, let's say, in the same way. So then we can really, uh, we can really, let's say, uh, we can basically write in this way, and then what we can do, we can in return express this basically isospin one ad admixture, which was before previously uh, predicted by Do uh, Dalis von Hippel. So if we do so, we can see that basically for isospin zero, which is on the top, uh, which is on the upper part, that most, most of our, let's say, that all our, let's say, results basically lie, let's say, around this, let's say, Dialis von Hippel prediction, of course. Here we can see that there is rather large experimental uncertainty, which is basically introduced by experimental data. So if we would have, let's say, more precise input, then, uh, let's say, these bands would be smaller. And then also for triplet, so here we can see that once we go to, to larger cutoff, also this, let's say, uh, that is one Hippel uh, prediction basically lies within our, let's say, uh, within our predictions. So, okay, so these, these are, let's say, these are so far our predictions with rather large, ex let's say, uncertainties. But can we do, let's say, something else? I mean, can we use another, let's say, constraint? So there is basically a difference between, between this, uh, in this, between this uh, gamma transition in helium for lambda and hydrogen for lambda which have much smaller experimental uncertainties. It's basically plus minus 20 keV. So then, okay, we can do again, then we have just one, let's say, constraint. We have two low energy constants of charge symmetry breaking. And then we can use, we can assume that basically this A1 and uh, the spin, uh, singlet and spin uh, triplet are basically the same. And then we can connect this, uh, this uh, isospin one admixture which with, let's say, this, uh, let's say, with, in this formula with this delta E gamma. So if we do it, so then we can see that basically all, let's say, these, these error bands, let's say, sh suddenly are get, let's say, much smaller. And we can see that basically this, our predictions for uh, isospin one admixture, they very nicely with increasing cutoff, they, they converge uh, either to, let's say, predictions of lattice QCD or like in all cases, in a, let's, in a, in a, are there in agreement with prediction of lattice QCD, and in most cases also with, let's say, quite precise Dalis von Hippel value. So here, there is, let's say, our, there is our values with lambda going to infinity. Here is, let's say, recent lattice QCD, let's say, result. And here is uh, predictions of uh, Dalis von Hippel. So, to summarize, or to say, let's say, let's say a few words regarding the conclusion. So what we did, we included uh, charge symmetry breaking in uh, leading order pionless EFT. It has been done fully perturbatively. I, let's say, showed you that, uh, let's say, all our prediction basically behave well. We, we have, let's say, RG invariance. Uh, what we saw is basically there is stronger lambda N and weaker lambda, uh, lambda proton uh, interaction has been singlet. It's a uh, spin triplet is hardly affected, mostly opposite. And what we actually did then, we extracted this in medium lambda isospin impurities, which are basically more or less uh, in agreement with free space predictions. And what is, let's say, the most important message here, that this, the whole procedure can be actually applied in reverse. So if we, let's say, take Dialis von Hippel value in the free space, we can then basically generate this uh, charge symmetry breaking lower energy constants and then predict, let's say, charge symmetry breaking for body systems. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Martin. Um, we have time for questions. Do we have questions? 
I mean, there is a chart symmetry conserving lambda sigma mixing just from the SU3 vertices. Yes. And that uh, turns the lambda n into a superposition of lambda n and lambda sigma components, so sigma zero certainly. And uh, so that means that is going to influence probably also your chart symmetry breaking because then the lambda has uh, a different internal structure. Uh, well, is there I any mean, idea how that would affect I'm, the chart symmetry breaking? Well, I mean, in our calculation, basically lambda exists as a superposition of isospin zero and isospin one quantity. So then, then yeah, so then. Well, no, I mean, uh, the lambda n, so isospin is conserved. The yes, yes. The lambda n system has isospin one half, and the sigma n system also have isospin one half. So, but still, yes. you have yes. a superposition of these two components just by this particular SU3 interaction. Yes, and, that, and this, so is, this, is what, this is why we basically include this uh, dallas von Hippel mechanism, this, uh, let's say, this... Uh, Vertex, which is which is uh, displayed here. I, I'm not sure. Ah, uh, okay. And and you can see this. There is this isospin one admixture amplitude, which I actually defined in the very beginning. Probably I should actually repeat it. So this actually comes from, uh, yeah, this SU free flavor uh, yeah. admixture between lambda and sigma. Okay, so you include that. I see. Yes. Okay. Any more questions? I have a question on slide 13, the one before the last one. Yes. Yeah, that, for example, here, if I understood it correctly, the band structure is the error estimation from the cutoff from your calculation, right? No, 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 no. no? So, so this error band, basically, in our calculation, we were, let's say, able to increase, let's say, such precision that basically numerical, some uncertainties or model uncertainties from few-body calculations are negligible. Okay, so, so but these, then these why? errors are just from, let's say, experimental input. Okay. But do you understand why in one case you had to plot there in one case and the errors are small for the small cutoff, but in the other case it's like constant? Y yes, it's uh, somehow it's related with the fact that uh, with, let's say, increasing cutoff, these, let's say, low energy constants, they become, let's say, larger because they scale somehow with uh, lambda to the power of, I think, three or three half, something like that. So then this is just then effectively this error which actually propagates inside somehow, let's say, gets larger. So this is just, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the, 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 this kind of, let's say, numerics. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. to everyone. Let me thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk about the measurement of the hypertriton lifetime and production at the LHC. That essentially means uh, measurement at the ELIS experiment because the ELIS experiment is the only experiment at the Large Hadron Collider that can uh, uh, play a role in the hypernuclei measurement. Let's start from uh, a very brief picture of the upper triton because uh, most of you already know very well of what I'm talking about. Essentially, the upper triton is a bound state of a neutron and proton and a lambda. And uh, in the last calculation, the hyper triton is approximated to a bound state of a deuteron core in which uh, the wave function of the lambda has a radius of the order of 10 femtometer. That, that means that we can see to these bound states as uh, a two-body halo nucleus. And uh, why we are interested in particular in the hyper triton lifetime and uh, the binding energy measurement, essentially because Thanks to this measurement and also thanks also to the production, we'll see how we can uh, better understand the structure of this object. 
most of the prediction assumed a very low bonding energy, how about 130 keV, which means that you have uh, a lifetime which is close to the one of the lambda three. And at the same time, if you look to the last, uh, let's say, latest models based on the EFT, you have some prediction of the lifetime as function of the binding energy. Let's see now how the measurement I will show you will, uh, let's say, uh, compare with this uh, prediction. When we talk about the hypertriton and LHC, the hypernuclei, sorry, and you look to the, the lambda hypernuclear chart, essentially we mean uh, up to now, we mean uh, uh, essentially measurement of the hypertriton of the anti-hypertriton because the anti-hypernuclei are accessible in the uh, AVI ion collision. And what I will show you are essential results from the study of the two body decay of the hypertriton and the anti-hypertriton. This is, uh, as uh, we already heard this morning, a very unique probe, in particular for what concerns the link that you have uh, uh, between the lambda nuclear interaction that you can study thanks to the upper triton and the implication that this has also, for example, in field like uh, the astrophysics, in particular to better understand how the neutron star can be, uh, let's say, uh, predicted. And then also from the point of view of the particle physics, to study the production of the hypernuclei can give us more insight on the study of the dronic phase of the AVI ion collision. And essentially when we compare our result with the, with the models, we compare with two classes of model, the statistical hadronization model that Maximilian explained very well already on Monday, in which essentially the absolute yield of the hadron are predicted starting from the same volume at the same temperature, temperature at the chemical freeze out, and then to the coalescence model in which differently for, from the uh, thermal model, the system size plays a role. So that's the main difference, let's say, or some of the difference of these two models. Let's now see uh, where uh, where do we stand? Essentially, uh, if we uh, look to the recent result, uh, in particular from STAR, in particular from this uh, reference, the uh, measurement of the life, the binding energy predict was, uh, was done, and the measurement was uh, of uh, binding energy of about 410 uh, keV. That means that essentially, from, this, from that measure, we can expect that the triton is more compact than what we expect. At the same time, if you look to the comparison of that measurement with the theoretical prediction, you see there is a tension with the theoretical model. So this means that we also need to have a more precise measurement in order to uh, better understand the structure of the upper triton. And uh, in particular, if we look uh, uh, then also to uh, the production of this uh, object and we compare with the result, we can uh, study in particular what is reported in this plot on your left, which is the ratio between the production, the yield of the hypertriton and the lambda, essentially because we don't have absolute uh, yields when we uh, have the coalescence prediction, that, so that's why we look to the ratio. And here you have the last result of Helis in lead lead collision 2.76 TV. And you can see that if you compare with the two black lines, which correspond to the uh, thermal model with two different uh, uh, correlation volume, and then you compare also with the, the uh, blue lines, uh, which correspond to the body and the free body coalescence approach, you can see that essentially you are not able to disentangle uh, between, uh, uh, let's say, the, the two. That's why it becomes very important to try to look to this uh, region in which we have a low multiplicity, in which means uh, study a smaller system than the lead lead system. And that's why we already have, and I will show you, the results from P lead at high and high multiplicity PP collision, because this means that we can, uh, when we compare the result with the theoretical model, which have a, better, uh, let's say, high difference in this low uh, charted multiplicity uh, region, we can better understand the production mechanism in, of this object in the hot, dense matter that we produce at the LHC. Let's start from the upper triton in the large system, so in lead-red collision. Just a very brief uh, uh, overview on, on how we measure the upper triton. Essentially, as I, I already told you, we look to the two body decays in helium and pions. Here you have a sketch of the topology of the decay. 
And essentially what we do, we try to make a matching of the helium of the pion tracks coming from a common secondary vertex. In order to do so, we can make some selection of the distance of the cross approach between the two tracks, between the tracks and also the secondary and the primary vertex. And uh, once we talk of a decay in which a pion is included in a VIO collision, this means that you have a lot of pion and this starts rays also in a very huge combinatorial background. That's why, apart from, let's say, near direction, now we are exploded already a machine learning technique in order to better classify the hypertritokine that's candidate that can be considered a signal and those that can be considered background in order to enhance the signal significance. Once we have reconstructed the candidates and after hopefully applying some correction, for example, for the detection uh, um, efficiency and the detector acceptance and also for the absorption of the hypertriton in the detector material, we can then uh, divide our, uh, let's say, yield in nine different CT bin. This is the corrected final spectrum uh, fitted with this uh, orange uh, function, which is an exponential function, in order to extract the lifetime value from the fit. And we have a statistical uncertainty of about 60%, a systematic uncertainty, which is of the same order. And if we plot the value that we extract from this uh, exponential fit, in this, uh, let's say, overview plot, you see that uh, the last uh, result from Helis in lead red collision of 5TV, which is reported here in red, is the most precise measurement that have been done so far. This is compared with all the experimental results reported in black. In particular, uh, in, red, in um, green, you have the latest uh, star measurement, and in blue, the previous Helis measurement. And as you can see, the measurement is compatible also with the latest star measurement, but in particular, what is very important is that uh, it is, uh, when if you compare this measurement with a different theoretical approach that we have at disposal, in particular the latest one, you can see that uh, we are uh, in agreement with uh, those theoretical approach in which uh, it is predicted the lifetime which is close to the lambda one. So this means that our measurement is a strong hint for uh, having an hypertriton which is uh, weakly bound. Obviously, in order to have uh, a strongest message, we need to complement the measurement of the lifetime with the measurement of the binding energy. So this is what uh, we did. And in order to measure the binding energy, we first uh, measurement the, measure the hypertriton mass in uh, the same uh, collision system. The measurement is performed in the same nine CT bin that I showed you before for the lifetime, and the analysis technique is uh, obvious, is the same. And also in this case, we have an extremely precise measurement, also a systematic uncertainty is of the order of uh, 100 kV, and taking the measurement of the mass, which is reported here with uh, the black line, and you have the statistical, the systematical uncertainty reported with these two uh, different band, then we can go to the measurement of the B lambda. And as you can see, the measurement of Ellis is reported here in, uh, in red. The B lambda that we measured is compatible with zero, so also in this case we have a confirmation also uh, for of what we already saw with the lifetime measurement. And it is also in agreement with uh, the theoretical prediction in which you have the prediction, for example, for the chiral EFT and also in agreement with the theoretical prediction delits. And here you have the comparison also with uh, uh, the latest measurement from uh, STAR. So essentially what we see is uh, uh, both from the lifetime point of view and also uh, from the binding energy that uh, we can, uh, let's say, go for a weakly bound uh, state. Now, if we go to the small system, because I show you that it is now becoming a key measurement in order to explore also better the production mechanism of these uh, uh, hypernuclei in the, the IV ion collision, we analyze the PP collision data sample that we collected at 13 TV, and also the P LED collision at 5 TV. And uh, what we had at disposal, in particular for the proton proton collision, was a trigger on the high multiplicity because 
both in proton-proton and PLED collision, the production yield is much more suppressed with respect to the lead-lead collision. So that's why a trigger and the high multiplicity events helped a lot. And also in this case, we applied the machine learning technique in particular for the signal extraction in PLED collision. And what we get, here you have the plot of the hypertriton measurement in PLED collision. You can see in uh, uh, blue the signal plus the background and uh, the fit in red of the background. And the significance of this measurement is uh, greater than four sigma, both from PIP, lead collision, and also for uh, PP. Once we extract uh, the yield, we can go back to what I showed you in the first slide, so the ratio between the hypertriton yield and the lambda yield. And here you can see in red and in orange the measurement performed in P-LED collision and PP collision of high multiplicity respectively. And the measurement, both measurements are in good agreement in particular, as you can see here, with the two-body coalescence, so where you have a lambda plus a deuteron. And it seems that uh, if we look to the comparison with the thermal model, the thermal model has not catch the result for this uh, small colliding system, different for what uh, happened, let's say, for the lead-lead uh, collision. We also, I, must, I also must say that, uh, in particular, this thermal model is a quite simply, let's say, simply, simple one. So probably also in this sense, we need more uh, uh, development. Apart from the ratio, another important uh, uh, measurement that we performed for uh, all the colliding system was uh, the measurement of the S3. The S3 is this double ratio, so it's the strangeness population factor. And you always have in uh, uh, black the prediction for the two different correlation volume from the, the thermal model, and then also the comparison with the two uh, body and free body coalescence model. And also in this case, even if this measurement due to, in particular, to uh, the uncertainty on the PLED uh, result is probably as a lower sensitivity with respect to the ratio of the yield, you can see that if we look to the uh, comparison of a spring small system, there is an agreement on what we have already seen of the ratio which I showed you before. So what for sure we need is more data in order also to have a more sensitive, let's say, uh, measurement for the S3. Here you have just a projection of what we will get in the LHC run tree, which is the run that just started. And this will be crucial because essentially here you have the prediction for the lead-lead collision. You can also see the prediction for the different models. This can for sure help us to have a better insight on the production mechanism of the hypernuclei. And we will also have the possibility to explore A equal to 4, for example, that is not feasible with the data that we have up to date. So I hope that I convince you that in the last, let's say, decade, many results for the upper triton measurement came from the avian collision. Helis have performed a very precise measurement, the, more pre the most precise one for the lifetime, and we have also a precise measurement of the B-lambda, which confirm the weekly nature, let's say, of uh, weekly bound nature of the upper triton. We also have performed the first measurement in small colliding system, like proton-proton and P-LED. And in particular, these two colliding systems seems to be a very good, uh, let's say, outdoor in order to distinguish with a better significance between the two production mechanisms that we compare to in the ion collision. So let's stay tuned for the next round. Thank you. So thank you for a beautiful talk. Thanks. Um, do we have questions? Can you show the page eight when you show the PP and P led? Yeah, this there is just PLED. The point is that you accumulate the antimatter also in the peak. We accumulate? You are the upper triton and the anti upper triton in yes. the spectrum. Yes, because the ratio of the two hills is equal to one at our chemical. Yeah, yeah, but the point is there you extract some significance that is with the antimatters, 
and then when you look to the ratio with lambda, the next page, yeah. then, then, then you need to extract the correct shields for the matter part. What, what do you mean? Yeah, this is the point. So then you are comparing the first point that is the normal matters or ratio with the lambda, and then the next one with accumulating the antimatters and the matter for increasing you your the, shields. For the, lead, for the lead with respect to the lead lead? Yeah. So the point is, I mean, it's mis misleading to just have the one point with just a pure matter hypernuclei and the other one having the two matter and antimatter accumulated you just to increase the shields. It's not for that, it doesn't matter. No, I mean. The calculation, we assume that maybe it's zero, so it doesn't matter. So it's just You can simply, yes. Because you take all the particles and the particles. But it's also true for the concept. Yeah, yeah but then, then, you go, then you go to S3, and S3 is, you need to take care of helium-3 anti, antimatters and then the antiprotons. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I just, if you want to show four sigma for a signal, you should not accumulate the two antimatters. Why? Because the previous plots no. I mean, show you that you, you don't you show the antimatters together. It doesn't, it doesn't matter here. If you show the first uh, invariant mass of the beginning of the plot, you are showing the invariant mass with we fought on antimatter one. Okay, I suggest that uh, we will continue this discussion uh, okay. in the coffee or over beer. Any other questions? If so, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for coming here, and I appreciate uh, letting me talk in this conference in Prague. Thank you so much. This is um, my presentation. I'm, I'm, I am Fumia Ora from Tohoku University. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the development of a uh, triple coincidence of triple coincidence method of uh, reaction, gamma ray, and weak decay uh, in the hypernuclear gamma ray spectroscopy at j -Park. First of all, I'd like to talk about the motivations of my study. Uh, first, first of all, charge symmetry breaking uh, in the four-body four systems of hyperons and nucleons between H4 lambda and the helium 4 lambda. As you know, the, uh, the size of our charge symmetry breaking is, uh, is yeah, in the, uh, and uh, the uh, mechanism of the, mechan mechanism of the J effect is uh, still unclear. So we have to study the mechanism for understanding deeply value-value uh, -value interactions. Our group in the past uh, measured the, uh, the energy of the uh, gamma ray from helium for lambda. Here, this transition energy we measured. And we, pre uh, we revealed the presence of the charge symmetry breaking in four body systems. But on the other hand, uh, about the hydrogen forum, the data is old, and uh, so uh, it was measured with low statistics and uh, worse resolutions. So we have to we have to the measure the energy um, precisely. Uh, yes, and uh, 
uh, using a high resolution German detector array Hyperbole J at J Park as the 63 experiment. And second motivation is about hyper hyperon nuclear nucleon three body interactions. Excited state of uh, hypertriton with uh, isospin one <laughs> is uh, unbound, but it perhaps emits a gamma ray. And uh, also, um, excited state of with uh, three half plus of H3 lambda, it's, uh, if it's bound, uh, it emits a gamma ray. This, this tradition gamma ray. From their energy, we can approach uh, two problems. One is about uh, the state of NN lambda, and the other is the hypertriton puzzle, uh, which are discussed in this conference many times. So we also plan to measure the energy of gamma ray from H3 lambda using a hyperbole J, also as E63 experiment. This is, this is the E63 experiment that's set up at JPARC K1.1 beam, beam line. It's difficult to produce H4 lambda and H3 lambda directly from the interaction of K pi or pi K reaction. So we will produce H4 lambda and H3 lambda as hyperfragments uh, using using spectrometer and counters. We can identify K pi reaction and uh, uh, lithium seven lambda excited states of lithium seven lambda are produced as and decays into the uh, some fragments like H4 lambda, H3 lambda, and so on. It's possible to enhance the production of H4 lambda and H3 lambda uh, by selecting the uh, excitation energy of lithium-7 lambda. <coughs> H4 lambda and H3 lambda are produced as a hyperfragments. When such a hypernucleus is in the excited state, uh, it decays into the ground state with a gamma ray emission. This gamma ray is measured at hyperbole J, but in this method, uh, sometimes we, we don't know which hypernucleus emitted the, this gamma ray. Then we focus on the focus on that uh, this hypernucleus H4 lambda or H3 lambda decays into the two body two body. One is normal nucleus, the other is monochromatic pions. We detect monochromatic pion from this two body weak decay and measure the kinetic energy. We buy a range counter system newly installed in this experiment. We will perform triple coincidence of in flight K pi reaction, gamma ray, and weak decay for the first time. We are interested in these two pions from uh, having uh, 40 MeV or 53 MeV from uh, H4, H3 lambda, H4 lambda, respectively. Requirement to the range counter system is to separate two peaks from the, these two pions with a confidence level of three sigma. This is the range counter system. Range counter is made of 24 layers of six millimeter thick plastic scintillator. We adapted the readout method using 
uh, scintillate, plastic scintillator, wavelength shifting fiber, and SIPM. Scintillation photon uh, uh, converted to the converted and transported in the scintillation fiber and read out at SIPM. And in front of the range counter, we install the tracking device for tracking pions, which is uh, which is two layers of holoscopes. And this is the range counter system, which is installed in the uh, hyperbole system, Germanium detector array, um, like this. Uh, and also around the target here. I fabricated the prototype range counter. These are the photos of prototype and figure. Which is, uh, this is, uh, this thickness is uh, six millimeter times eight layers, which is equal to the uh, one third of the full range counter in the E63 experiment. We conducted a test experiment at J Park K1.8B line. <coughs> it, this purpose, this, the purpose of this experiment is to uh, test the prototype and evaluate its performance. We used um, pion beams at 300 MeV over C and degraded and we degraded it to the uh, less than one, 100 MeV over C to stop them in the prototype. And uh, we measured time of flight <laughs> within two, two plastic counters and event by event. So, uh, yeah. And this uh, next is about uh, data analysis. We selected slow pile events using TOF information and plotted uh, the energy loss in each layer for each event. And then we selected to stop events. And we, we could get uh, stop event in the prototype, like uh, as shown here. Uh, which shows which are shown uh, which shows uh, black curves in the prototype. We found 300, uh, 300 events of pion uh, stopped in the range counter. Using this stop events of pions, uh, we plotted the 2D distributions uh, range and uh, instant energy here. We selected two range of uh, energy. Uh, one is 30 MeV, and uh, the other is 43 MeV. And uh, this this uh, difference of the, this and en this energy is equal to the uh, the difference of kinematic energy from uh, these pions necessary for E63 experiment. As you can see, these two peaks are very separated. So um, it means uh, in the E63 experiment, the other experiment, uh, we can measure pions. Uh, uh, we can easily separate these pions because uh, um, necessary Necessary energy region is higher than this test, test experiment. And we can say that uh, this prototype has sufficient performance for identification of hypertriton and hydrogen four lambda in the E63 experiment. This is my, uh, this is my summary, but we have no time to explain all about it, but, but it's now 
uh, we are conducting the flow of range counter for the 63 experiment. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, can, can you please go yeah, to this, yeah, this slide? Uh, yeah, the previous. Yes. So in this uh, hypertriton, you basically show there, let's say, three possible levels. Uh, I mean, I can understand basically this one half plus and three half plus is like this spin flip, but what is like this one half plus, uh, which is just below uh, the threshold? Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Or. Ah, uh, we don't we don't know we don't know whether it's above or below. Uh, so, it no. it, it uh, have no meaning. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, but what what I'm wondering, like, what is like the origin of this one half plus excited state which you write there in this deuteron lambda continuum? Like, uh, what is this? Ah, is this. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. yeah, I spin uh, triplet state. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.